Welcome to the space where we are here doing a pre-show for the Saturday Showdown. It is quite a big one as we do have T1 going up against D plus Kia. This one is probably going to be our best Saturday Showdown because these two teams right now are the most dominant by far in the LCK. If you came to watch this match, you came to the right place. Wolf, what do you think about this one? I mean, it's, it's by far going to be our best game of the season so far. We've had some close games that were at the bottom kind of of our standings. This is going to be a series I think that's going to be very close. I was talking to Huni about this before the show. I think if this series was played, the 10 best of threes in this series, like in 10 different realities, like it would still be 5-5. Five, five. Like it's so hard to determine actually who's going to win, but we only get one, right? There's only one chance. And there's so much to prove because the winner of this will probably be on the top of the standings until they meet each other a second time. They'll be on top. I mean, these two teams right now, basically everybody they play, they stomp. I think that T1 kind of had the most difficult matchup in terms of facing Gen G, and they stomped them as well, which was a 2 0. So, um, really one sided stuff so far from these two teams, but now one of them does have to lose. 
Um, will be interesting to see who will eventually take this one. Yeah, I, I'm really excited to talk about kind of the history between these two teams because these rosters have only really faced off against each other in recent times because Damwon, now of course D plus Kia, is a more recent addition to the LCK as an organization. But T1 has been around since 2013. I mean, this is a team that's on its 10th year, basically, and has seen 10 titles, um, you know, amongst them. So D plus here, I think kind of the underdogs from a lot of people's minds because they're not as popular as T1, right? T1's performance at Worlds stronger. They went to the Worlds Finals. This roster didn't change. But I do feel like D plus Kia has a really good meet, read on the meta right now and the way they're playing oppressively around leads uh, could give them the edge in this best of three. Definitely could, and we'll get a little bit into predictions a bit later. Let's take a look at the head-to-head -head record between these two teams and break down you know, this is their first time of 2023, but these two teams have gone head to head so, so many times. And as you can see for 2019 and 2020, it was mostly at the time Dom won Kia, uh, the dominance for them. And they do have the overall game and match record so far. Those that in recent times, D plus Kia having a lot of victories. Now on the T1 side here, 2022 spring, 2022 summer, T1 getting the better end here, and of course in the first round of playoffs there as well, T1 when they had that amazing dominant run um, towards the end of the season, they weren't able to take out Genji of course, but they were definitely the stronger team. We knew we had two best teams for summer, and yeah, this was a finals that we all remember. We saw some Showmaker cast in, we saw some really strange drafting from D plus Kia in that series, or formerly uh, Damwon, of course, at that time. T1 did end up taking the win in the end, but I think that anything could happen uh, in tonight's series in terms of the draft, because both these teams have very different play styles. Yeah, I think they both have very interesting reads on the meta. You were talking about how D plus has got a really good read on the meta. T1 also, uh, it feels like they're just flexing a little bit. We don't really know what their read on the meta looks like because they're just kind of playing whatever they want. Obviously, uh, bringing in the Caitlyn uh, <laughs> support. But again, we'll get to that a little bit later. Sure. Let's take a look at Faker versus Showmaker as well because not only have the two teams gone head to head, but also Faker and Showmaker have gone head to head many times. I spent a lot of time talking about this in 2022 because the times we saw Faker match up against Showmaker, it felt like Faker felt more comfortable in the matchups. And you could see here, obviously, old time Showmaker actually has a slight edge, but it seems like Showmaker is always trying to prove something in these series. He pulls out wild picks when he plays against Faker, whether it's in playoffs or in regular season. And I think we haven't seen that much from Showmaker in terms of champion pool just yet. LeBlanc being the kind of joker pick that he did show us so far. So I, I think that this matchup definitely is one where we see something pretty interesting. We also got to see Faker's Lissandra, right? That was kind of his odd pick. He looked extremely dominant on it against Gen G of all teams. So uh, in terms of champion pools that might be unlocked a little bit here in the series, this is definitely one of the matchups I'm zooming in on. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, Faker's been around forever and Showmaker came in and they were very dominant. So not only did they fight a lot in regular season, but they also have fought pretty much every single playoffs as well uh, since Showmaker did join the league after Faker. Um, yeah, I mean, you talked about something to prove. I think everybody's kind of got a little bit of that against Faker just because he is who he is, right? So uh, speaking of head-to-head -head matchups as well, we do also have Faker versus Deft, who... Um, just recently won a world title, finally. Look at it go all the way back to MVP, 2013. It go all the way back. It's 10 it's years. Such a history between these two. And, and when you consider the matchup that no one expected could be possible in the world's finals, they recently played against each other there went to five games. It is amazing how Deft has been able to really bring things back in the later parts of his career. Because it seemed like for so long, only Faker can have this long and this storied of a career. This opening video really honors the battle between those two at Worlds and how Deft's miracle run actually brings him close to this. And notice this part of the scene. For the first time in, in just off the top of my head, first time I could think of ever, Faker's not actually looking back in the opening. Actually, it's Deft who stands in front of him and then when the, the shadow, the LCK logo shadow comes up, Deft is actually standing in front ever so slightly. Yep. That says a lot about what people are thinking right now about this player and, and how not he's not eclipsed Faker's legacy, but he steps in front of him in that fifth game in the finals. 
Yeah, that's what it is. I'm not sure if it's a solar or a lunar eclipse, but when the moon comes in front of the sun and blocks it out, it's kind of like, okay, for this one moment in yeah. time, it's very rare, but it's just right now. Yeah, just, just right, right now. now. Yeah. Depth came in and uh, did eclipse faker for that one moment. Now, we get to see them go head to head once again. And right now the bottom lane is kind of insane, right? It's it's so many crazy head-to-head -head match of so many crazy picks. We see the jungle is very important, but also the mid lane is very important because of its influence on not only the game, but also on the bottom lane. As uh, Faker and his boys did do the last time out, they kind of just stomped that team and made it look very quick. Um, Kong Gung Freaks, of course, just by diving the bottom lane over and over and over again. So even though, you know, Faker and Def don't go head to head in the lane, we'll definitely see them go head to head uh, many times, I think, in this career. Oh, definitely. And we've, we've already seen Faker punish 80 carries. Pays in particular was punished really hard in that Gen G series by Faker's Lissandra. So not gonna be an easy one, um, of course, on the, the side of Deft here in this game against Faker if he wants to look for an assassin pick. Same could be true of Showmaker if he does pull that LeBlanc out, right? These are the two picks that are rare, unusual. We might not see them in the series, but picks like these are what these players could use to get some extra agency and try to blow up those 80 carries in the back line. Yeah, absolutely. And these two teams, obviously, we talked about, they are extremely dominant right now. I'm curious about who is more dominant in general, as we are gonna take a look at more stats in the head-to-head -head matchup and also take a look at some of the picks in the bot lane. Yeah, so I, I requested this because I wanted to take a look at how dominant these games were because T1 actually took that game loss to KT Rolster. Their gold difference here at 15, a little bit lower actually than D plus Kia's, but this includes the insane stomp of Kwangdong Freaks, right? And you add that stat in and average it out to the gold difference at the end, and D plus Kia is still more dominant. This is kind of insane when you think about how much dragon control D plus Kia has had. Herald percentage here, their objective game is the best in the LCK right now, and they're playing small leads early into 12K gold leads at 30 plus minutes. And yeah, bottom picks here, much more, more variance on the side of T1. We did see the Caitlyn support, we've seen Ash, uh, Varus, we've seen Sivir and Lucian Nami, but I don't think that means that D plus Kia necessarily can only play two of our most popular lanes here. I think they absolutely can play the Varus. I think they absolutely can play Heimerdinger lanes here. We just haven't seen it yet. So it makes it very difficult for T1 to actually prepare draft wise for what we haven't seen just yet for D plus. Yeah, and you can see more stats here. Uh, some of the dragon percentage, you know, D plus kind of leading in terms of the first. You mentioned how D plus haven't dropped a single game, but T1 do have that one loss. So it's definitely going to, you know, still very early on in the season. So some of these stats are going to be there. Um, and also D plus, you know, you were saying it, they can play a wide variety of stuff as well. I think we just haven't quite seen it yet. Maybe they were hiding a little bit. Um, we can talk about our predictions for this one. Wolf, uh, what are you thinking about this matchup? Well, I'll go ahead and say it first. I predicted D plus Kia. Um, and I talked to Huni before the show and I was like, who did you predict by the way? He's, he thought he predicted D plus Kia. It looks like he did predict T1 in fact, but I think that there's, it's such an insanely close match to call. And I made this prediction before that T1 versus Kwangdong series. I think that series might have actually pushed me over the edge to go for T1 here, but <laughs> I predicted before that. Either way, I'm gonna stick with my prediction here and I wanna talk about what D plus Kia have done so well. It's been 2v2 control and it's been taking this 2v2 lead and pushing into early Drake. Early Drake leads to second Drake, leads to Herald control and then choking out the enemy teams around the map. Canyon has been insanely good this season and he came off of a very rough summer season. Remember, he came back to form in Worlds quite significantly when we did get that to that part of uh, Worlds where the jungle was very relevant again in playoffs. But in summer season, people are saying he might be like top six in the LCK, but that's as far as we'll go. But he's had such good synergy with Deft already here in this bottom 3v3. Yeah, it's been kind of insane to see um, <laughs> the way that they just tear apart opponents. Uh, of course, D plus, I feel like they have seen relatively weak opponents, right? Uh, they did go up against Lip Sandbox, they went up against Nongshim here. And so, in a way, it makes sense they're kind of tearing them apart as D plus is kind of one of our top teams, right? Let's take a look at T1 as well because uh, the majority of us did go for T1 in this case. I think just, especially, I, one big thing to mention is that T1, same roster from last year, it's early spring. So I think they're gonna have a natural uh, lead from that. But also, they're focused on 
the bottom lane has not been any different from D+. Plus. I think that uh, if there is a difference, it's just been in their focus on going for four five-man dives to the bottom side rather than 2v2 control. And as you can see, the last series against Kwangdom Freaks was not pretty. It started off like this, and then eventually it did lead to a game two game. where support Caitlyn was played. This and, game was just, yeah. T1 was given a problem by Kwangdom Freaks, like almost like a test, right? Like, okay, solve this. And T1 was like, oh, I'll solve it so hard that like th there will be no questions about whether your draft is every okay or acceptable in any world. If this was a test, they got the extra qu credit bonus question full points, like 110 out of 100. Um, a++ here for T1, because this was, I think, the cleanest and best series we've seen from one particular team all season long. And yes, Kwangdom Freak's a weaker team, and yes, the draft was, it was disrespectful, but the way that T1 didn't just say, well, we'll just beat you in a standard way, but the way they, they took the draft and made it their own and said, no, you guys don't even know how bad you messed up. Yeah. I think that's good. I think that's healthy for the league. I think, um, you know, maybe other teams would have played it safe, but T1, they understandably are extremely confident in situations like that. As you can see, owner said, uh, DK seems to prioritize Lushinami, which is, you know, maybe they're just hiding stuff. Uh, DK uh, head coach Acorn also said, I have a complete understanding of which champions and compositions T1 prefers. Obviously, um, <laughs> you should, as that's your job. You got to study your team that you're playing up against. I think that I would not be surprised that if on red side, T1 banned Lucian away, because I think they have a what much wider bottom pool right now. They seem stronger there, and right now, Def seems to be the best Lucian player in the world. So I don't think you want to give him that opportunity when D plus Key are on blue side. That's the one thing I, I am feeling very confident about predicting in this draft. The rest of it, though, I think we're going to figure out in a best of three. It's not a best of one. We get a whole series here to watch of these two teams, and I think it will develop. And I also think it's going three games, Valdez. I think it has to, right? Uh, let's take a look at T1's coach's comments as well, as uh, actually just the coach's comments in general about this matchup. Ben Gee said, the side that wins the match against DK becomes the rank one team. Um, we'll make sure to take the number one spot and keep good momentum. Acorn saying winning the match is, of course, very important, but I want my players to earn a lot, or I should be learn a lot from the series. Hope you guys can watch them grow throughout the season. Could be earn as well. You know, earn a lot of knowledge about the uh, the matchup against an extremely strong team. Uh, I mentioned it earlier in the segment, but I th think Bangi's point is so true because the team that wins this series will keep the number one spot until they rematch and then they will be tied head-to-head -head in terms of 1-1 if they lose that second matchup. Because I don't think either of these teams, right now, based on what we're seeing, drop a best of three to any other team in the LCK. These teams are on another tier. They're on the S tier. Genji's on A. The rest of the teams, we put them below that. But yeah, S tier teams right now, by far the best two. Absolutely. And it's going to be a really fun match regardless of who wins. I think it will be massive for both teams. You learn a lot from each other and you maybe even go to SS tier, but uh, we haven't seen that quite yet. But either way, guys, that's it for the pre-show. Uh, really looking forward to the Saturday showdown. Hope you guys are as well. But let's go to the intro and then the casters enjoy the match.
Hogan just flashes and the Emma Frost is extraordinary! And neither of them can play the game! That was beautiful! 2022 World Champions! That will not fall! Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to LCK Spring 2023. I'm Atlas, joined by Chronicler, and we're commentating on a Saturday for the first time together in a really, really, really long time. Very, very exciting that we get a chance to do uh, the Saturday showdown together. One might even say the beginning, because I don't, I don't think we ever guested together on a Saturday I know. at any point since I started in the LCK. But what a beautiful day to start, because this is a matchup that very well might be a precursor to an eventual yeah. spring finals with how everything is looking right now. A lot of teams up, down, don't really know where they are, but for these two, it's very clearly where they are, they're on top. Yeah, definitely very up. And with how KT played yesterday, dropping a game to them on T1 side, definitely not looking like the worst thing ever. Just to, for a little bit of clarification, we're going to be swapping every Saturday showdown. This is not so that both Valdez and I and you and Wolf can cast on a Saturday. It's so that all of us get a chance to hang out with Huni on Sunday. Um, that that, is the that's the real thing. reason. Yeah. I'm so excited for my first day with Huni tomorrow. I know. Already got to chat him so much. Very insightful. Very, very funny. Can't wait. Very much looking forward to it. He's on the Korean broadcast today. Tomorrow he is going to be with us. But that is enough about that. Let's get into this extraordinary matchup. Because as everyone's already said, these are the two top teams here in the LCK as illustrated here in the standings. No games dropped by D plus Kia. However, they have had an easier strength of schedule based on where their oppositions now lie in the standings, which is towards the Western side. That's actually a question that I agree with you now, but could also be somewhat swapped, as we have actually seen Nongshim kinda yeah, start true. to rise up. Liv Sandbox currently beat both KT and Hanwha Life. True. Kinda sent Hanwha Life into a full spiral. But I do agree with you, especially based on the expectations we had coming into the split. It was very obvious that the opponents that D-Plus thus far has faced are weaker, but the level of play that they have shown has been incredibly clean regardless. Yep. Let's get into it. Saturday Showdown, rank one upon victory. Of course, whoever wins here, no matter what happens, will be first place in the LCK, despite one point leading for D plus Kia going into it. Does not matter. You'll be going down a little bit further than that if you lose. Uh, one continues to streak the streak, the other gets their first loss. And that's, that's the thing. And everyone's eyes are going to be drawn to that rematch, which is in the second round robin uh, of this season. It's a bit sad that we have to wait that long uh, before we get this match up again, but it only increases the hype ever further. And uh, mid-jungle is definitely going to be very important. Mid-jungle has been the downfall of some teams. Uh, look at Humble Life, look at DRX, and yeah. it has been a boon for both of these two. Showmaker and Canyon, perhaps one of the most iconic when it comes to specifically being a duo, have been incredibly strong throughout a very long amount of time, even when one of the two players hasn't had the greatest already, as Wolf mentioned, for example, Canyon and Summer and some yeah, points that's last why year. you see the 17 uh, against yep. the 12 in favor of Owner in that particular matchup. And uh, since, you know, this form of T1 has, uh, has come together, it has definitely been a lot more T1-sided in this particular matchup. As, yeah, carry out with his reckless creativity already <laughs> that were called uh, kind of a wild card. And this has been somewhat of a problem for T1 in the past when this roster was performing last year that the risks that they take now, I think are really a sign of them maturing as a team, which sounds weird because normally taking big risks feels like you're kind of swinging left and right. But in this case, I do truly believe that it really just showcases how much T1 can push the envelope with how good they are, as that should not come as a surprise to no. anyone. 
Uh, fans <laughs> definitely in favor of T1, of course. The fan base is larger. larger. It's not necessarily a popularity contest, though, because the majority of us uh, sitting on these desks also uh, did put ourselves behind T1. I think mainly because of the solidity of the roster, the fact that this team hasn't had to change too much, uh, and the fact that D plus Kia probably have a lot more room to improve. Um, as we get deeper into 2023. But a bit of a wink there from Gumiyushi. So I think already we're seeing that T1 are continuing uh, to be a little bit uh, carefree in their attitude about uh, the beginning of the spring season. Also have Zayus, who has kind of started his uh, the shy arc of flashing into multiple people to try and, and get killed. <laughs> and they're able to, right? They're allowed to with how dominant they've been. Uh, Faker is on his, I've lost track of how many resurgences he's had in terms of individual play, but I, I thus think, far... I think it's just like a continued surgence from 2013. Um, that's how I like to talk about it. I mean, 2018 was a bit rough, but who cares? I think he's still just getting better and better and better and better and better and better, and then after that, he'll get better. Sort of what I'm feeling. Um, we do have uh, a little bit of sad news. Um, Kellen has a bit of an injury on his leg. So uh, actually, no, he is going to be walking out with the team, but he is injured. So uh, send your thoughts and press to, uh, to Kellen to make sure that his uh, leg gets better. Yeah, I think he's not going to walk to the front of the stage with the rest ah, of the team. Ah, he's so. just going to walk straight to his seat yes. um, after this. So not going to be taking the bow and stuff like that. Just going to make sure that he uh, keeps himself OK. And as you can see, he is struggling just a little bit. So I wonder what happened. Hopefully he's all right. And even though we knew that this team was always going to be good, especially as we got further and further into the split, there were a couple of question marks coming in. How well are Deft and Kellen going to mesh together? And is Connor going to be able to move on from the issues that have plagued him in the past, where he was fairly resource intensive and not really able to get anything out of the resource that he was given, while simultaneously still drawing more attention towards yep. his side of the map? And thus far, yes. He absolutely has, and that, I think, is a large part of the reason why the Plus have looked incredible right from the get-go. Kana actually has been very, very self-sufficient, has been playing very well in team fights, and the fact that Showmaker and Canyon are playing great isn't surprising, as ho oh, ho ho, that's a bot lane matchup. Yeah, that is. Um, yeah, I, I thought that Deft's stats would look good after six wins in a row, but I don't know whether I was quite ready for this good. Um, he's definitely been getting a heck of a lot of uh, damage out of his champions, but as you can see, Gumiyushi is about as close as you can possibly be in the stats that are super relevant. One of them being DPM, two DPM off. Kill participation, also very similar. Both of these teams do play around their bottom lanes a heck of a lot, and we talked about it. I mean, everything is matchup specific. Everything is based on the opponents that you've faced, especially with a small sample size like this. So we don't know enough to properly judge uh, the head-to-head -head between these two teams. And what it'll need is for them to face off against one another. And that was a very emo alpaca, and I was into it. I really enjoy it. One of the great things about the LCK is the amount of fan art that we get treated to. And this match here today, also to very dedicated fan bases. So many storylines that we're coming into here as well. We yeah. have a... Kana taking on his former organization, his former team, the player that replaced him, taking him on. Deft was the one who denied this T1 coming into the finals, seemingly the clear favorite. Yeah. Finally the run, but finally another title for Faker, but it wasn't meant to be, it was shut down. And all these just set up for an amazing, amazing match. The Big thing to me is that, as both teams have commented on as well, we don't know that much about D plus Kia. That is a really big thing. And I also don't know how much we know about T1 because they've been throwing so many curveballs that at this point, you don't really know what's going on in the magic box <laughs> that they have ready. But for D plus, it's not a magic box, it's a black box, right? You can't see in. Only thing we know, Probably don't give them Lucianami. Probably don't give Caitlyn to either of these two teams. But outside I think of Ash, that, we know that Ash and Caitlyn will be banned. That yeah. is what we know. Uh, if they're not, someone is doing something silly, and we'll hopefully just move straight to game two uh, from the draft. Uh, we'll just restart the draft. Let's um, give the win immediately. Yeah, just give the win. Uh, I think is how that one goes. Uh, if T1 is able to lock down either or both of those champions, um, I think we just uh, we just call it uh, at that point because. I don't know about the legalities, but it just didn't seem like it should have been something that we should have been able to show on broadcast. 
um, last time those two got through. Uh, Bengi versus Akon, um, two legends in their own right, of course. Very, very cool to see them up against each other. The main thing is the players that you see on screen. Blue side, going to be chosen here for T1. Both T1 and D plus Kia have only played one game off the blue side, which is absolutely crazy. T1 did lose one game uh, on the blue side of the Rift, uh, but outside of that, it is all victories. And let's see how this one's going to go. Both of these teams, three and zero. Maokai taken off the board. Our Saturday showdown about to take off, as there is the Ash Band. Absolutely love to see it. And it has been an extremely bot lane focused meta, even the jungle has kind of warped around what enables you to either dive bot lane or protect slash gang bot lane. The Maokai, obviously a pick that in general is quite strong right now. There we and go. They passed the test. There we go. And this does mean, unfortunately, that we might be looking at uh, Lucianami versus... And now I'm wondering, is D plus going to take the Lucian way? Because there is... Oh, do it! There is Death Lucian was the Yumi. one that started this, the Lucian Yumi lane. Oh, I want to see it. I want to see it so bad. The one thing I am afraid of is that, to me, Lucian Nami is incredibly strong. And in that duo, Lucian has a lot of power. But when it comes to a self-standing pick that combines well with others, oh. I actually like the Nami a little bit more. I think things like Nami Draven can also have a big impact if you do play into something like the Yumi. And D Plus is not going to take the risk. Instead, looking in the Yumi here, and so far, no surprises. Lucian pick up now, certainly here on the third rotation. Just going to stick with a drop we've seen a million times. Now, the only choice for D plus is do we get Zeri or do we get Siv? I prefer Siv personally, but um, I've always been a little bit of a, a Zeri anti. I hate, I hate to say it. Um, I just feel like uh, Siva offers a little bit more, but it will be uh, Def picking up the Zeri this time around. Definitely the more popular choice alongside the Yumi. Can be a difficult lane. We'll see how D plus Kia are going to be able to play it out. Renekton already banned away. Looking for a bit of a battle towards that top side. See what's going to happen. A Cassidy banned against Showmaker. Um, I don't think anyone should be too surprised if you've been watching uh, Showmaker play for the last couple of years. Definitely a champion that he loves to pick, even when you're not supposed to. And then often wins even uh, after that. So very, very strange, but not a risk T1's willing to take. Azir is still on the table here. If D plus Kia don't ban it away here, I would not be surprised if they end up prioritizing it themselves. Top lane, even though there are a ton of strong champions still available, Cassante, Fiora, as Cassante does get taken away, isn't generally that relevant in the large scale of things. This is a big risk if they do actually end up going for yeah. this. We know how good Zeus's cannon is, but what this does do is it enables Showmaker to go for a kind of off-the-wall counter pick, which we do know D plus really likes to use, but Irelia is another example. And with the amount of AD that's already available, I wouldn't even mind if T1 does end up going for, as mentioned, something like the cannon here. Uh, can also take a much more conservative approach and go for something like the Camille that we saw used very successfully yesterday. Yep, uh, I could imagine that Showmaker is uh, eyeing off a Silas. Likely that he'll be able to play that. Akshan, probably not going to happen. But we'll see. Zayas could, of course, take a lot of different things into this matchup. We saw Keen <laughs> tear them apart, and here it is. The Zayas special, the Yone towards that top side, and Kana took this risk. He took it on purpose, and we'll see how he's going to match up against a very difficult matchup against a player who is extraordinarily good at this champion. Oh, Talia, not sure I'm a huge fan personally, but is going to be a way of trying to neutralize this matchup. Not a lot of permafrost value to be taken here from Canyon, but still will be Sejuani, who is just strong in her own right. And I guess Meganar exists. So, overall, the Talia as a pick into the T1 composition is actually amazing, uh, because Unraveled Earth makes it very, yep. very tough for any champion that isn't Karia, that isn't Nami, to go in and go for big playmaking potential. But D Plus also has a Sejuani with two ranged champions. Obviously, there's Maganar timings, but if Maganar is up, I don't think generally Zayas will be within reach. And, and there is a definite way for T1 to play around that. And while the team fighting power of the composition is strong, I do think that they are going to run into some issues in actually getting to the point where they can look for these 5v5s. Especially with how well 
balanced the T1 team cup as you can play 1-4, but Yone also definitely can team fight. You have a very strong one item spike on the Lucianami that we've seen countless times used to yeah. apply pressure to the rest of the map, try and snowball, and I'm worried that the D plus composition might need a little bit more time to get this Zeri, get this Talia online that T1 is not going to give them. Nope, I agree. Absolutely adorable uh, little picture of the D-plus players there towards that bottom side. <laughs> so extraordinarily cute. Um, but yeah, I think the power curve is a little bit off here on the, the D-plus gear side, exactly like you were talking about. The way that T1 will be able to play the game at almost every moment, there'll be something to play around. There'll be a point of power uh, to utilize, whereas D-plus gear definitely looking towards that later stage of the game to really get things going. A bit of a rely on the Zeri Yumi from Defton Kellen, which has been a win condition that they've been able to employ in the past, but I just don't know how it's going to go if they have to put out fires for the rest of the game. Let's hop onto the rift here. Game one of the Saturday Showdown. All right, Chronicler, I'll give you one chance. To go back on your prediction, do you think that this is still a T1 victory? Or after the draft, do you think the D-plus Kia have a chance? What do we reckon? I think D-plus have a chance, but I'm, I feel great about my prediction. Yeah, you me too. really like the T1 composition here. The only thing that is somewhat lackluster is your heart engage from a... Like really being able, something like a Vi or a Sejuani to just pull the trigger, but the re-engage is still amazing. If you can get an angle with Wukong that the enemy team doesn't suspect, that. there is still plenty of opportunity there. There's also the wave from Caria, so... And then we already talked about the side laning power. Uh, Zeus going to be very happy matching up into <laughs> this Gnar, and the call from D plus Kia to go for the Gnar blind there is something that I don't even think in terms of raw power or, or laning, it's going to be really a problem. The Nars in that regard should still be fine, but as soon as six is hit, Zeus is going to have windows when Mega Nar is down. And yeah. Canyon really doesn't want to give too much attention towards his top side of the map because he's playing with a Lush, or with into a Lushinami with a Zeri Yumi bot side. So already started Raptors on his way down. And I expect that is a trend that we're going to see continue here. And then a lot of the pressure falls on Showmaker. If he can find Pryo against Faker in mid and threaten Roams to sides, then D plus Kia do think I get a little bit more space and maybe they can get to some of those spikes. But Faker has gone really lane oriented, gone for the Comet here, so really looking to put an early stamp on this game. Yeah, he was also uh, the one to bring out the Luden's Echo uh, on the Azir as well. As much burst damage, as much power as possible. None of these crown builds that have been making a few of us unhappy here in the LCK. We have enjoyed some of the Leandries, but definitely Luden's Echo feeling like a lot of added power here. And uh, we'll see where the Faker goes back to it. 71.9% win rate, uh, not too bad. Uh, here for one of his most played champions. Unsurprisingly, is oh look at that. Ooh, that's a, that's a, even not not as close to as many games, uh, but we'll take it. D plus also a team that obviously, although we haven't seen it and probably won't see it for the foreseeable future, loves to flex this Talia pick. But what I love is ooh, hold up, Showmaker might be in trouble here. Could certainly be Canyon nowhere near. He knows towards his red buff, as you can see. Yeah, uh, going to be pathing away. Red buff will be taken by Canyon. Relatively low though, as you can see, a healthy Wukong moving towards this top side. Unseen, no vision available. Canyon will probably get word on what's going on, but actually not able to do so. There's the hop and the flash utilized as Canna's wondering where the heck he's supposed to go. The unbound Soul is going to bring Zeus back and Canna blows the flash. Owner doesn't even have to do anything and claims the summoner spell. And that is so big, because even with Canyon covering, if Kana doesn't flash there, there's a big risk that he just gets taken down after the knockoff from Zeus hits. Zeus literally doesn't invest anything, right? Still has a summoners available. And now post six, until he has flash up, Kana needs to play very, very defensive, which is going to lead to some problems if D plus wants to go for some early contests around objectives. What I didn't really like, didn't really get the chance to talk about, is that you see that Deft and Kellen are very cognizant of the fact that Zeri Yumi is actually at least on some level, or, or some parts of this lane, quite strong. They were actually able to get an earlier level 2 to really contest 
uh, on level one and get a decent amount of poke down his canyon. Yeah, Gumiyushi gonna have to dash. We'll see whether the flash has to be used. He does. Bubble's gonna connect though, as that's a lot of damage onto Canyon. They need the heal to keep the Sejuani alive. Maybe some zoomies as he makes his way out. But still, they get the flash, but it's not exactly clean. Overall, a trade that is even in terms of summoners with Kalen using both his Ignite and Heal, and then Gumiyushi using the flash, carry using the heal. Would say there's a small advantage. Gumiyushi not having the flash does mean that there might be some playmaking potential later on for the D plus Kia bot lane when they do hit six. We have seen that the amount of power that the Yumi and Zeri gain when they're able to catch a Lucian unaware is really, really big. And I think our perception of this matchup has gotten a little bit skewed due to the fact that a lot of the teams that we have seen have made it look very lopsided. Yeah. And it made the Zeri Yumi look worse. I do think that once Gumiushi and Karia get Mandate and Gale Force, the equation changes a lot. But that is still relatively far away, so I'm actually happy to see Kellen and Deft play pretty far forward here. And I really think they need to, because if they don't have any pressure points in this early game, and you give T1 completely free reign, you're really going to get into a lot of trouble. Yeah, and uh, I think as well, first back is going to be pretty important here for Gumiushi as well, who's doing it right now. That serrated Dirk that we see so many uh, Lucians picking up, almost purely for tempo in the lane, um, has been achieved. And Def not going to be so flexible uh, in those item builds. Often it's Berserker's Greaves, it's Vampiric Scepter, things like this that are far more uh, defensively utilized in those lanes and so won't have quite the firepower that this Lucian will provide. So. There is a uh, slight advantage when it comes to the backs, um, but as you can see, Lucian going to be making it back to play now, so things will be evened out quite nicely. Uh, and that will mean that uh, the gold is going to remain almost uh, exactly identical. And the only thing that's really changing it is about a 10 CS lead for both Zeus and Faker in these solo lanes. Kanner and Showmaker struggling a little bit in these early stages. Not too surprising, and thus far, Canyon has still been completely fine, and we're going to look at these first objectives. Now that six spikes are being hit across the boards, as oh, Ooh. Kana. Yeah, that's enough. And a wall up. Zay is taking a lot of damage here as he's going to have to ult to try and get out. Permafrost does a fair bit of work. Mininar comes back in, though, as the Unbound Soul not going to be camped here by D plus Kia. Zayas holds on to his flash. T1. Owner was also in the general vicinity, so D plus definitely respect that. Getting the ultimate out though is big. That might mean that they can be looking a little bit more aggressive for a possible play, even though kind of using that doesn't really matter. Yeah. Showmaker. Showmaker actually gonna flash late here. Not gonna flash before the Emperor's Divide comes in, but still gonna have to use it. Will now have to ghost back to lane. I believe he did do that uh, the first time that he backed. Um, can work as like a pseudo teleport to get you back to lane in time. But as you can see, uh, Showmaker's, uh, sorry, Faker is going to be able to put a, uh, a fair bit uh, towards this turret as uh, it's unsealed spellbook, so never mind. The teleport is going to be able to come out as the flash was just used. And flash being down for Showmaker is still quite big as Ooh, Canyon going in again. Yeah. Gumiushi still doesn't have his flash back available as there's the flash in from Canyon. I think this is going to be first blood and Deft picks it up on the Zeri. About the best news for D plus fans that you could get. Very nicely done there for D plus Kia. Able to pick up an early kill on their most important carry. And Canyon is continued attention towards this bot side of the map really paying off. Yeah, nicely done. Certainly not end of the world or anything like that for T1 as they will be able to have an explosive mid game with this composition that they put together. But D plus Kia almost needed that to happen for this to be competitive. Sort of how I feel uh, these compositions will match up as the game goes on. It makes their mid game a lot more comfortable if Gumayushi, for example, gets a gank. Uh, owner comes bot right and they kill Deft and Kalin and he, in addition to the Dirk he already picks up, gets an early guild force then. It becomes extremely hard to play out. I don't think this is enough to quell the spike that T1 are certainly still going to hit in mid-game. But right now, we do actually see Showmaker is heading towards bot side to cover, so the answer for Guma is going to be relatively limited. Drake might be available here. There is good vision around for D plus Kia, so Kayin at the very least is going to pick this up. Showmaker going to protect the plate. Dive could come through here, but does look like Showmaker is aware of that, obviously. 
vision on bot side getting cleared out, and there was no contest, so he will be playing it very, very safe. Yep, uh, Death Dashing Forward does find a little bit of an extendo beam that doesn't extend onto Faker there, but not too much to worry about. And still, two plates will go over to T1. All right, final chapter comes through. Faker gonna flash, but immediately the Glacial Prison comes in, and Kellen picks up the second kill for D Plus Kia, and they'll grab plates for it. The Rift Herald coming down as well. D Plus Kia, the explosive early games that we've been seeing, apparently works on T1 as well. What I'm loving here from D Plus is how incredibly cohesive and coordinated all these plays are, particularly with Canyon and his bot side. They are not wasting a second there, right? The moment that the ultimate comes through, you see Faker go, oh, okay, I could be fine here. Goes for the flash, and then as soon as Death flashes, Canyon basically immediately is ready there with the ultimate. Canyon, to me, really showcasing how much power the Sejuani can have. Also not giving the opportunity to carry out here to try and counter him, right? Immediately flashes on, and then here, Faker is going to feel safe. Right? He is in his ear. He does have a lot of control on the bottom half of the map. But Death Cell is his flash. Look at that CC chain. Yeah, just beautifully, beautifully done. done. Absolutely. Still, going to need to see more of it from D plus here as uh, T1's composition will just remain good uh, as this game continues. One thing I do love as well, which uh, I guess we didn't see quite as much, is Showmaker being moved towards that bottom side because you can just surf the wall and remain so, so safe as this Talia with the extra movement speed, Unsealed Spellbook, and Ghost being able to be employed to make sure that he's even more fine. It's another thing that you did illustrate before, but the coordination goes that far as well to put the right champion in the right lane in order to get things working. See whether D plus Kia can continue to make the big brain plays whether T1 can find their avenue into this game. They have managed to take the first Drake, Hextech, just a lone Hextech Drake going to be coming through next, and we'll see what the soul is going to be after that. Could be Chemtech, could be Ocean, but also could be Mountain or Infernal this game, which would be pretty exciting. As, all right, that's uh, an ultimate. Speaking of which, Depp's going to use one towards his bottom side. There's Gumushi in a lot of trouble with the culling. Fires entirely onto Kellen. Canyon now making his way over. They get the vision as Showmaker's going to come down as well. Ona over here trying to protect his bottom lane, but it's definitely a very defensive posture from T1. Def can skate over any of these walls, but of course, T1 will be able to hold on to this one. Oh man, it's feeling so incredibly intense right now. Yeah, if Ona isn't there, that bot lane is uh, probably in dire straits. Might get taken down. Kenyon currently on double vision, and the bot side vision for T1 is pretty decent. All right. Oh, no. oh boy. Yeah, trying to get this fight working is in the meantime, a fight towards that bottom side as well. Glacial Prison comes in, and Canyon is thinking about just solo killing Ono. Showmaker comes around, and so it is going to be the Talia that grabs that one. As now Faker's getting turned on. Another Permafrost. Is it going to come in? The answer's no. Seismic Shove misses, and Faker lives. And that is the only good thing that is happening in that play for T1. And usually the Wukong we've seen can definitely punish Sejuani but because Canyon has been impeccable thus far, has been the instigator of many a play. So he's forcing owner off of his normal clearing path. As a result, Canyon is getting assists, is getting more and more leads, was a level up in that play as well. And taking a 2v2 against Canyon and Showmaker, you better got to be ready because yeah. they have been doing this for quite a while, and the T1 composition still has an incredible amount of power in 5v5s. This game is by no means over, but that doesn't take away from how impressive this early to mid game has been from D plus Kia. Yep, Showmaker, I believe, uh, just flicked Faker underneath his turret there for a moment. The threaded volley, forcing Faker to move around and try and escape, but dances a bit, isn't quite able to avoid the majority of the damage. So Showmaker getting something back, but still, Oh a bit of work being done in this mid lane oh by Faker is, yeah, uh, this is getting a bit scary. Canyon looking to steal the red buff first. Threaded Volley going to help out with that one. Extendo Beam from Deft. And Kellen going to soak a fair bit as the culling now on cooldown. And T1's bottom lane needs to vacate this area. Oh, they know. Yeah, yeah they're 10 aware. seconds on these plates. So we'll see whether another one can come in, but not looking likely as the wave gets tidied up. Yeah, good work from Guman Karat to already preemptively fin out the wait, uh, wave. Canyon is on vision here, but even if Canyon doesn't get this dive done, I want to highlight both how well Canyon is playing, but also note that Kana is actually respecting, which 
We've seen this player yeah. struggle with this so much as here, as mentioned. Normally, you're going to feel very comfortable taking this 1v1. Wukong has an incredible amount of armor shred. With his ultimate, generally, he's able to take down the Sejuani. But Kenyon is already very far ahead, has all his cooldowns available, and Faker almost ends up dying here as well, right? Showmaker just quicker on the response thanks to his ultimate. And overall, really good luck from D+. Plus. And for T1, with the game state as it is now, you are going to have to look for windows around teamfights, right? Your 5v5 is still very strong. Mandate and Guild Force are done. So if you're T1, I think this is one of those moments where ideally you'd love to look for maybe a fight, but D plus Kia are not giving them time. They're already on the Dragon here. Yep, and they're going to be able to take it as well. Oh, Wukong, Shilbo done. Nowhere near. Yeah, Sh Shilbo done for, for Zayas, but not going to quite be able to head over here and get this one done. Ona will be able to move in though, and Faker's already in the pit, so never mind. Canyon throws the ult, but isn't gonna quite get there. Still, the smite is good. D plus Kia will walk away with the Drake, and it only costs them an R button from the Sejuani. And there you see again the power of Unraveled Earth. Showmaker throws that down in the mountain of the pit, and T1 can't really move, right? They can't really get past yeah. that. Both Wukong and Azir just have to kind of sit and wait as D plus Kia Go on the retreat. Yeah, this is dangerous. Canyon doesn't have ult, remember, but that's a great hack or prison to land on to death. Winter's Wrath just to clear out these minions. They do manage to successfully do so. Ona getting to work on Shirley. But as you can see, it's all kind of uh, okay for D plus Kia. They'll take this out of turret on the bottom side of the map. That's going to be first brick going over their way. Second Herald not necessarily as valuable as that first one. D plus Kia holding on to control of this game so far doing so from very early on. Also, no D plus Kia very cognizant of how strong their opponents are right now. Not gonna fight for the Herald that they don't need to. We'll give that over for free over to T1. Pick themselves up the Drake and then immediately disengage. Very aware that if T1 can get a good fight there, I really think they can easily retake control and retake some momentum in this game. Right? All of a sudden, if Gumiyushi gets a kill or two, accelerates his rapid fire cannon, thanks oh, yeah. to the Guild Force mandate combination, they can get a lot more going. Zayus was clearly looking and ready to teleport in as well. So for D plus Kia right now, they don't really need to take those risks. They can keep the pace that they've run, been on thus far. The Andre is now done for Showmaker as well. Yeah, no, it feels to me like D plus gear are pre pretty much on cruise control um, as the rest of this game goes on. It's not as much the onus on them to get things done because Zeriyumi is a uh, pretty reliable win condition towards the late, late stages of this game, especially with frontline like the Na and the Sejuani available, plus battlefield control of that Talia, like you were talking about. It is mainly just get behind Deft at that stage. They still need to get there, though. They're not out of the woods entirely. Now with one Drake apiece, we're not getting too close to uh, Elder Drakes or anything like that just yet, as uh, Weaver's Wall going to come through here, get Showmaker back towards this mid lane. Posturing for position once again. Seismic Shove to bring the Herald further. There's the Tidal Wave, only connects onto Showmaker, but they're using it to zone, they're using it to create space, as the Glacial Prison does basically the same thing. Bit of an unfortunate one there from Canyon that time around. That's okay. Tower stays alive, but it's on its last legs. I do want to highlight that even though I love D Plus's uh, po uh, position if they get later into the game, it's still important to know that T1, if D if anyone on D Plus mispositions, can still blow them up in seconds. As oh yeah, he'll get used by Kalin. Yeah, and uh, Gumiushi also struggling with I believe some unravelled earth there. He'll be all right. Cleanse and Flash, still both available. Gale Force up as well. He is deadly on this Lucian right now. As Death takes so much damage from that Conquering Sands. Once again, it is the Ludens to be picked up by Faker's Azir. He gets flicked back, though. A lot of damage. He'll have to shift some Sands to get out of there. Thankfully, the Earth hadn't quite unraveled under his feet. He can use it defensively. Another issue that I don't... I think D plus have a very clear answer to us. All right, Boomerang's going to come forward, and Zayas has to use a very defensive ultimate. Seeing that in this matchup from this player, it's not something I was expecting this series, but makes it out of there and had word that Canyon was coming down. Intelligent play once again here in the top laner of T1. That's the big thing. Once Zayas hits his Infinity Edge spike, that matchup switches, and Kana is not going to be able to play nearly as aggressively. 
again, unless he has Canyon in his back pocket, like he did right there. Yeah. Uh, for T1, I also wouldn't mind some heal reduction. Uh, we are looking at a Yumi, which by itself can already warrant it, but also Canyon going for the Radiant Virtue build, so a lot of extra resistances, but also the heal that he provides the moment the Glacial Prison come da uh, comes down for the rest of his team. Yeah. And looking at the overall game state right now, we have about a 3k advantage for D+. And could be looking towards setting themselves up for this Ocean Soul. Not the best Soul necessarily, but can still provide a lot of utility in these longer drawn-out fights that we're seeing here. Both teams are very uh, comfortable playing to the limit as Guma. All right. Slightly out of position here, but not going to get permafrosted just yet. Final chapter does come in as the flick lands onto Owner's clone, I believe. And so isn't going to be uh, too much of a result there. Still, Ryushi having to be a little bit careful. Didn't have to use any summoner spells. So just fine. Testing the waters here Ooh, on both no sides. Yumi ultimate available. T1 might look to fight here. They still have a really strong 5v5. If they can find a choke point where D-plus is clumped up, can get a Wombo combo going. This Narbar from Kana is in absolutely perfect position right now as Ona's moving over just to Shadow Canyon. Put the vision as well. Look at yeah. the one. Great vision, but still, Kana just holding this Narbar in the position that he wants to. He can auto the Drake to get that into whichever order he wants, standing in the back of the pit just to spot whether Zayas is going to be lying in wait here. There's now T1 possibly going for that team fight. Cyclone's going to come through as Kana finds no one with the Nar. Sejuani so does lock down the Dragon, and Depth is now trying to get this team fight to work out. He dodges the ult from Zayas, but nobody else can get out of the way as Zayas is trying to fight it out. The Unbound Soul is going to draw him back, and D plus Kia lose two. Secure the Drake. Rare moment of hesitation and a mistake there from D plus Kia. Kana as a, a sacrificial lamb for this Drake is oh, fine. That's the Baron, is it? Uh, well, it, they are definitely going to try and start it up. I do think with Deft and Kalan available, maybe we're going to see a possible attempt, but maybe it's just going to be Canyon. Vision is there. And T1's team fighting comes through for them again. All right, so it's going to pop over the wall. I think Canyon now has word of what's going on here is the Barons is going to be taken for free. D plus Kia not even going to try and stop that one from going down. So this is just insane, right? Like T1, it was 0-3 the kill score. D plus Kia were controlling the game for the entirety. Watch this. And then there is they lose two members and lose a Baron it, and maybe the game's over. So there is two angles here. One is that Kana here is completely fine to just keep people occupied. If you give just him up, you're fine. But I think D-plus was actually looking to extend and keep going for this fight. And then Showmaker gets caught by a beautiful, ult a beautiful ultimate from Zeus, who now is sitting on that Infinity Edge spike. Yeah. And uh, T1's Baron's power play generally are amazing. And it's literally, they're 3k gold up. They make one mistake in a team fight. And it's and, it and here we like are. It's Look all, at it's all done. He's yeah. gone. <laughs> oh, what a game! The entire gold lead just Depth's evaporated dead. in one moment. Faker versus Deft kill. here towards this bottom side, and Deft is just dead. I don't think there's much he can do about this one. He's going to see how much time he can buy, and uh, it's not very much, guys. Wukong going to be able to take him down. Faker's going to go back home, get that health bar back, and T1 in like the flick of their fingers immediately they are in the lead and they are in full control of this game as faker teleported straight away towards that top side showmaker not going to be able to get any sort of split done gumushi getting to work on this inner turret the baron power play already at 3.2 thousand gold and they've still got a minute and a half it's not even nearly done yet what a beautiful uh, swing from t1 really this is just Oh, the amount of mistakes you're allowed to make against this team might not be zero, but it's definitely very, very, very little as off of the back of a single fight over a Drake. Now, four and a half K. They were yep. up three K yep. when they started the objective. Yep. There's still one minute of this, so uh, the top out of turret should also be taken we talk about standing gold all the time, and if you can get momentum back, you can take that money off the rift. And uh, that is precisely what T1 have done. But uh, they've they've taken five turrets, and so that's uh, that's why we're sitting at five thousand here. As Warrior Trickster gets Ona out of there, and D plus Kia, I'm I'm sure they're reeling at this point in time. As the culling comes through, Showmaker in trouble, has to use the shield, does get it. 
from it's his Seraph's embrace, but still, this is... It, it, it feels like the game was in D-plus's hands and is now well, completely out so of control. That's that's the tough part when you think you're playing against two teams that are... Uh, or with Seeing a match with two teams that are as good as this is that you know that a single mistake can mean maybe maybe a, maybe a dragon, maybe a few turrets, uh, but generally you don't get punished this hard, right? Because yeah, literally, if you go back to before that fight as Canyon, oh, yeah. able to find that's not the one that he really wanted there, but Zayas gonna ult through the wall and he'll get out. They lost what four four five turrets in this one Baron, like the the. the Flip of the switch in the minds of Team One as well. After a couple of their early plays didn't work out right, owner little over aggressive gets punished, and they smell a team fight. They smell an opportunity. Everyone goes in, and now for Deep Plus Kia, retaking control of this game is actually very, very tough because when you look at the spikes hit on the side of T1, you are now looking at Guma being fed after all. Zayus is unmatchable inside for Kana, who now completely has to give up any priority. Two levels behind as well. Yeah. What? It's insane. <laughs> look at this. The Five minutes, Atlas. Yeah. The, the, the swing in gold is, you know, 7,000 or something like that. Uh, after that Baron came through, and yeah, it was a 6k Baron power play or something like that, but the damage had been done prior after winning that team fight on the side of T1. And now with their composition, it, it also works fantastically well to hold on to this advantage because there's no Infinity Edge done from Deft yet. There's no, you know, big item spike for D plus Kia to get them back into this game. And they'll also uh, lose this Drake after all as well. So yeah, T1 weren't able to take that, but winning that fight, getting that Baron, and now they should be able to just hang around and wait for the rest of these dragons, and they should belong to them, unless D plus Kia can wrestle back some form of control. It's possible, it's gonna be real tough. Well, obviously the upside for D plus Kia is that had this been the game state since the beginning, <laughs> yeah. We will be we will be talking about okay, so they Could still be worse. they still they still have a Talia that skills very well, it's just hit the two item mark. Uh, we are looking at Deft getting closer to his infinity edge. You still have a Yumi. You do have an incredible amount of team fighting power if you can avoid flanks, which as we saw in the previous fight was very much their downfall. But it's not great. It's uh I think also way worse to go from feeling like you're in a lead in the game. Well, flick back onto Ona, taking a fair bit of damage here, but he's not too worried. Evan Flow from Kerry is going to keep him up. And not able to clear out the vision is D plus Kia Canyon. Now kind of relegated to in his own base, meaning that the Sejuani not going to be able to get too much tankier. Still has a considerable lead uh, against Ona right now. See how this one's going to go. Zayas at level 17. Oh, wait, no. Wait, what? Yes, that was Ona up there at level 13. I got very confused. Zayas is indeed at uh, level 17, which I'm not, don't think that should be allowed. Well, that has IE, that's something. There is definitely that. Carrier not going to get hit by the seismic shove as Canyon secures hit red buff. There's the Weaver's Wall to try, try and split off this fight. Ona moving towards that top side. Canyon avoids the tidal wave, but the bubble is going to connect. Final chapter coming in, but Canyon still in a whole lot of trouble. This Baron is just live, and Canyon is now extremely low. You see the problem there as well for D-Plus, they can't move out, they can't fight in those choke points against the composition of T1. Too many big AoE ultimates, they do have a lot of poke here though. Yeah, and Kana is going to have to try and use this Meganar, doesn't actually have the ability to do so. The Rift Scuttler will be secured here by T1. D-Plus here though, do stop the Baron. And I like it from T1. They just test. They just make sure that, all right, are you guys going to do your due diligence and check this Baron? If not, we're taking it. We're already halfway through. D plus gear, do this time actually move over and uh, and defend. But now T1, can, they can dance that dance again. Can keep going for these type of plays. A lot of ultimates actually invested here to try and set it up. Owner almost gets taken down, but rest of his team, you can see, all ultimates, like big team fighting ultimates, are still available here. And Deep Plus can't go in. Speaking, Baron has started up. Speaking of that dance again, Chronicler, they are going to do it one more time. Is, all right, there's the steel pain. What? Death steals the Baron and the seismic shove 
his extraordinary carrier is going to go down as well. And now D plus Kia, they've turned the whole game on its head. Zayus, can he try to fight this? The answer is absolutely not. And Kana's going to pick that up. We need that in ultra slow-mo because I have absolutely no idea what just happened. That might be game. What is going? Chronicler, I know this is a Saturday showdown. I know that we knew this was going to be hype. But I'm just I'm okay. not ready for the pace, let's, man. Let's let's calm down. The health bars are low. It's 20 seconds until Faker is back. 10 seconds for Ona. They should at the very least be able to get the inhibitor. I don't know. I think they should back off after this because if we get another throw, well, I don't, yeah. I don't, no, I don't even want to call it a throw. You know, I think both of these teams. <laughs> oh, Atlas! And how the pendulum swings, Chronicler, as we have two minutes on the D plus Kia Baron buff. If you don't like T1 or at their worst, you don't deserve them at their best. This might be, <laughs> unfortunately, because what they try to do here is a call where Zayus zones Canyon, Canyon but he's flash, unable to. Yes. Flash to coordinate Smite with Extendo Beam. Yes. And Death at this point incredibly strong. And then, as T1, you're stuck in a Baron Pit, and we talked a lot about the, the power of T1. Neither of these teams really can be in choke points. That's basically what it boils down to. As oh, you might you might call this a Death Steal. I call that a Canyon Giga Brain Secure. That's oh, what no, I'm of calling course. that. No, this, this is 100%. We saw this, oh, I forgot which team it was. There was another example where uh, an AD carry stole. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it happened Cuz. like a couple of days ago. Yeah, yeah. it was yesterday in the yeah, where, series, where right? Yeah, where Cuz was able to go for the smite, and as a result, they got the objective. Yep. Same thing happened there, and if T1 is the one that is caught in the choke point, there is also Unraveled Earth. There is a Mega Gnar. And if those cooldowns are available, you also don't have a lot of stuff going on. And now, it's D Plus who, is, again, is in control. As all right, going in. final chapter coming in. Gumiushi going to go up, and that is going to avoid the majority of everything here. Tidal Wave comes through. Can't Showmaker stops anyone from helping the Lucian, but he's still going to be absolutely fine. So a few buttons missing. Not the greatest Big here for D Plus here. Yeah, exactly. This bottom wave is going to be huge, but Zayas is being very frustrating here on this top side of the map, buying a lot of space. Canyon now going to go over and just look to secure Soul Point. They should be able to do so, as there is the Aqua Prison to stop the cannon from taking down the turret, and they do keep it alive. The Drake is secured there by death. So, a little bit of a brief respite, and the gold is back to dead even. Chronicler, um, did we want anything else from this series? Absolutely not. 4,000 gold is the Baron power play, and uh, that's just revenge for the previous T1 Baron power play, and now everything Back to perfect back, equilibrium. Yeah, Atlas. it is harmony on the rift. You know it's a good LCK, uh, LCK game when we literally have not been able to make any jokes for None? 32 minutes. We have not. We haven't meandered. We None? haven't low stated. We haven't. None? We've only talked about the video game. Yeah, that doesn't happen very often. I feel like we need to call that out. Yeah, we uh, actually we need to be doing better work because I think we're hired to <laughs> to not talk about the video game most of the time. Uh, but no, it's been too entertaining. Death going to oh, take down this outer turret towards the top side. As D plus Kia, how are they supposed to actually close out the game? Is the question. Are they waiting for the next Baron? Are they going to go for that fight? Is it then about Showmaker controlling the battlefield enough, utilizing the Weaver's Wall to block out T1? Or is it about getting these waves shoved in and then finding your way uh, to split up the map? Uh, I just don't know. Is it just wait for the Drake? Are we just uh, going for <laughs> for a soul or an elder win condition? Oh, it's not man. Even, the, the, the funny with these two teams, it's not about soul. Uh, elder definitely is a win condition in of itself, but I don't think the soul really matters. It's about yeah, no, then wins the that fight. That was a bit of a silly thing to say. I, I, oh, that's okay. Oh, does have GA. Yeah. So Zayas can walk for uh, with relative impunity. A lot of cooldowns are still up or down here for D+. Plus. So, flashes for Kana, Canyon, Deft, of course, all results of that Baron play that they were able to successfully pull off. Everything outside of Zaius's flash is up for T1, so this is a moment for them oh. to try and find a fight. And this really is going to all come down to execution. Like, there is, there is no easy answer here because you have three carries that need to be answered on the side of T1. You need to, at the very least, deal with one, preferably two, because if either Zayus, Faker, or Guma stays alive in the fight, they will clean up the fight. And yep. for D+, 
The same thing can be said for the Talia and for Deft. If Deft doesn't go down in your initial play, and he gets to just sit in the back and Zeri Yumi it up, then it doesn't matter if you kill Kana fast, if you maybe take down Canyon, uh, you're still going to be in deep trouble. And for T1, I think proactive plays are a little bit harder due to the existence of Talia at this yeah. point in time and the fact that Yumi with her ultimate can be a really big deterrent. <laughs> so then it comes down to poke, right? Like who gets a little bit more poke down? Is it Faker who is also gone for the Rylai? So a lot of utility. Stopwatches across the board available as well and I'm looking for flanks here, Chronicler. I'm looking from Zayus, at yeah. Zayus and Ona finding these angles that what, they have what been if, able but to. But what if Canyon? It might just be. But the, what if the Juani flank angle? Oh my God! That gets it in the end. Size oh my Chuck God! Go wide as Canyon. He managed to find Faker. The tidal wave comes in. Faker goes golden. It's not over just yet. As Ona is trying to pick it up. Speaking of picking it up, the ultimate to come through from the Yazir almost works, but he is going to go down. Now Zayus has found his way in, but Deft is ripping them apart. The GA is now going to come down. Showmaker finds the flash, but not the seismic shove. And it's a double kill for the world champion AD Carry. And D plus Kia here in game number one may have just done it. Chronicler, this is why I love the LCK. We get another one of these. We might get another two of these. Please give me two more. Oh Maybe my it's not goodness. even over yet. Yeah, we, we seconds. might need a Baron. Uh, we might need to also pick up a soul. Can they clear the wave here? That's the big question. All right, I think D plus Kira are just going to look for the end. Baker, 15 seconds left to go. 30 on Zayas. I don't think I have the time. It's pretty low. Kumiyushi trying to get this one done, but it's not going to work. The final chapter is indeed the final one in this game, but not in this series. D plus Kia will take game one. Oh boy! Woo! The only thing we can definitively say after that game is, why isn't this a best of five? Yeah, no, what can we can definitively say is that was the best game we've had so <laughs> far this year. Um, except for that one that I already declared the best game of the year. Um, I think maybe that was a bit uh, too soon, uh, perhaps. Possibly. <laughs> Pulled the trigger a little bit early on that one, Atlas. Yeah, I, I would say that I possibly did. Um, but I think Wolf and I have been talking about this all week. We're just waiting for when the Great League of Legends starts. I think we had a taste of that with how KT performed last night, but it was nothing compared to this game. You know who I have to vote for. We're oh, looking, it's Canyon. It we're is Canyon we're 100. We're looking at him right now. The flank on the pick here. Notice how many moments there are here where... Yeah. He also could have lost it, right? Like Zayus Ridiculous. And missing Zayus the ultimate timing, there. Yeah. Those are the type of moments where if Zayus does hit that ultimate and Death dies, with Guma and Karia getting a lot more space, it's literally a game of seconds here. Like, not really even. Seconds. It's like half a second. Yeah. Oh my god, what a great first. Look at that gold. Look at that gold graph, Atlas. This gold graph, very similar to the fans in Lowell Park here tonight, especially towards the end there. Back and forth, back and forth. That gold swing, that first Baron call from T1. I mean, they spent. Most so, of the beginning of the game falling further and further behind until they just exploded into a winning position. Any team that falls that far behind against T1 in the LCK that isn't deep plus loses the game. Oh, 100%. After the Baron, yeah. game's over. Yep. Wow. And then you've got that man right there, that polar bear. You can see on your screen, Canyon taking so much control. Just extraordinary. Ladies and gentlemen, we are going to go to a short break. When we get back, the space gets to break down that exemplary game of League of Legends, and then we get treated to game number two. We'll see you there.
아, 찌르, 아, 찌르 한번 볼게. 오건, 아, 찌르, 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 아, 자, 출시 계속 거든? 대시 없어? 디제이브 지켜봐. 아. 바로 갈까? 디제이브 지켜봐. 아, 미드, 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 미드. 어. 디 해봐. 끝날 것 같아. 무시한 노공이야. 이거 최대한 퍼져서. 아. 예, 세긴 하거든? 골프 빠졌어. 아, 그냥 나르, 나르가 계속 골프 빼도. 내 골프 없어. 내가 맞을게, 계속. 미니 한곳 들어와. 메인 올때 가자, 메인 올 때. 천천히, 해. 천천히. 맞지 봐봐, 맞지 봐봐. 천천히 해봐, 천천히 해봐. 우리 유지력 좋아서 천천히 해보자. 이만 아껴줘, 이만 아끼면 돼. 이만 아낄게, 이만 아낄게. 파워 쳐야 돼, 우리. 아. 아래 거다 이깔게, 이거다 이깔게. 아래, 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 아래. 아르타워 아르타워 천천히 천천히 뒤에꺼 뒤에꺼 공 발주 내가 이거 타워 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 나이스 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 잘 좋았다 좋았다 이렇게 이제 가네
and welcome back to The Space. It's me, Valdez, with Wolf, and that was a banger of a first game already as D-plus was able to get that come from behind victory and eventually, very dominantly, end that one with a crazy team fight at the end. Big congrats to them. What did you think about this draft, though, Wolf? I, I thought the two standout picks were obviously the Yone and the Talia here. The Yone pick for Zayas, he's been fantastic on it in the past, into Nar specifically as well. So he has this counter pick on the top side, wants to make a lot out of it, while bottom side, they think they're going to be pretty self-sufficient with the Lucian lane. Doesn't end up working out that way because Deft actually plays the lane extremely well, swaps to mid early and gets some value there too against Faker. And the efforts they wanted to spend to try to get this NAR behind fail. And in fact, Zayas ends up being pretty muted through a lot of the early game as getting outside laned by a NAR. Things did fall apart. But I think really one bad fight from D plus Kia on that third Drake put T1 massively ahead and it took a miracle to come back. Yeah, I mean, T1 very good at kind of getting those giant leads. It's kind of like the T1 Baron-esque uh, thing. It's like, okay, we got lead they're very good at winning fights and not losing their members as well like just being very clean in that facet so they're able to take baron because they always have so many people alive so they rush to the baron take it down but d plus did not give up and i think at that point you know there was a really big swing in gold but d plus is comp there were definitely ways for them to come back in it especially because that yone did seem a little bit you know a little bit less powerful than maybe T1 was expecting. Yeah. Well, let's take a look at the first macro bits here of this game because there was a pretty big lead for D plus Kia, right? There was a, a moment here where Harold is taken and Guma and Karia decide, okay, we're just gonna stay bottom here and get a ton of plates on this Lucian. We're gonna force our own lead here. But Deft actually rotates mid here and sticks around while the Herald is taken. And Faker makes a huge mistake here in terms of where he's positioning on the map. Not close enough to his turret. There's a control ward here in the brush next to the river. So he doesn't actually know Canyon is coming down, but should know because of the Rift Herald take that he's in the vicinity. They get the kill on Faker, get massive plate gold value for the Zeri, plus the kill that Death picks up. And what looked like a really good macro play from T1 to get that Lucian gold bottom side, ignore the Herald fight, actually backfires big time. Yeah, it was a really big deal. I mean, it ended up being a very early uh, gold lead to the side of D plus Kia because of that one play. They were able to get a lot of value with the Rift Herald in mid, and essentially what looked decent for T1 in the beginning ended up being a huge swing in favor of D plus, and they were in a great spot from there. Yeah. I think, you know, as long as they didn't kind of have that weird dragon fight against T1 and allow them to take the Baron, they probably could have just, you know, pretty cleanly eventually won that game. But that's not the way this game went, yeah. as we did see. So we're not going to show the dragon fight, but you guys watch the game. The dragon fight goes poorly. Then Baron is taken immediately afterwards by T1. They take full map control. And D plus Kia spend the entire time defensively just trying to take that vision away. They finally are able to do it with a really cool Talia's wall from Canyon. And then we'll go into the final highlight here, which is the amazing steal we saw with Canyon and Def using Extendo Beam here. Now watch Zayas in this moment. He wants so badly to deny this steal that he comes in here, doesn't hit Deft at all, who's on the edge. So they can flash in perfectly timed with Deft's W there, the Extendo Beam to secure the Baron Steel. Because of the angle of everyone on T1 trying to group up on the right side to deny this steal, they're all trapped in this pit where they get followed up on so easily by the knockup there from Talia. And the positioning is just really rough into a, a Yumi ult as well. And so much of this fight, I think, is based on the fact that Zayas greedily tries to deny the Canyon from getting into flash range there for the smite. If he has his ultimate there to stop them from actually winning the team fight, even if the steel goes off, maybe they turn it, but because he uses it to go out of the pit, they fail to win the fight. And that's the game winning moment for D plus Kia. Yeah, either way, I mean, that was so incredibly individually handled by the members of D plus as well. Like, not just the Baron steel, but like Showmaker perfectly setting up the seismic shove. He got three people in that, you know, Kellen timing his ultimate to lock everybody down afterwards. Like D plus, they were so ready and T1, they do this at times where it's like, okay, we're just so good. We're really confident. This is our Baron, it's T1 Baron. You know, that's the meme we talk about all the time. They're like, we're just gonna take it in front of you, fine. Like they didn't clear out all the vision. D plus were able to just walk on up to the pit and say, okay, we have five members right next to the pit and it just offers them the perfect opportunity to steal it. So while D plus did play extremely well individually and as a team to win that fight, I also think that T1 a little bit overconfident, maybe even cocky to just say, okay, we're just gonna take this Baron in front of you. It's ours. They had, and as we saw, it was not. Yeah, they had the Yone ult and that made them feel just confident enough that they'll be able to pull this off no matter what. And it was super close and it was an amazing steal. I feel like the, the one thing I'll say before we go into POG is like, 
Both of these teams really fought super hard and had amazing individual plays to steal the game back. Like all three of those critical moments in the game, the early game lead, the take back from T1, and then the steal on Baron, was neither team messing up, but the other team just saying, this is my moment to steal this game away. And that's what I loved about it so much. Yeah, I mean, it really showcases just how strong both of these teams are. Like T1, they have the great teamwork to make some of those crazy T1 Baron calls and to sometimes, you know, especially against teams that are not ready against it, to just like take objectives, take over the game immediately. Like Chronicle was saying, like a lot of times T1 would just do that and then just win even off of like the first Baron, but D-Plus was too good. They were able to get so many strong fights and especially that last flank from Canyon as well, just kind of put the nail in the coffin. They were already ahead. They were already probably gonna win, but then like just to do that to them and kind of make them look silly in the mid lane. Yeah. Just to add insult to injury and really take that game one home. I think Deft had an amazing uh, game with Zeri. Uh, in terms of his 2v2 in the laning phase, he played it extremely well. They said, forget traditional lane swaps and lane assignments. Let's put Talia bottom side and put Deft mid. Look for that kill on Faker. Just beautiful play overall in the early game too for D+. Yeah, just really good stuff from them. Let's see who one individual player who will pick it up. It will be Canyon who, after all, the early game was insane from him. He created so much work in the bottom side. And then, of course, some of those late game fights were also insane. So many of these moments to your bottom side were set up by Deft as well, winning lane really hard here against Gumakaria. And he had Kellen's help, of course. This is not the Lulu lane, right? This is actually Yumi going over with this area. And sometimes the Lulu lane can really lose out after level two and you just sit back passively. But as Chronicle was mentioning on the cast, there are some timings actually where you can trade really aggressively with Ayumi. He played that well. Canyon capitalized on those moments, right? And I felt like Owner was very absent in this game. I think we will see a few split votes. Actually, no, not a single one. I thought some, some deaf voters would be here because of how well he's helped steal and how well he played the early game, but it's all Canyon all the time here. He was a little bit more obvious, let's say, uh, just some of the plays he was able to make, but a great team effort from the side of D-Plus Kia. They take game number one. Let's go back to the casters for game number two. Canyon not robbed of his 11 out of 11. I even think that uh, with the fact that it said Zeri that got the steal on the Baron, that was still Canyon, timing it so beautifully to make sure that Ona didn't even have a chance. That was pure teamwork of Oh yeah, the Parker and the Polar Bear. Two animals together, an unlikely combination, but clearly one that T1 has got to respect. And even going back to those replays, there are so many small micro moments that could have oh, yeah. decided that fight until the very end. And and oh. also like a lot of people, I, I I could see saying that like if Zeus times that ultimate better, then they win the game. I don't think they win. I think the game just goes on for another 15 minutes and maybe they win, right? I think that gets them a reset. That gets them a fight for an Elder Drake, perhaps, in the past, in the future. It's so we hard. Could, we could have still been casting the game. It could still be going now. Uh, but instead, we're in game number two. We'll see whether T1 can bring this one back as DK, once again, on the red side. And we have similar bands thus far. In fact, no changes whatsoever. Varus and Caitlyn, both of them immediately locked away. And so Nami first pick to come in yet again, and if it ain't broke, don't fix it. So I could imagine D plus Kia probably going to look at a similar thing. I, I don't mind like, a run back. I would like the Yumi Lucian to be locked in, but not going to be the case this time around. I guess, you know, the Zoomies cooldown doesn't mean, it means that you we know, are get running much value. it back, Atlas. I think everyone's oh, kind not. of okay oh. with, uh, the exact same game being replayed again. I personally love Vi. I actually do think that Vi into specifically yeah. will be Zeri Yumi. Very, very valuable. Denting Blow is also pretty good against the tankiness of Sejuani. I like it. It's a two for one deal. I know. Two Beautiful. Ults, the Zeri, you know, and maybe you get a free Yumi for your efforts as well as, unsurprisingly, we are going to have very similar now. Siva. In terms oh. of pick potential, no, I'm not on board. In terms of pick potential, I really like the Vi, and we might also see, as a result of this fake, a pivot away to something that has more proactivity. Azir and Vi is still pretty decent, but there's a couple of champions. Ari comes to mind, but even something like Lissandra in the right matchup, I do think really pushes that 2v2 over the edge and allows you to get very, very aggressive with it, uh, with it as Jace gonna get taken away here, and I would not be shocked if D Plus just lock in R4 and R again if T1 don't ban it because we had our question marks, 
But all things considered, Kana is not the point. Uh, top lane in general is not the point, because the matter right now is <laughs> not about top lane, even remotely. But making sure that you can again let Showmaker react with his Y champion pool and just throw Kana on tank slash soak duty, I think is completely fine. Well, Renekton would need to be banned here to even things out, and instead Ooh. it will be the Nas. So now they are for Renekton, right? Well, I mean, now T1 needs to not ban one of Cassante or Renekton, otherwise D plus Kia gets the one of them that they don't ban. So the Talia will be the ban away this time around. I really like that adaptation from T1. I think Showmaker played fantastically, but also Talia just makes living your life as a Lucian feel awful. Vi also yeah. um, would be having a real rough time. So Cassante will get through. That looks to be Kana's choice here. They save that counter pick for Showmaker once again. And for T1, gonna be blinding mid again. Azir, Avai, not necessarily the best 2v2, but blinding a lot of the picks that are quite strong with the Avai can be scary. Into Showmaker, as mentioned previously, very happy to pick up. Weird stuff. Is it an Ari game? Well, that's what I was mentioning earlier. And. No. It is not. It is a zero game, and T1 seemingly going to remain with what have, uh, has worked for them thus far. Vi being the major swap out. Now, obviously, we're not going to see the Yone again. Jax is one of the uh, answers into Cassante, doesn't have the greatest early matchup, and Fiora would be another. Ooh. Camille, in terms of setup with the Vi, I love. But I do think you can run into some troubles into whatever Showmaker is going to pick up here. Yumi also somewhat obnoxious to play into. And instead it's going to be Jax, who early on doesn't have the best matchup into Cassante, but definitely outskills him inside very, very reliably. Also strong together with the Vi for early Ooh. fights. This would be the aggressive choice, yep. also the lane choice. Silas would be the team fight choice for Showmaker here, but it's Akali that's picked up. Oh my goodness, some of the most famous Showmaker plays were in fact on this Akali, uh, fresh off a re rework a few years ago. And melee champions, you know, Showmaker, Chovy, definitely two players that absolutely love this. The permafrost synergy also far better this time around for D+. Yeah, Kira. that's what I was going to go into because Canyon was MVP, 11 out of 11, ran the early game, and that was, sure, mostly bot side focused, but also without really anyone enabling him on his permafrost. Now, with both Cassante and the Akali mid-game skirmishes are absolutely lethal for this team. And the early game to me is the point that T1 has got to change up, because even with how well they played the mid-game, if they get into mid game on even footing. I think they can even build their lead further. We see the explosiveness that this team is capable of. This draft definitely does enable this. Still has a lot of late game answers. Ooh, let us know in chat whether you've got a Terror Electric uh, Psyduck, which would be the Zeus Pokemon. Absolutely fantastic stuff there. Glad to see some more Psyducks being used for the Zeus fandom in, uh, in the audience here in Lopak. I put you off, didn't I? Uh, no, I, I was actually giving you space because I was expecting you to go on oh, no, longer no, no. about no, no, no. Psyduck. I, I, don't, I don't think I know, we need to do that. I know Psyduck, obviously. I'm, I'm well acquainted, but you generally go a little bit further when it comes to your <laughs> you're sharing your knowledge of Pokemon. But looking at these drafts, uh, T1 still very strong 1-3-1. One, one. Can team fight great pick potential and on the side of D plus Kia, do think that they're skirmishing if they can get good setup, it's very, very strong. We saw the power of Yumi's very last game. Yeah, well, we'll see whether it's going to work this time around as well, or whether we get those three games. Let's do it. All right, T1 fans, definitely a full voice uh, here at LOL Park today, but D plus Kia certainly have their fair share of fans as well. Especially, and we've spoken about this at length, but with Deft coming to the team, it, helps. Uh, it certainly does help. I also want to return to, you know, some of the, the news that we had when Deft was first announced uh, for D plus Kia. It was actually Canyon that sort of invited him onto the team. And we could see already, like, you take that Baron Smite, for example, that synergy between the two players is kind of already there, which is something that uh, I've, I've seen a lot of people mentioning online and things like that. 
it's just really, really cool to see, and we'll see whether that continues here in game two. It's also for Showmaker and Kenyon the first time that they... Oh, hold up. Yeah, just going to walk straight in there. They knew as Carrier down to about 300. Kellen bopping and blocking, having a great time. And uh, this early game working oh. out real well as... Was that some, uh, yeah, some we're spamming from Deft? Of course, Deft and Carrier, very good friends. Um, and so probably uh, in pretty good faith here. Really nicely done there. Uh, both teams aware of where the wards were, so DK playing around Vision and able to get a lot as Carrier just healing. Yeah. For the wave control. <laughs> oh. I kind of respect it. As, I really uh, Zayas is just walking at Kana here. Um, presses Counter yeah. Strike. And uh, Kana struggles a little bit in the engage. Missing that third Q, going to be a little bit sad. As uh, Kasante, look at that. Decent win rate. See that? Two wins on Dundun. Yeah. Yeah. Got, uh, got and in fact, OG on that as well. I mean, all jokes aside, I think that his was the most impressive. <laughs> actually. Was, yeah. uh, his Kasante performance yesterday was uh, pretty out of control. Both yeah. styling on his lane opponents and... Um, and being Dundun at the and, same and time. And being Dundun and also the mental as every team that faces Dongxia. <laughs> Bit of a struggle afterwards as... Looking at what we have in terms of early game here, it is somewhat reminiscent as Canyon. Right. Uh, say hello. Showmaker. Just going to try and push Faker out of this lane, of course. Uh, the amount of control that uh, Faker has is definitely very high. As Canyon doesn't make it over the wall. That was an interesting interaction there. As Showmaker just, just uh, backflipped over just to see what was going on. Ona gets over the wall. Doesn't find the Vault Breaker damage. As uh, Permafrost, Winter's Wrath, Canyon absolutely fine right now. As Gumiushi dashing forward yet again. Deft gets the zoomies. Carrier going to have to deal with that prowling projectile damage. And uh, just some Biffo towards the bottom side. Nothing happening just yet. And we'll see whether these junglers can change up how this lane is going to eventuate. And what I originally wanted to get into when we were distracted by the level 1 shenanigans here in this bot lane is that in all their time, Canyon and Showmaker never have played with a truly elite level AD carry. We've said Ghost at his heyday was still very serviceable, right? Very good weak side player, really worked for what that team wanted to do. Yeah. But even with Dokdan last year, who had an incredible split on Nongshi, he really didn't fulfill that role as Zeus. All right, let's see whether Kana can find it. He does not whatsoever, but still, Zeus could be in trouble here as, oh, Arctic Assault's going to miss. So never mind, Zeus just walks it out. Sometimes the Jax walks a bit faster than you expect, you know? Cool Kids never sidestep. <laughs> Just keep walking. <laughs> In case you're wondering, Cool Kids never panic is the live sandbox slogan. And I love it. And I'm going to try ham fist it into as many <laughs> different ways as I can. As well, they don't panic, and they haven't yet. We'll see whether they do against Breon, the greatest test here in the well, LCK. He is didn't panic, so by definition, yeah. he is now a Cool Kid. He is now a Cool Kid. Can confirm. Um, I do like what you were talking about with uh, D plus Kia never really having that elite AD carry. Also, when they won with Ghost, it was in a very top mid meta, as we're going to have to hold that thought yet again. This Arctic Assault is going to land. Uh, Showmaker looks for a few five point strikes. Faker is going to be absolutely fine for now. Backflip connects. This wave very, very large, though, so Showmaker not going to go too aggressive on it. We're just going to have the. Uh, the game go down to a little bit more of a slow pace where we get to finally talk about these uh, changes that we were talking about. Well, and now before, before, okay, before one, we do that, one more please, point, please. very quickly. Uh, owner actually able to, thanks to that gank from Canyon, or more so trying to really pressure Showmaker, who was getting bullied by Faker. Uh, as a result, got found out by Owner. Owner actually taking a fair amount of bot side jungle camps, and now as a result, is ahead in the matchup. Unlike in the previous game where Canyon was both able to farm and then was still able to get ahead and far, or uh, was still able to have a bigger impact on the map. Now Owner will have a pretty sizable lead as he clears his bot side jungle, so well done by the T1 jungler after a rough first game. And back to you, Atlas. All right, and so what we were talking about was when Damwon Kia at the time managed to win uh, in 2020, it was with Ghost, as I'm gonna have to hold the court again, Dev has to use Barrier. Taken down extraordinarily low as Zayas brought under the turret. Canyon's back again. Let's see where the Arctic Assault's going to land. It is. It gets the flash this time. D plus Kia get a successful gank. Level 6 gain here by Kana, but now Deft oh. and Kellen will be in a lot of trouble. 
Owners moving down, D plus Kia, they know exactly what's going on here. Showmaker's on his way. Yeah. He's, and he's running. He's going to have to get here fast. As, oh, the interruption on the back there from Zayas, who's now going to start the fight onto Canyon. Blast Cones to get his way out. He's going to eat some honey fruit, and uh, this might be able to help him in the 1v1. Permafrost going to come through as there is the old back. That was very weird. Don't know what happened, really. Is We're going to continue the weirdness underneath this turret towards the bottom side. Gumushi taking a lot of damage, but they're going to successfully get the dive off against the Zeri. One for one, I guess. Cross the map. Yeah. Don't know if it had to be. With Zayas maybe overestimating his safety there. Gets pulled out of his leap strike by Kana. And felt like there were angles for him there. Obviously, his back gets interrupted. Uh, is very strong and also might be a miscommunication here. Faker currently uh, catching a wave underneath his turret, but... Yeah, to me, I, I, I wouldn't be surprised if Zayas thought that he could, at the very least, just get out of here safely, but... Uh, just even pull, pull even back you, with the... Uh, yeah, of course, he got interrupted, but even if you finish that leap strike, I think you might still be in trouble. And he is buying a lot of time, uh, but this play on the bottom half of the map was already set up regardless, so... Will be the kill going over the carrier. Not the best, although a nearly mandate finish you're still going to take, but obviously, ideally, you'd get that kill on Guma. Yep, this stage of the game, you're probably kind of okay with it because that mandate spike for Guma is yeah, also really, really, really high. It's not the end of the world. No. Um, but still, would prefer that money on the Lucian as Carrier coming on forward, getting some vision down so that T1 can secure the first dragon of the game. No Cloud Souls. I'm personally quite sad. Everybody else probably pretty happy. As Gumiushi. Clearing out waves under here. Showmaker, sort of out of the woods, kind of, with uh, how this matchup goes. See how he's going to be able to play it out as uh, Deft and Kellen down here just trying to take some control back. And they will be able to do so with the fact that Showmaker gets inside track in this mid lane. Canyon also going to secure first Herald yet again. T1 not quite finding the pace this game that they've had in previous ones with that dragon being delayed. However, due to the early ganks from Canyon kind of being more centered around mid lane and Guman Carry out this time around, not really getting into trouble early on, we do see the more conventional Lucianami versus Zero Yumi type of lane where they're continuously getting shoved in. They're dropping a lot of plates. Also, a lot of effort goes over to Owner there, who, of course, with his dives, we have to get Ladonis. Oh, we're going to contest. Yeah, uh, Canyon. Let's see whether he can survive this one. He get, does get in there, but Owner is going to lock that one down. The buy immediately goes down, though. It's a double kill for the Zeri. And Showmaker, the perfect execution's fantastic. Canyon limps away with his life intact, and it's a triple kill. Oh, uh, what were you saying about the bottom lane again? Well, both bottom lane and top lane are a disaster, so never mind, I guess. Wait, can I got a solo kill in that? What? Yeah. As, as I pointed out, Jackson the Cassante works if you get to the later stage of the game, but early on, Cassante is going to kind of dunk on you. And the key thing here is that Ono already gets taken so low, so this is a three versus four right from the get go. 2 1 takes too much damage from the Baron. In the meantime, in the mid lane, Owner is just going to kill Canyon, I guess. Now Carrier is flashing on top, and it's a double kill. So Owner's redeemed as well. Back to you, Chronicler. <laughs> I am. Uh, okay. So, Never mind. Back oh. to me. Deft going to come in and see whether he can get a steal on this Rift Scuttler. Get him, Deft. All right. Um, He's going to go for it, and it's not going to happen. Owner secures it. There we go. Back to you, Chronicle. So, all things considered, uh, we are now looking a little bit closer in terms of T1's position, because obviously what happened was a disaster. Zayas probably just going to... Oh, no, not even. Kana just flashing in correctively, recognizing that the Counter-Strike didn't get enough done, and then running oh. Zayas down. Cassante things. Yeah, nicely done. He has a big lead, right? So uh, already at that point, a kill up. As then, Canyon just drops a turret in mid, seemingly unaware of where Owner is, and Owner just comes in, queues, and with that lower health bar, uh, that is definitely a big risk. Carrier also flashing to make sure he can get the speed up and or slow. I guess both. Not Andor. Um, yeah. But he, even just the speed up would have been enough there to secure a kill. And 
It's a oh, little bit better as... Ooh, Guma. Yeah, I think that might be a dead Gumiushi. He's gonna dash and try and get out of the way of this one, but the final chapter's there. It's a drive-by from Kellen, and now Carrier is not going to be super safe, but Owner is in the area. Looks like D-plus Kia are not going to overstay their welcome, even if it is a three versus two. It's once again a bit of a battle between these top laners. They are still, still fighting and isn't behind by too much CS necessarily. It's still a dire situation. Another look that we're used to seeing from T1, right? Them actually taking such a beating. Zay is individually not looking as hot as he has in the past. Guma and Karia actually getting taken down. Is open. I've seen this one before, but the Q is going to miss this time around. And think about the level of catharsis here for Kana. Remember, he was the one replaced by Zayus on this exact T1 roster, right? Like, this must feel fantastic to get some revenge. And after his time on Nongshim, where everyone was like, oh, it was the greatest move from T1. During that whole year, um, this must feel really good to finally have a good game uh, against the young player. And this is, of course, not saying that uh, there's anything wrong with how Zayas has been playing. It just must have felt a little bit rough to be Kana last year. And this must feel Very. fantastic. Yeah. As we are again looking at... I Okay, Atlas, how many times are we going to see this seesaw? Like um, well, I don't know. I think it's as long as we're watching this matchup, that's how it's going to go. As Ona, a bit of damage here. Ward goes in, Prowling Projectile to slow down Ona. I like how Prowling Projectile is being nerfed so many times that it doesn't even look like a slow anymore. Uh, very it barely does very, anything. Very balanced ability now. <laughs> yeah. Love Yumi. She's the amazing. rest of Yumi, entirely unbalanced. But that ability, been hit with that ban oh, and a we few times. see the question mark picks come down as well. But I think they're expecting it to be Kalan and Death. And unfortunately, Zeri can get over the wall in a moment's notice. Very ready for this. And Owner is in the vicinity as well, so you feel relatively safe there if you're the T1 bot lane. Fortunately for Zeus, he has now finished his Divine Sunward, which is going to help him out a lot. But with the state of top lane as it is right now, I don't expect that he will be able to actually try and match and really get anything on Kana until he gets to a, the very least a second item. That's going to be quite far away. So maybe some attention from Ona would help. But trying to get Sante is a relatively fruitless endeavor. It is. Generally. So I'm not going to feel too good about that one as we have a lot of relevant drakes. The only one that you don't really want to roll would be the Hex or the Camtech rather. Everything else, if you're either team here, you're going to love. Yep, you're feeling pretty good about it. Let's see, 10 seconds, and then we have the Ocean Drake available. We got to get word on exactly what it's going to be. Zayas gets himself a plate. We'll tank a bit of damage here. It's T1 looking to go for Dragon number two. We'll see who's going to be able to win this fight. Gold entirely even. The whole game kind of hinging on the next battle between these teams as far as who's going to have that uh, first mover's advantage moving into the mid game. And even though Deft is in a great position in this game in terms of already having his shield bow, Gilforce Nami, or Gilforce Mandate rather, is done. And I wouldn't be too surprised if D Plus try to go for a cross map trade here as opposed to trying to actually hard force a fight because unless Showmaker immediately gets backline axes and blows Guma up, I think he can run into some risks, but no, no, I was wrong. The plus are looking. Yeah, they're looking at cake and eating it too, as it is going to be a mountain drake as well. That's going to be absolutely massive, honestly, for either oh, side here. Yeah. But uh, Cassante's licking his lips, looking at a potential mountain soul. Both teams capable of picking up three of those drakes. Scary it's times. The next dr few dragon fights are actually going to be very important this game. Really is because we have. Double Rage and Virtue users. We have Cassante, who obviously skills off of tank stats. Uh, we have Ajax, who also, if he is able to, in addition to the damage that he's able to output, get even more beef, he will be a very, very tough opponent to deal with. As there we see, that's that's another one. I'm sure we're going to go back up and down a few more times. As yeah. Vision Control 41 was great there, allowing them to be aware of D Plus's key attempt to still try and contest for the objective. Uh, while picking themselves up the Rift Herald, then if they can open up mid and start maybe setting up some kills around Guma and Carry out right now are very, very strong. Mid to Cryo is really hard to contest for D plus for the foreseeable future, so could be a little bit harder to play around any of these objectives, but I am also worried that we might just not have anything happen for the next three and a half minutes, because that's when the next dragon will come up. Yep, that's going to be the important time 
course, it's four minutes away from uh, T1 starting off any Barons, which is, of course, their favorite thing to do. Um, so we're just going to have to bide our time for a moment. So maybe do you think that I could go back to the story that I started about 15 minutes ago? Or that you that started we, that, that I wanted to continue? Started. Please yeah. continue. Um, okay, so we were talking about when uh, Darmok here at the time managed to win Worlds. And it was during a topside meta where Nogari and uh, Showmaker could have just the greatest time ever. Uh, Ghost was really good at playing utility. And that was really... Okay, never mind. I'm going to hold that thought as immediately the Nami just explodes. Carrier turned into uh, fish food here as the permafrost comes down. Owner in trouble as well. Showmaker collects that one. Perfect execution. Now going to be available as Canyon's diving on in. He wanted to tank that to see whether Showmaker could grab the kill, but instead he holds on to the ultimate and they will just walk away with the three kills. I should start that story more often so that because we can just get action in any time yes. we want. Craziest thing is that overall, this turn will go to D plus Kia. They will gain a considerable oh, amount yes. of control oh, over the mid game. But because the wave was dropped on bot side, uh, D plus Kia doesn't build up as much of a gold lead as you might expect of a, a play like that. As I am wondering how that play, <laughs> yeah. how that continues. That was a cliffhanger if I've ever seen one. As very straightforward, carry out walking into onboard territory gets blown up immediately. And this decisiveness from D plus has hold up. Yeah, the there's a uh, channel. I'm trying to watch it as we see this, and then it was Showmaker holding off. Now we've got another battle in this mid lane. Let's see whether this outer turret stays alive. Is Cassante immediately going to go down? Kana just caught napping there a little bit. Now T1 looking to get Shirley another charge onto this inner turret. Yumi dashing over towards Depth here, but it looks like D plus here are going to be in trouble. Jet Set Radio Future to get Depth out of there. Sundisk is going to be put up. So now, the world's smallest a rank in this mid lane. And it looks like this inner turret's going to be given up. T1, really good and dominant play to just capitalize off Hanna being a little slow. Really feels like one team, one player walks up and dies, and then they push two turrets. And then the other team, one player walks up, dies, and they take turrets. And this is just going to be swinging left and right until one of the teams makes a crucial mistake around a Baron. As, look at that. Yeah, Baron. heart monitor, seriously. <laughs> and there are a lot of, like, I, I know, I know, all of us have a lot of adrenaline running through our bodies I, right now because the, like, I, I could imagine that there is not a single person that doesn't want this to go three games. I really want do. as many games as possible. Uh, T1 currently in the lead, but uh, D plus gear have just been They've been better than I was expecting today, I'm not going to lie. Uh, I, I do have very high expectations and hopes for this team, but to beat T1 in their first matchup is not something that uh, I personally put as highly likely on my bingo card, you know? Because I felt like they'd need the added time a lot more than what has felt like a well-oiled machine for quite some time now on the T1 side of things. One game away from being world champs last year, and it was Deft's mi miracle run that stood in their way. The amount of plot armor necessary and uh, to get through was uh, too much. That this is still one of the most, if not the most, formidable team we have in the LCK. I argue that a lot of what Deeklas Kia is showing it today really points to. Oh, never mind. I might have cursed them. I was thinking about giving Canyon praise, so that already. <laughs> Uh, that, that's on me. As uh, very important Draker, even individual Mountain Drake can make a big difference in how close these fights are. Absolutely. You can see Canyon diving forward. Try and make this one work out. Showmaker standing guard as well. As there's the flash in! Canyon just doesn't want to waste any time. Carrier now going to be out of flash away. Gets the tidal wave in, but doesn't find any joy. Showmaker ultimate now on cooldown. The D plus Kia, not a lot of buttons left to press. T1, I think, have managed to get control as Gumiushi diving towards Death, who does dash over the wall. He'll be fine. But the Drake, not so much. And T1, they get what they're looking for. Crucially, also a lot more uh, cooldowns and, and summoners invested by D plus Kia. Canyon, Showmaker, both flashing there. Whereas for T1, only Carrier has to invest his. And also not the end of the world, as this attempt from Canyon, I do think that T1 was very aware that it was coming, you see Guma very much finger at ready because just at the moment he goes over, they place a blue ward and as a result, they catch Karia not going to be enough and then a lot of cooldowns are used trying to maybe bait something out of T1 with uh, Showmaker going in there, not actually working out. First Drake does go over to T1 
Oh, and I so can't believe that right, this is all like this much intensity for a lone mountain drake that isn't well, even soul point. But that's just how important it is. That's how much these fights mean in this game. And T1, you might be looking at the kill score and you're like, oh, but they're behind. But they're not. They've got three turrets. They have a lot of gold. The map certainly starting to get under their control, especially at this stage of the game. They have split push win condition for Zayas. He's starting to get strong. Uh, Gumiushi really feeling it right now. Has his two items built up. And this is Lucian Nami time. This is their moment. It's kind Very of happy with how this game is. T1 just start up the Baron, and I would question it, and then it would work. <laughs> uh, but they don't, obviously. Going to play it a little bit safer here. Void Staff done for Faker. It's quite strong. Yeah, Ward, Ward's everywhere right now, as once again, Canyon feels like he's found someone. Una in a whole host of trouble. The final chapter comes in, but he's able to do a mini Vault Breaker, gets himself out. Flash had to be used as well. Shoemaker going to get out of the way of this one. Last remaining outer turret is going to be taken here by T1 as well, further extending that gold lead. And whereas most of the fights have been won by the plus, the actual gold, as you already alluded to, due to how well they've been taking turrets, does go to T1. T1 overall has incredible siege. They can either go for a lot of side laning pressure, as you pointed out. Zayus is getting into a slowly better and better position. Now has a level lead on Kana as well. And Kana a huge really. Yes, lead. Yeah. I, I, we saw that Kana. Even though he was able to get that solo kill, as again, this matchup very Cassante uh, favored early on, you need to then also turn it into team fight prowess, and that's where Kana kind of faltered, unable to uh, get some plays done. He got targeted down in mid, maybe feeling like he was a little bit too tanky, and now as a result, T1 have a lot more control on the map. They don't have to retake into account nearly as many turrets, their outers are still standing as well. And until D Plus pick up that standing gold, they will still remain behind, and with the dragon spawning in about two minutes, I think we're going to see some second item spikes comes, uh, come through as well. Perhaps Guma will even be able to finish his Lord Dominix, which is going to be incredibly valuable into Cassante and Sejuani. And one of the issues that I think D Plus has started to run into here that we're seeing is that their composition, unlike the previous game, we have a Talia who actually is a mid range threat and a great uh, deterrent. It's all short range. So, as long as T1 tracks where the Sejuani is, that is the engage. Obviously, Showmaker can like dive in with a Yumi and you can do some heroics there. But generally, what you're going to rely on is Canyon starts the fight, and then, as long as you keep track of where Canyon is, like T1's turn is amazing. So we saw very well in the previous Dragon fight that they saw where Canyon was, absorbed the blow. And then their re-engage with Wave, with Azir, oh, yeah. with Vi is incredible. So for D+, it is actually going to be very tough, I think, for them to find a great teamfight angle. If they do, if Kana gets a flank and smashes Faker or Guma into the rest of the team, right, or isolates them from the fight. If Canyon does hit an ultimate and Faker or Carry are not really ready to try and zone and protect, then that can buy Death the space that he needs. Close to Infinity Edge as well, but I don't Barry. know should be able to get it before the Drake is done, but I don't know if he'll be able to get it and then get back to base in time for setup around this Mountain Drake. And at this point, with the damage that's available for both these teams, they can also just do that. So you also can't index too heavily on a Mountain Drake, yeah. because then you, you lose Nash, and that's very bad. That's that is it's something that T1 will definitely take. If there's an opportunity to oh, go yeah. to a Baron, they will take it. Hey, even if there's no opportunity, they will try and take it. Yeah, Deft with not quite enough money to finish off that Infinity Edge just yet. Needs a couple of hundred gold. Ooh, that's big. Before he gets there. And, and with hey. 20 seconds to go, I don't think the Infinity Edge is going to be online. Lord Doms is there for Guma. That's a big spike. Black Cleaver as well. Rage and Virtue done for Owner. Yeah, and also massive amounts of mid control. They have the inner taken at the same time. And so D plus Kia need to stay very close to their base. It's really hard to get out and try and defend this. So instead, they're going to give it up. They didn't get to those item spikes that we were talking about. And therefore, this Drake does not belong to them. So soul point, mountain soul point for T1. And the statistical advantage that comes with this, uh, this mountain Drake as well, that they picked up their second one of the game. Almost 20% extra MR. 
and armor that you're gonna have here is so big because if there are no mountain drakes in the game, the damage from champions like Asante and Sejuani remains pretty relevant until like a later stage in the game, right? Where they actually have great base damage, obviously Cassante scaling off of uh, MR and uh, armor as well. Yeah. But if you're playing into a Mountain Drake, then the only damage that's going to be relevant is Showmaker and Deft. Deft, even though he has his IE, isn't anywhere near being able to build any form of armor penetration if that, if that is the direction that he does want to go into. Showmaker also going Void second here to try and counteract the amount of resistances available for T1, but it also makes DK plus their, I think, preferred way of fighting, which is isolate target, blow them up, and then buy space. Oh, the harder is owner. Yeah, they're going to have to flash out. Ooh. Just didn't quite know the amount of bad guys in that area. Death is going to be able to lock down this red buff. So no flash to worry about here on the Vi, but that is the full extent of the good news for D plus here. They are still trying to figure out how to win this game. Because so far, T1 have dictated the pace for the last 15 minutes or so. What it feels like. Oh, Canyon getting into this Baron pit. A Baron would certainly be a great way to win the game. And they're going to start it off. Okay, Ona in the area as we spoke, and spoke about. They're going to try and get the teleport out from Zayas. He's hit level 16 on this Jax. He's absolutely huge, and T1 know exactly what's going on. No teleport to come forward just yet. D plus, they can tank this for an extraordinarily long time as the teleport is going to come forward. Zayas diving into the pit. The Glacial Prison goes completely wide and Faker is traded for Canyon. The Baron secured by the Vi as they dive on top of this area and take her out. Showmaker, the next target to be taken down and he's not going to be able to do anything here. Kasante falls, it's an ace and T1 destroy D plus Kia. And this time around, D Plus don't find the turn. Canyon's ultimate doesn't hit anyone. And I was with you, Atlas. Them getting the teleport in of itself was a win. But D Plus, I think maybe also recognizing that you gotta try and force T1 to make a mistake. Try and go for it anyway. Unable to do so. And game might not be over yet, but this is a lead of a different caliber than I think that we've seen thus far. Gonna be the inhibitor down, gonna be another inner here for T1. And... Let's have a look at it again. As D plus Kia, they did have control of the pit. Maybe this is the time where you turn off the Baron. It really is. You see the amount of damage that Kimi Yushi is able to do, right? Ultimate hits no one, and with Vi still alive, the turn here from T1 is so well done, right? Owner goes in for the ultimate, and immediately Guma dashes back in. Really well played here by the Lucian, recognizing the amount of space that he has available. Because yeah. a lot of the cooldowns were already gone, a lot of the damage from D+, plus immediately taken out of the fight. And it makes the previous seesawing look a little silly. <laughs> well, yeah, this, uh, this gold lead is a very real one. And on top of that, this is T1 that now get to use this Baron to perfectly set up for Mountain Soul. Yeah. They already have most of the base of D plus Kia completely destroyed, so now the oppressive vision comes in. Hey, Atlas, you know what that means? What does it mean? Free games. I know. It's exactly what we wanted. And thankfully... I don't, I don't, I don't know why we're whispering. We will... Well, it's, it's, this is reverence. It's reverence. Reverence for the and best And whenever there's a lot of reverence, whispering must occur. That is how it works. Okay. okay. Yeah. Thank you. I wasn't sure. Extendo Beam unable to steal away the Grom. Is Canyon going to have to get out of there? This is... Yeah. D plus Kia, well and truly on the ropes. Still, they have the, the ability to win team fights. That Infinity Edge that we were talking about is done. But no GA. None of these defensive tools that Def will require as this game goes on. And already kind of taking so much damage on this Cassante. T1 looking to break open their next inhibitor in line, and this is the textbook way of winning the game. Just break down all the structures as Canyon dives on forward, looks for Zayas, but immediately he gets out of the CC. Now he just turns the battle onto the Sejuani. Def going golden. I don't know whether it's going to be enough. Empty's revive doesn't do anything at all here as the Akali makes their way into the back line. Def 
hiding back and does so beautifully. Gumiushi is now dead as Faker is fighting against Kana. Kana picks it up, finds the Q as well. As Zayas is in trouble, Showmaker backflipping on top of the Jax. And Carrier is just left to the Wolves. T-Plus Kia, they do what I was just saying was impossible. And now they're also going to deny the soul of T1. T1 won't be able. Surely it's just a single Drake, but these are the type of moments you can't afford against a team of T-Plus as caliber as the amount of stop watching going in this fight. Oh, yeah. Absolutely beautiful, right? Canyon gets taken low. And then we do see they're trying to set up here for death, but as a result, both Showmaker and Kana get into the background. The chaos that is created here is huge. Yuma, sure, you pick up the Sejuani, but it is never worth it if it takes your life as Deft is able to kite back successfully there. And then without the Lucian gone, so much of the damage no longer available here for T1. And they're still in a great spot. They're still two inhibitors down. But it is showing you that, yeah. The you know the polar, the, the cornered polar bear is the most dangerous <laughs> of all, and I don't even know what happens when you add Nopaka to the equation. As the oh, Muskia, that's a up easily. that's a menagerie that uh, <laughs> that should not be spoken about. I don't think um, it is. It's too mystical. You really can't go there. G8 now completed for Deft. One of the reasons why that fight was so good was a flash was up for Zeri. Definitely a very important thing. But B. The stopwatch to deny cease and desist was just so well done from Deft. He won't have the stopwatch in order to make that one happen, but you have to kill him twice now in these team fights. As still, remember, like, yes, D plus gear, they got a Drake. It's like whoop de doo. Your base is still, oh, yeah, they're still completely destroyed. You're still in shambles. You're feeling a little better, and you see a possible avenue, but T1 also is a very smart team, so they will probably recognize this and say, well, we have complete map control. We have two inhibitors down, so we can just go for Baron. There was no reason whatsoever for them to take any big risks. Death now also finished his GA. We do see Showmaker finishing the stopwatch as well. Elixir of Iron available for Kenny. I think he just hit yeah. that as overall. Plus trying to hold on. Yeah, Kenny was trying to find some sort of angle as, yeah, with the Mikhail's available here for Carrier, you saw already that that engage that you were talking about, the Glacial Prison that has been so important, can just be mitigated from whichever target it connects on. Yumiushi standing forward, does need to be a bit careful, but isn't too worried as long as Carrier is around. Glacial Prison will connect there, Arizona. Going to be able to walk out of it just fine. No Mikhail's necessary, but heal was used from the Nami, and now the Baron is what everyone's worried about. Scanning, gonna get spotted out, him alongside Deft are ah, there as this Baron's getting taken down I'm so quickly. They have to get in there. Kamushi taken down relatively low. Canyon doesn't have ult though. It's T1, they're going to teleport in. Showmaker finding himself some sort of flank, doesn't get the back backflip shuriken. Onto the Jax is now. Oh my God. Kia gets some control of this pit. Canyon is going extraordinarily in. low though. And Showmaker also sitting at half health, does make it towards the Shroud, it's Kana. It's a big knockback, the Empress Divide this time is definitely a lot better. Deft is at full health though, can he manage to get the kill? Counter Strike is just too good, Deft trying to stay alive. The GA is going to put him down and he's not going to want to wake up at exactly that area. Kellen goes down as well, T1, yet another team fight and this one means the game. And we are going to a game number three, Atlas, as with that attempt from Cassante to try and salvage the fight, it looks close, but T1, decisive victory there. Love them peeling off the Baron at the end there as well, identifying yeah. that, hey, we, we already got the teleport, that's a win. And D plus Kia also very aware of the pretty terrible situation that they're in. Try and flip a fight around the Baron. And knowing the implications as well. Oh, knowing they, the they implications, do, obviously. Because T1, none of the pressure was on them. Don't force any flips. Don't force the 50-50s. Just let them I, desperately try to take back the game and then take them while uh, they're distracted by doing that. Because, Beautifully done. Because with the teleport down and two inhibitors down, 
T1 is getting that Baron if you peel off of it now, right? Like, they can just yeah. then park Zeus in the side lane, Kana does an FTP, and you're gonna lose it anyway, so it's a desperation call from D+. Nice attempt, but it's the setup and the restraint from T1 that gets them the win in the very end, and oh, I can't wait for game number three. And we're likely to have oh. a uh, side switch as well, of course. Both of these teams playing the majority of their games on the blue side. T1 will play their second on red, and for D-plus Kia, it will be their fourth now. So we'll have to see how things are going to change as we uh, move to separate sides of the rift. I have a feeling probably not going to be too much uh, too much difference. I think it'll still be extremely close as Faker does the most damage in the game. Deft managing to get a fair bit, of, fair bit done towards the end there. And you can see this time D uh, T1 held on to their lead from about 17 minutes, right? This was definitely a lot more control held on their side of the map, and they didn't relinquish it until maybe that slight hiccup around that team fight, but it didn't really matter. Yeah, and that is also one of the points where generally can just end the game right there. Took a bit of a risk, didn't work out, but the game stayed still good enough that they were able to cash in on the leads that they had gotten, the explosiveness of T1 versus the resilience of D+. What a series thus far, Atlas. Absolutely incredible. We are going to go to a short break when we get back. The space and the deciding game three. あ、ちょっと待って。あ、ちょっと待って。あ、ちょっと待って。あ、ちょっと待って。あ、ちょっと待って。あ、ちょっと待って。あ、ちょっと待って。あ、ちょっと待って。あ、ちょっと待って。あ
되지 않아? 협곡에 무슨 일이 벌어질지 이제 다시 너만의 전설을 써봐. 我们的Space，A.K.A.The.Space。我是Valdez，我是Wolf，and.T.One，able to tie things up here in this epic I think the biggest difference in this draft was that they opted into the Azir early here with Akali up and the Jax coming through for the side lane, which is something that you and I have mixed opinions on. I think overall the early laning phase went very badly for Zayas, but what he was able to do in the side lane later on in the game really hurt D plus Kia's ability to set up. And I think Canyon's approach to the Fed Zeri and how to win the game might have been a little bit off here in this game as he was constantly chasing the Lucian around the map in the three part of the 1-3-1 rather than trying to shadow his Akali. Could have tried to kill Faker in a side lane and push, get pressure out. Those two inner turrets, or outer turrets rather, were up for so long around the map. D plus Kia never really taking them down, never having side lane threat, never shutting down the jacks, and also never being able to set up a proper 5v5 team fate. With a Zeri that was so fed, had Infinity Edge, yeah. but it just didn't matter. That's really the issue. They can never find a good team fight for themselves, but it started off really good for D+, because you'll remember, first of all, we did have uh, the top kill, eventually, which did come through onto this one. We also did have uh, the solo kill. I believe this is from... Yeah, this is the uh, knock-up here initially to stop him from getting over the wall, but... Uh, 
Yeah, the, the big moment here is the Zeri kill where, or the Zeri setup here, where Adept is given so much value here by Canyon's Engage. And I think T1 feeling like they had the smite secure, a little bit greedy on how long they stay here. Emperor's Divide, not enough to actually turn this around. The Faker greeds actually for the kill, doesn't get it here. Gives Deft a third kill. So early on in the game, triple for the Zeri. I'll go ahead and stamp it and certify it. <laughs> Five and one in yeah. the mid game on the Zeri but never could set up team fights because the Jax was always a problem, always a threat. They couldn't force TPs, they never shut him down. An uncharacteristically weak macro game, I think, from D plus Kia, where communication was on, let's pick the Lucian rather than dealing with the side lanes, and they just fell apart very quickly. Yeah, I think there were ways to get Kana into team fights and force team fights. They kind of just gave everything over to T1 because even though the Zeri got ahead, um, it didn't feel like they were very confident to take team fights in the mid game anyway. Even after she got her IE, they were like, nah, we'll just let them get two, three Mountain Drakes eventually in the Mountain Soul. Uh, let's take a look at highlight number two, which was this Baron fight that T1 was able to take down. Yeah, this is a really, really great fight here, but the problems with how this composition works for the side of T1 are all kind of alleviated here in this fight where instantly DPSs are gone, Showmaker tries to get in the backline, is unsuccessful, and the value of a Cassante this late in the fight is just negligible, really. He needs to, he needs more damage behind him, and we saw the pickoff instantly of both carries there on the side of D plus Kia. Just can't win that fight anymore. T1, amazing at setting up on objectives, forcing D plus Kia to come to them, using a side lane champion like Jax to, to force that sort of reaction. I think it's something that D plus Kia should look like, or should look towards here in this third game where they did choose blue side. So maybe a red side counter pick, maybe a red side side lane champion could be what they should ban to prevent T1 from having that same win condition. Yeah, it definitely could happen. I think uh, D plus, you know, in that moment, they were saying it on the cast, you know, you got the teleport. This relieves a lot of pressure. How about you back away and reset yourself? But as you mentioned in the replay, it's like, well, Showmaker died and also Def died. So you don't have any damage. So you just got yourself in a really weak position. T1 played it out very well in the team fight. Like Faker essentially sacrificed himself to like split everybody up and kill Canyon right away, which was kind of interesting because T1 lost a lot of damage, but then Gumo was just able to clean up so easily yeah. because of that play. And both of these picks that were pretty unusual for Zayas we saw in game one and two, this is a lane I didn't think we'd be seeing the unusual kind of Joker type picks, right? I thought it was gonna be the mid lane, but he gets the Jax blind in the previous set. Uh, he gets the Yone blind as well into the Gnar, of course, in that case, not as blind, but was punished. He hasn't laned well, but some of his mid-game fights and some of those late-game scenarios where he's setting up for these turns have been quite impactful. Even his failed Yone ult that didn't prevent the smite steal was actually, in theory, really smart and good. And I think T1 putting a lot of trust in him, and when they will be on red side for this third game, he'll actually have counter pick in that R5 spot. So very terrifying right now for D plus Kia fans, I think, with this draft choice. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see, you know, I was saying to you when we saw that, you know, maybe they just want to play the Lucian, but T1 might not let them, and it'll make it interesting in the bot lane as well. But guys, let's take a look at the POG here for game number two. It will be owner on the bot. This was a really hard vote for me. I actually was kind of bouncing around all players. I think Guma did a ton of damage, but had a pretty shaky laning phase um, and was ganked multiple times. We also saw Karia with some really amazing ults in this game. The mid game is where Owner really came online, where he was punishing some of the overextensions here for D plus Kia, and I think that's probably why he picks up most of the votes. I, surprisingly, to most people here, probably, uh, is, I voted for Jax. I actually thought Zayas had some really good side laning, and after a really rocky start to the game, did very well, and also locked down Deft in that critical moment in the final team fight with his counter strike to make sure that the Zeri is dead, because I think the fight looks very different if that does not happen. I don't know if we'll get a replay of it or not. We will not, but. Yeah. yeah. Kind of all over the place. As you mentioned, it's it's pretty hard to tell. I was saying, you know, maybe Faker, he had some big moments in team fights and stuff like that, but uh, Owner really clawed back the lead for T1 and allowed them to get a lot of those drakes in the mid game. So makes a lot of sense as well after seeing a lot of those replays. But guys, we are done here on the space. Let's go back to the casters for the game number three. Thank you so much, gentlemen, for that breakdown, and I very much enjoyed uh, Wolf and Jonah Strong shaking hands on their Zayas vote uh, towards that top side of the map. I think uh, almost yeah. everyone on T1 was uh, worthy of a vote in that one because, honestly, it felt like they out-team fought uh, their way to a victory. I actually, especially seeing the replays, uh, would have uh, loved 
to be in the owner team, especially after what was a very shaky game number one for him. Yeah. But I am experiencing this series from a very, uh, <laughs> very exhausting and <laughs> intense point of view. So I'm going to give myself a, a break there as really, really liked the Jack shoutout as well. Actually agree there. Yeah. Zeus in that final team fight, one team won the game. Absolutely pivotal, even though his early laning phase and some of his mid game, not necessarily the greatest as Gonna have some switch ups this time around Ooh, in yeah. the draft here, Atlas. As maybe this time we will see Deft get access to the Lucian Nami. No, no, we will not. Very quickly getting that off the board, and would not be surprised if we continue seeing more and more of these bot lane dives because, or uh, bans rather, because we literally have Guman Carrier healing. Like level one to not lose control over the wave, so that they can maintain, like so they can get level two yeah. first, and then we have on the other end, uh, Kalin and Deft fighting similarly hard. So overall, bot lane is the most important lane in the series thus far, and with the bans right now, that is definitely continuing. 100%. I'm wondering whether the Elise will get through this time around. Of course, uh, D plus gear have been banning it every time. That is Galio to be banned away here. A very interesting one. As T1 now, do they leave up Yumi? Do they leave up Zeri? Do they leave up Ryze? Maokai? So many things The D plus gear can lock up as their first pick. The Yumi going to be banned away. I really like this. Such a comfortable first pick with Siva and uh, Zeri both available. Now, D plus gear, will it be the Maokai? Will it be the Sejuani first pick that they could go towards? Leave that bottom lane up in the air. As right. far as bot lane champions, I mean, the Zeri does kind of stand out, but I don't know whether you want to priority pick it. You got it to rise. You yeah, there it is. Can't give it to T1. The capabilities in terms of macro are simply too much. Let's uh, cast our minds back to 2022 spring as yeah, he has not been allowed to get that champion Whoa. for a long time. And Zeus has had a varying performance, not necessarily a performance that I'd say is, uh, is abysmal, but definitely he has set the standard very high for himself. And a game on Jace might be just what he needs in that regard. Also, going to already make the life of Diplaskia kind of awkward. If you are playing a Zeri rise composition into a Jace, if T1 pick themselves up a little bit more poke, a little bit more range here, then you are going to be exceptionally hard reliant on finding any form of hard engage in the second rotation of your draft. Because if you don't, and T1 pick up an Azir or an Ezreal or anything that can kind of fight this from range, then you're going to be in deep trouble. You definitely are. Uh, T1, if they want to get a priority pick bottom laner, they will need to do it right now. Otherwise, something like a Silas stock is very high. Cassidy also, and Faker will lock it away. Flashbacks here to a uh, dumb one Kia versus T1 final, where that Cassidy was on the other side of the rift. This time, Faker able to potentially get some revenge for that series. But I digress. That means they do not lock away the bottom lane champion of preference. And I think things like Sivir and Draven to now be taken away. Force Gumiushi on something like an Ezreal here, you could imagine. Um, I think banning Karma could also be a very I was, good idea. Yeah, I was going to say that. Karma, to me, still has a lot of value. The Lulu, in terms of enabling the Zeri, very strong, but can run into troubles. Heimerdinger is another support that hasn't really been prioritized, and obviously it's T1, so maybe you don't want to go in that direction because Karia will. Can and will play anything that he can get his hands on. For T1 thus far, though, barring any crazy carry as support Sejuani swaps, which I feel like at this point I just have to call out because it's it's T1 and they are very happy to pull these kind of tricks. Yeah. I really like the top side. I do think that obviously the Castellan is going to need a fair amount of time, but you have double enabling for your permafrost as it is indeed the Ezreal kind of the no-brainer in this scenario that does get taken away and I would have thought Draven's a little bit more dangerous. Well it's it's Guma, especially. Yeah, so, that's ooh. I mean there's a couple of options. He was hovering the Kaiser, but I mean I think I think Draven is just so obvious here. I think kind of a blunder for D plus here in this draft. They must know that this is coming, right? It's Guma. Yeah. This is 
one of his most iconic champions, even though he doesn't get to play it as much. And talking about iconic champions, we are really digging deep here with a complete switch up in the drafts, right? Every, well not every, but almost every single LCK draft thus far has been, we secure bot lane and we secure jungle. Now, a incredible amount of priority on solo lanes. Oh, one oh, oh, oh. Rise priority from Remember, T plus. this is also one of Kana's favorites. From when he was on T1 back in the day, his uh, Graves top was uh, one of his personal favorites. Of course, we're expecting it to go to Canyon uh, as his Graves uh, won a world champion. And what are we going to see here together with... Oh. <laughs> This would be very different. And that's an Orn locked in for D plus Kia. The Twitch support, is it happening? Is this T1 saying I'm not no? gonna. I'm not going to get excited before we see the lock-in. So the, T, uh, the D plus composition has a ton of priority in the mid lane, and they're going to need that to get Canyon What? Ass. OK, it's time for Karyas Kalista support. He has been playing <laughs> this. He has been looking for an opportunity to pull it out. Oh my. There in this series, really? Yeah. He pulled out Caitlyn's support before. He did. He's he doing definitely it. did. As, uh, OK, Karyas support Draven. Um, Karyas support Kalista. Not entirely sure which one it's going to be. Wait. Who? No. No, it's going to be it's, Karyas. It's got it's to be, it's gotta be the Kalista support. As Let's talk about the D-plus comp first, because they make a lot of sense. It's very straightforward. You have a ton of prio in mid. You can then turn that into side lane pressure, or you leave it on island, and you can either get your Graves or your bot lane ahead, depending on the state. That well ahead is not going to happen, because they're, they're facing Kalista Draven. So um, you're going to have to cover. Showmaker and Kenyon are going to both try and uh, make sure that they keep a priority in their own lanes, slash jungle, and then cover for the bot lane, which should be a complete brawl. I don't know what type of brawl. Yeah. I, I, I don't think it'll be very good for Zarya and Lulu. I don't think so here. either. I think, like, we've seen what happens when T1 picks 280 carries in the bottom lane. And uh, it's not as great for the opposition. This time, they don't horrendously outrange their opposition, right? It's not the same um, as what we saw with, what was it, Barris, Caitlyn? In that bottom lane, uh, in the last time that we saw it employed, you know, Varus Ash is, of course, the most popular. This, a slightly more eclectic version. Um, as Canyon is at least on a backup carry this time around, but it's Faker's Cassidy, it's Gumiushi's Draven, and it's Carrier's Callista support. Plus, it's Zeus's Jace. Oh my goodness. Let's get onto the rip and see what this is like. T1 yelling at the top of their lungs as we hop on to the rift for game number three. Lol Park, really, it's it's still echoing with those fan chants as I just... You never really hear volume like that unless it's T1 playing. As Gumiushi, his Draven, this time going to be throwing chainsaws. It's a little bit frightening. You know what I want to talk about, Atlas. What do you want to talk? You want to talk about the Callista. All right. No, I was I was talking about an Maybe anime I've been watching that involves chainsaws, but I'll let it go. As we, uh -huh. get, we have to talk about the Callista. I feel like you should have known. I, I've really been bugging you about that one for a while now. You have, but as, I, I just I try to put it out of my mind to the best of my wow. ability. Wow. I just want you to have a good time. As uh, Obviously, as we have seen before with uh, <laughs> what T1 was able to do with the Caitlyn support, the idea behind this is that the dueling potential of the Draven and the Callista makes it basically impossible for Kalin and Deft to walk up. So Owner is going to path from the top side of the map towards the bot side, and then hopefully for him uh, be able to cover what, uh, or rather, Canyon is going to look to cover as Owner is going to path towards bot side to try and look for aggressive plays on Deft and Kalin. Well, Carrier just diving towards Kellen here as the axes are now going to start swinging forward. And yeah, this is an example of a real problematic situation. Oh, the Draven's not able to do it. Canyon, he knew he was there. Gumushi knew he was dead, wanted to take Deft with him, and he's not going to be so lucky. So what happens, Chronicler, when this lane falls behind? Well, they're, they're, 
what do you mean? I'm confused. You yeah. Have, you have Draven and Callista. Oh, so yeah. the same thing continues to happen? So you don't fall behind. Oh. Yeah. Okay. But what if... Well, what if you do and your wave state is, is very rough? Um, at least Carrier gets the crash here, which is really... Really, kind of a saving grace. Death gets the kill, but is still stuck on level one and does have to back as well. So we're going to give it a little bit of time and then check back in. And Canyon obviously did have to take a lot of a beating in terms of his jungle experience. Although with the prior that he has in mid, he actually will be able to... Yes, his yeah. win rate on the champion is absurd. The reason why he hasn't played more games on it is just because when Graves was meta, Canyon didn't really get to play He wasn't it. allowed to, yeah. And another great example here for Gumi Straven, but I just love the read from Kenyon there. Like, obviously, as ooh, owner does spot him out, very important there. So Faker would not be able to help his jungler at all. Um, identifying that this bot lane is going to look for early plays, Kenyon just immediately going, similar, uh, similar to what we saw Bo do, very early level two gank on Graves, and yeah, you're just... Gonna get bullied out of your jungle now because Gumayushi and Karia not in the position that ideally you'd want to be in at this point in the game. Now, fortunately for T1, uh, as much as I think oh. the bot lane situation stings, it's not all disaster because you do have an incredibly resilient mid laner, or resilient in terms of scaling and, and winning you the game later on. But I gotta say, pretty much a dream scenario here. Can you literally just take Dread buff and run down ball? Yeah, and you can see Gumyushi pretty happy to stack up these axes and make this happen, but seeing Canyon yeah. there, he was like not going to be able to do it, and I believe that was the heal right at the last second from Deft to make that one happen. Yeah. Still, going to have a lot of power in this lane, and as you can see, Gumyushi and Carrier are continuing to push up, especially with Canyon now on the top side of the map. He's getting as much farm as he can, and Canyon will have more farm than Ona throughout this game, um, eventually because we know what happens when he gets this champion. He does not stop destroying jungle camps forever. He is very, very adept at it. The big winner oh, no. on the map for T1 is Zeus, because with Canyon's positioning being known, he really gets to play very, very far forward. And for Kana, you know, there's not that much that he can do. He by all accounts, should not be receiving a ton of help from this jungle. His main goal is just make sure that you bleed as little as possible so that the rest of the map can be covered. Well, obviously, Kenyon already did a great job of that, which in turn is going to make Ana's job a lot easier. And Showmaker, another example, is going to be able to continuously play with Cryo here as owner and make himself known. Yeah. Not going to get the flash out of Showmaker just yet. Faker, no Rift Walk available. Permafrost does come in. Showmaker desperately doesn't want to flash, and he doesn't. He's going to be able to go back home. But now, that health bar, very low, doesn't have teleport. So was it worth it, I guess, is kind of the question that he's going to be asking. As here, towards this bottom side, Glitter Lancers flying forward. Deft trying his very best, and is actually ahead in CS at this moment in time. Owner's coming down, though, and you can see the pressure starting to mount. Canyon already lying in wait. It's a great little whimsy on to Gumiushi, who goes down yet again. Owner now trying to tidy it up, but I don't know whether it's going to be enough. It's the flash forward from Deft. Wait. He is going to go down, and now Faker, with Rift Walk in hand, he sees that blue buff, and he really wants it. He'll pick it up as well, make it a triple kill for the king of the mid lane. T1, that is exactly what they needed. And you get the punish on Draven as a D plus Kia, but I'm gonna tell you, it comes with a costly price. And it's not a price that I think you're gonna be very happy to pay because killing Guma is amazing, right? You deny him the stacks, you put this Draven, uh, Draven further behind, and by him not being able to farm up and then maybe get a mid-game cash in, you are certain that this Draven is gonna have a really tough game as, as we continue, right? Especially into champions like the Graves, like Kana on this Orn. But Faker picking up a triple there changes so much. It accelerates his Rod of Ages. It yeah. allows him to play with so much more aggression in this mid lane as well. Allows him to actually trade with Showmaker. And... Oh boy. 
I can't wait to see what this game has in store. I'm just like, I'm getting giddy. Oh, it's uh, it's definitely going to show us some more than this. That is absolutely true. And I'm looking forward to seeing exactly what that is going to be. We have to remember, what was it, 26 minutes on uh, the Rod of Ages level 10 for Fiesta? I have a feeling that that, or, and the level 16 uh, and be picked up. The big thing here is that Showmaker, just off of a base, uh, walks back towards mid lane, right? So he's either unable or unaware, uh, can't follow. Faker flashing over the initial wall as well to ensure that he can actually get the damage off from his initial rift walk. Then takes down Canyon, and if Ryze is able to join this fight, then maybe you can get the shutdown. You can definitely take down Carry at the very least. But not going to be the case. Showmaker also didn't have the teleport available. Also, some credits over to Owner there earlier on, right? Because because of the gang that he got off on mid, that was what put Showmaker in a more awkward position, which freed up Faker and. Oh, well, bit of a battle here towards the bottom side as the ult through from the Zeri does get knocked up. As now Gumiushi is just fighting him. Can he actually win it? Oh! Gumiushi locks it down. It's a double kill, and this is what we expected to be the entire lane for T1. It just happened a bit late. Sitting on double Serrated Dirk, a power spike that unfortunately, a lot of people are not gonna be able to contest with Kenyon looking for a cross map desperately, but not gonna get anything. Zayas not going to get caught this time around. Owner also in the general vicinity. And things are starting to look very dire here for D plus Kia, because the power of an all-in, uh, from an all-in of this lane, is still immeasurable, right? They both think six, Kellen doesn't have the Wild Grove available, and they immediately, fully pull the trigger. Kellen can't support oh. Deft. The as flash result, from Gumiyushi as yeah. well, to avoid the Q, get off the Whirling Death, oh my goodness. And... It doesn't mean that all of a sudden Draven is fully back in the game, but the beauty of the composition that T1 has is Draven doesn't really need to be, right? And if he gets one or two more kills, he farms some stacks, then you're still fine, but Guma can play supportive Draven for all he cares in this game because you have a Jace, who is getting very far ahead on the top side of the map, unmatched, the tier starting to stack now as well, and you have perhaps the most iconic late-game champion in the game in Kassadin, uh, who is very, very accelerated in this game. And D plus Kia have a ton of scaling themselves as well. They have the ornaments. They have Zeri with a Lulu on top of it. Rise is in a great state at the moment. Can hard carry late game team fights. Canyon is on the graves, a force to be reckoned with. But right now you can sense that D plus Kia is flustered. No one is answering this bot side of the map, right? Gumayushi is just freely farming. T1 is answering. And sure, you might get some plates, but not getting a lot more out of this. Oh, and even the Whirling Death coming through to clear out the minions. Yeah, um, that is not going to be it. They did want to drop the Rift Herald, you could imagine, but T1 were ready yeah. and waiting. Weren't going to get enough value off that one. Two plates being picked up, so that Rift Herald nullified in its entirety. Cannon does get there towards the uh, Cannon minion, so that is definitely good news for him. And you were talking about scaling, like the quintessential scaling champion. Defensively, that's on. So D yes. plus Kia do have some scaling, but like when it when when it's in comparison to a Cassidy, it just doesn't What's well, really uh, hold water. It's not just Cassidy; it's Cassidy who got so far. I don't know uh, so far accelerate. I don't know when he's going to actually hit his Rod of Ages slash uh, slash Zeref spike. But even if he's not level 16, like at that point, still going to be a force to be reckoned with. Also, on a highlight again, Caria, the Umbral Glaive is such an impressive item when you have a lane like the one that T1 has here in bot lane because Deft and Carrier, or Kellen rather, can't contest the wave, right? So you have to give way, and then you also are unable to contest any of the vision because Carrier with this Umbral Glaive is going to deny so much of what you're going to be able to see. And I want to remind everyone is hold up. Yep, Deft is going to skate in. Carrier taking so much damage, he's just dead. The Ornhorn was there just to celebrate. I think it was, yeah, I think that but, it was just a song that well, time around. Ooh, good TP here. I was about to say, uh, Kana is going to make his way towards the mid lane as well, so Faker is going to get at the very least a play, but this is a cannon wave, so hopefully Kana will be able to at least get a little bit here as, ooh, might be even a second play for Faker. Wave is going to get caught eventually as okay. Owner going to interrupt. And, and with the TP towards top side at the very least, Showmaker prevents Zayas from completely taking over, but even with this play working, it's still T1 that is favored, right? Because Showmaker was forced to teleport. 
Uh, Zayus still got a lot done. Faker still shoved the mid wave into the turret and was able to pick himself up a plate. So even with Carrier taken down, All doesn't right. end up mattering too much. As I want to remind everyone at home that Carrier is a trained professional and in no way, shape, or form <laughs> should you be playing support Kalista if you are not Carrier. Well, don't don't do it. Canyon thinking about a bit of a drive by, but Faker was in the area and you do not want to mess with that. That is going to be a solo infernal. Being taken Ocean Soul this game. And that could also be a worry because that sounds like regen for a mana bar of a Cassidy. Um, and that's right. But this was really nicely done. Yeah, very straightforward. Good rotation for Kana there. Ideally, I think you were looking for multiple people. And looks like overall, D plus still maintaining the fight. And it's not really about the goal at this point in time, right? Because as mentioned, as soon as Orn starts to hit the later levels, it's more going to be about who plays out and how they, or who plays out what, how they play it out as Guma picking themselves up the shield bow now. But... Oh, that was a bit sad. Yeah. I thought that cannon was possibly takeable. Does not happen. Still, just over a thousand gold the lead for T1. But this game has really gone to some strange territory with uh, where the really has and the triple kill onto this Cassidy. That's exactly what D plus Kia are terrified about, right? So, yeah, because ideally in this composition, if this is a say a Nautilus, for example, right? If you front to back team fight with an Orn, you can actually put Draven in an awkward position. If you have a good Orn ultimate, the Draven can get kind of targeted down. Maybe Showmaker can find a flank. Maybe Canyon can land a Q and. and blow him up before the fight as well, but truly really begun. But because of Kalista, it actually is really hard to take down Guma by like single-handedly targeting him. And that's not even talking about all the other issues that are available for T1. Their neutral, I think, is still pretty good because they have a cast or will have later rather a cast in the side lane. They have a decent poke with Zayas. They have hard engage if they are looking for it with the Sejuani. So then a lot is going to come down to how well D plus Kia is going to be able to set up the 5v5s because in a Split pushing situation, I just don't see them being a, uh, being able to match T1 as pressure around bot here. Yep, Ona going to turn up. Stendo Beam looking to clear out the wave as best as possible. Canyon's going to move in. Shield's a little bit late, but it looks like D plus Kira are going to be able to hold on to this one for now. Can't. As soon as Faker shows himself, I get a bit scared, you know? Because there is just no way that D plus Kira can handle this Cassidy right now. Four stacks now on the Rod of Ages. And look, like, the amount of acceleration is pretty evident in the fact that there's just a catalyst here on Showmaker. Meanwhile, Zayus has the most farm in the game. It's not, has not been involved in anything, FYI. Has yep. not been a part of this game, but he's loving it. Epitomizing is, top lane right he now. Is, uh, you know, 163 farm at 15 and a half minutes. Got his Eclipse, scaling nicely towards his, uh, his, his tier. He's just having a great time. Doesn't really need to join anyone else. And once he does, that's when I think a lot of the issues for D Plus are going to arrive because, again, they are going to have to be the one to pull the trigger. They are a shorter range composition. And if you don't do that correctly, you're going to get into some real issues and trying to keep Deft safe from Faker's threat now hit level 11. Going to be a toughie as well. Yeah, I think we might need to see that Wits End variation of the Seri like we saw yesterday. Um, which you quite enjoy, as Canyon will spot that Shirley is being taken. T1 not wanting to overpress on this one. Minion Wave on the top side being uh, taken down here by Faker, as pretty impatient. Shirley will finally turn herself towards D Plus here. Now, five members stacked up. Zayas, like you were talking about, those shock blasts. They connect onto Showmaker as Faker looking for that flank angle. Canyon going to be the target now. Glacial Prison does come in. The rest of the buttons not quite being hit. Good knock up onto Gumiushi, but it doesn't really matter as Faker diving on in. He's very, very low as Def gets over that wall. The shield bow helping him out. Now going to have to back away because these shock blasts, man, possible to deal with. So they get a Herald, but at what cost? Well, this out of turret teleport. might be the first one. Yeah, teleport to come in to keep this one alive. And yep, the Siege, like you were saying, Chronicle, it's just disgusting. Well, we haven't even talked about it, but while this is happening, there's also in 30 seconds a Drake 
That is going to be Soul Point spawning here at 4T1, right? And... Gotta say, Atlas, right now, 4D+, plus, we see the power that the composition does have in these fights, but you also see that if they meander for a little bit too long, if they hold off on actually pulling the trigger here, they will take a lot of poke. This time around, I don't think it's too bad, but Faker doesn't do that much yet, right? Like, Faker, there is level 11. If he's 16, Depth is just out of the fight, if not dead. Yep. Uh, add a Shock Blast or two to it, and everything becomes a possible target. And for D-plus, it might feel like you really have to fight this, but your Orn is not in a great space yet. Might be looking for a steal instead. Faker on the flank here. Yep, Zayas looking oh, no, to try and defend this turret. Yeah. And it looks like they'll be able to not defend the turret, but still take this dragon. So Soul Point now available for T1. Shirley gets her eye poked. That is going to be it. So wind conditions starting to come alive here for T1 in this Ocean Soul. And then the ensuing Elder will be what their eyes are going to be on. Should make a move back towards this top side and D plus here do need to start trying to open up this map. Taking turrets has been difficult from, honestly, like this game. Oh. Uh, sorry, the last game until now. They haven't been able to take these uh, standing objectives very well at all. Seraph's done now for Faker here. And already, like I said, obviously everyone's counting down until Faker hits level 16, but with this spike, especially once his Rod of Ages actually fully stacks up, he is going to already be very difficult to deal with. Oh yeah. And there is no exhaust available. There is of course a spellbook, so Kana can opt into that if he does see an opportunity, but there's a lot, a lot of damage here from T1, and that is something that I would be a little bit scared of. Anyone who mispositions on T1, barring Faker, or perhaps Owner, but even in his case it's a bit conditional, dies instantly. As we might get an example of that right here. Yeah. Still, he is going to uh, get polymorphed. Now Zayas, not looking too scared whatsoever. Oh, collapse. Of Kellen and Canyon. They're running. Yeah, the collapse is coming in. Deft walks towards a ward, does walk away from it. Immediately afterwards is Faker. Sounds like he's still in his Zonyas. Doesn't even have that built just yet, as it's a broken stopwatch. Is now Extendo Beam very defensively here from D plus Kia, and I'm still just not seeing where their way back in is. Well, it's someone on T1, or multiple people, getting caught by a big Orn ultimate, right? But as I mentioned, Zayus has been playing impeccable thus far. Had a couple of rough games, I think, throughout the season, but Jay's obviously his most iconic champion. And thus far, seems to be doing very well. And with Flash available, should generally be fine. And the same can be said, honestly, for for Faker, Owner, and, and even Karia. Kalista does have a lot of mobility, and the only member that is mobile is Kuma, but he has a Kalista ultimate, which yeah. is still something that I wasn't really... <laughs> I should have been prepared for, because again, Karia has been playing this as, ooh, maybe we'll catch Faker of Guard here with a Realm Warp. All right, well, Realm Warp is uh, at least on cooldown for a couple of seconds. He uses it to turn immediately onto Showmaker. It's with a broken stopwatch. Maybe this is an opportunity. The Wild Growth comes in, Deft chasing after him. Can Faker get away is the question. The answer is no. Deft picks up the kill as T1 will destroy their base in answer. And it is still an incredibly favorable trade because, crucially, D plus can't turn this into a Baron. If you get Faker there, and you see a Baron angle, then it might be worth it. But now, you kill Faker, you get a shutdown onto death. Sure, that's nice. But you also gave up the last remaining turrets that you had on the bottom half of the map. Yeah. Uh, you don't have your inner mid, you don't have an outer or an inner on, on bot lane. Zayus is going to have a monstrous back now as well, which means that any play that you'll have that doesn't immediately involve dealing with Jace is going to be a problem. It's really cute there from Showmaker trying to fake the Realm Warp so that Faker paths towards him and doesn't actually end up taking it because Death is already there. Uh, for Faker, yeah, not really a way out here. Doesn't really have to turn potential either. Ton of gold, 600 gold shutdown. Uh, or I'm not sure if it was 600, but at the very least, uh, 600 gold it going was. into the pockets of Deft right there. Yeah, so 300 gold shutdown. And now he goes back, wants to put together, could be. Is it pretty edge as the next and item? Is once again the aura of God um, for all to hear as Faker level 14 now because his rod of ages did come through. 
And there is still... This ward has survived for a really long time, by the way. A yep. lot of high value. Still a lot of value here in the one pick as Kana starts to level up more and more, but because he's been forced to group with his team because they desperately need to contest stuff. But yeah. by grouping with your team, uh, Kana's not getting any experience as a result. And that is really going to delay the uh, introduction of possible ornaments. And I I don't see a great way for you to... Nice, Every shock done. blast is terrifying, and I like that Jonah Strong is making sure that he puts the fear into us every time one of them flies forward. As they know. Continued ward value, as finally it will be discovered. Yeah, um, that's what we're talking about. And he doesn't even have Cerebral's done yet. Oh my goodness. Callan is just gonna... Can I have some money for it, please? Seven seconds on this Ocean Soul, though. Thank D you. plus Kia. How are they supposed to do anything about it, is kind of the question. Shock Blast soaked by Kana. Nice. And it looks like they might be able to group up to at least get up to halfway across the map. Shirelias. Yeah, okay. Death's going to chase after Carrier. They do get the flash out, as the pierce was unavailable. 400 stacks for Gumiyushi on this Draven. The Blue Blades, as Papa coined many moons ago. See whether the cash is going to happen. Faker on a beautiful flank, Canyon. Moving towards the Drake. Can they secure it is the question as Faker moves in. All right, here we go. The Ornhorn going to come through. It's going to get denied as now he tries to get back, but it's actually the Rend that locks down the Ocean Soul. But still, the Sichuan are going to go down low. But look at the Cassidy damage. It is absurd. And this game, ladies and gentlemen, I think is just over. It's going to be the Quadra kill. Or was it? I'm not entirely sure, but it doesn't matter. This game is over. T1 will take another 2-1 and claim the place as the only undefeated team here in the LCK. And I'm pretty sure that it was actually Karia's knockup that set up for the Faker knock there. Not the, the knock rend? Well, what the the knockup from throwing Guma into multiple people, oh if I'm not mistaken. Let's goodness. take a look at it here because uh, with the rent being set up here, Kenya can't quite go or try and go for the steal. Really nice cancel there from owner on Kana. And then here, it's actually looking winnable, right? Look at this. Oh, it actually a four is! Four man knock up from a Gumayushi face call from Carrier after he secures the Ocean Soul with a rend as support Kalista. I want to reiterate, this is. One of the best supports in the world. This is one of the best teams in the world. No, I think it is the don't best support in the world. It's definitely the best support in the world. <laughs> that is 100% what happened. Don't try play support <laughs> Kalista unless you are in these exact circumstances because I'm looking at this and it looks broken. Yeah, it you, looks you guys were worried when bonkers. the Shy was playing uh, top lane Kalista. Well, this, this is the next. No, I was, I was worried when he was playing top lane Italy, but this is worse. <laughs> oh my god, what an incredible. And, and look as well as. Right now, it's just everyone on T1 fighting on all cylinders, or firing on all cylinders, right? Because you see the big cast in them, Jeff Faker, by the way, level 15, isn't even 16 yet. There's yeah. just so it, much It gets worse. Here. It gets worse. That's all right. We'll see. Uh, Kana not at level 14 yet, so can't upgrade Death's shield, though, that he no, would really, really look like. At that experience bar. It's like 95%. I, d I don't think it matters, let me be very clear about that, because Deft is still sitting on only two items, and at this point, Ocean Soul in the hands of T1. Hard to see d come comeback from this one. Oh, absolutely. Uh, Faker just going to fight Canyon. Uh, of course, feeling pretty happy to do so, Force Pulse. Just to slow him down, this Baron, it's just uncontestable. There's just not a way to do anything about this. As Canyon's at least going to walk towards it, but he's just not going to get there in time. The Sichuani locks it down really nicely, and now the fight is on. Kana in so much trouble, tries to get himself out, does, at least for the moment. Can he get some knockups? The answer's yes, but does it matter? The answer's absolutely not. As Shock Blaster comes through, Canyon trying to dash his way out. Faker has about a trillion dashes available to himself. The Orn goes down first, is now Deft, trying to get damage where he can. But Jace has already managed to take down yet another target. Deft is just being forgotten as he pushes down this lane. T1, they are turning towards the one open avenue to a game victory. And you like to see it. Eyes on the prize as Kanye just chased all the way to his fountain. He may not even be able to do that. 
as now Deft is bearing down the wrong direction here towards T1, who are just taking all of his stuff. Oh, Showmaker just thrown into the blender. Speaking of which, Kumiyushi now under the turret. He's going to die, but so is Deft. And the game is now done. T1 will wrap it up two to one. This series really had it all. We had Baron flips. We had Faker pulling out the Cassidy and finally be allowed to play that again. We had support Kalista debut in what was a very possible preview, the most likely preview I might add, of the spring finals. Yeah. We had Guma Yushi's Draven. Oh, what an incredible series here. T1 still proving that it's not just the creativity, it's the creativity with the level of play that this team showcases on a daily basis. And also shows that they're not afraid to take any risk ever. We, we remember this game started with Gumayushi just running at depth. Canyon, great positioning to try and deny, and he wasn't able to get that early kill in trade. D plus Kia was set up for great things. And then Faker occurred. And that 3-0 Kassadin loomed over the heads of D plus Kia throughout the rest of that game until it broke their backs. That's what it felt like to me. Just extraordinary work and the movement, the control and the knowledge that Faker had sent back Showmaker. That was the moment that they could force a fight towards the bottom side that didn't even work in their favor until Faker found that angle. Yeah, it's a big old thumbs up. And uh, the GOAT is back and really did uh, earn his place this particular game. And yeah, there we go. <laughs> after, after what was, I, I do think, two very back and forth games, Knife's Edge, this to me was much more, no, we, we are better. We are better and we are going to dunk on you as the dark technology I mean, I think Fake support. is probably going to get POG, but my vote would be so far into the carrier column. I got you back. Thanks, thanks, brother. I don't, I don't, I don't think it'll be enough. But maybe we won't stand alone. I don't have a vote, but if I did, I would vote alongside you, Chronicler. And I think uh, Twitch chat would agree. That's what I'm assuming, because uh, Carrier just does the fun stuff. I don't think he won it when he had his uh, when he played his Caitlyn either. So I think he uh, he's due. He is definitely due a crazy pick POG vote. And also, he stole that Drake and got the four-man knock-up with the Fates Call, which I guess was pressed by Gumiyushi, but he had to press it first. So many things that happened in this series. Nice game to end on for Zeus as well. After oh, yeah. Was Just not necessarily a bad performance, but again, this, this guy made every single final in his debut year, was uh -huh. one of, if not the best top laner in the world throughout the entirety of Worlds, besides the final, obviously. And doing that as an 18-year-old is an incredible achievement in of itself, as this is where you might have gotten worried if you were a T1 fan, because this was beautiful pathing from Canyon, Really a great read of what the T1 bot lane was going to be looking to do, and Draven getting shut down early. But it didn't end there, and here this is, is this where is the game is. About. Yeah. Where, despite all this, T1 are aware that they're going to be up a member, so all they need to do is just extend this fight. And extended, they did. As Faker getting this up. triple really did feel like even if there was opportunities for D plus in a normal game state to kind of accelerate and scale into the late game. It was already tough after that triple, and this to me was when the game ended. Uh, this was where I no longer had any faith, and I want to again draw your attention Karen. to the shenanigans that are about to carry out first, picks up Ocean Soul, and then picks up Draven. Oh my god, three man knock up, and Faker perfectly synced with the rest of his team. Goes in, clean up crews there, and he finishes no, the fight at full health, 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 health as well. Yeah. Oh my goodness, it was just an absolute demolition from T1 as we listen. They finish off this game. Oh, 
Okay. Uh, to even come uh, from oh, yeah. uh, I'm down. Carry it, yelling to go bot lane that entire time. Okay. 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 Ignoring him entirely, but he wanted oh, to get nice that nice kill. Nice. Uh, it's a very happy Gumiushi <laughs> in the end. And uh, everyone just congratulating one another. You did a great job, great job, and they absolutely did. Faker, 23,000 damage on this Cassidy. Oh my goodness. What? Like, look at that drop. That is a silly drop, Chronicler. If, and it, if, it worked real well. Yeah, if you get that in solo queue, you're, you're looking at a dodge. You know, you're, you're eyeing, like, oh, have I ever already dodged today? <laughs> yeah, it's can like, I, can who, I take, has, can I... who has, like, heal cleanse? Who, who, like... Has, who hasn't dodged yet, guys? Come on. Who's, who's taking one for the team? Uh, and, and we joke, but it really showcases, again, the amazing mix of T1's creativity and mechanical skill, right? Because this is a team which, in their darkest days, when you go back to 2018, 2019, was unable to cope with the level of aggression, with some of the creativity coming, for example, from the LEC, right? Remember yeah. that Sonatara game that, uh, you know, we, we don't want to remember. Well, T1 reinvented themselves. And these are the results. Yep, they're, they're the ones doing the real crazy picks. And now we get to hear what the space has to say about that extraordinary series. Thanks, guys, for the wonderful cast for that awesome series. Definitely a doozy down to the wire, down to game three, where things did kind of explode down in the bottom lane very early on to kind of give T1 the massive victory. It's but uh, what did you think about this one, Wolf? Look, I mean, I had a tough week um, in terms of the games we had here at the LCK. I was promised three good games in the series. <laughs> and uh, game three, not a good game. It was mm. very, very one-sided. and. It was an exciting game in terms of the drafts. So let's let's start there, right? The Callista pick coming through here for support for Carrier was a very unusual choice, but it was one that I saw needs Zed to... there, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> okay, he's gone. Okay, scary, scary. I'm like, oh, I didn't ward. I didn't ward the graphic. Uh, I don't know. Um, so anyway, the Callista pick that comes through here for Carrier allows him to have an insane kill lane here. I did really like this uh, pick of the Graves and the level two shadowing. He's did down there to get that early kill. And that actually worried T1 fans into like, oh no, 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 this could actually be disastrous because they're falling behind early. Death's gonna carry on this area. It's gonna take a long time for Cast to come online in this rise lane. But when we go into highlight one, one critical play from the jungler saves the whole lane and, and actually opens the entire game up. Uh, yeah, it's crazy because like, you know, there were a lot of names named throughout this entire play, but Owner was really the one who got it all started, right? Yeah, like nobody perfect timing to gank the, the Cassidy lane. You yeah, know? nobody dies here, but Showmaker has to back. He doesn't have level That's six, he has to back. <laughs> doesn't flash, nobody dies. At the moment, it seemed really insignificant, right? Because, okay, he gets away at whatever, he has to back, it's no big deal. Doesn't have six, Faker hits six. Owner goes bottom side here. And what we see right afterwards is, Look at where Showmaker is on the map right now as Rise, completely back, doesn't have Teleport, doesn't have Realm Warp, can't come down here and assist in any way when this all-in happens. And Faker comes down here with level 6 and cleans up every single kill. Three kills go to the Kassadin, and after this moment, Showmaker can't even stand against him in lane. There's too much of a threat with the, uh, obviously the enemy Sejuani could roam around. Faker has so much damage at this point, picks up the early catalyst. His game state is extremely accelerated. And you have, yeah, slightly behind Draven Callista lane, but they, there are now so many threats. All the team fights you watch for Dom1, or rather D plus Kia, they're like, what, we have to deal with this uh, Draven that can be a Fate's Call, it can't be killed. This Kassadin that's unkillable. Jace, who's so far away, he's untouchable, he shock blasts our team. How can Zeri do anything? Depth's like, oh my god, this is impossible. Like, how can I play the game? Yeah, it was like he was in a, a starfighter, like trying to avoid all the bullets and stuff. It's kind of, uh, kind of crazy. Like, I thought there was a way with the draft that D Plus had that they could win this game for sure, like just on paper. But then also, even from behind, I thought like, maybe there would be a way, but T1 kind of put an end to it as we're gonna see in Highlight 2 as well. Uh, I think that D+, they waited. They didn't want to give over the Ocean Soul, so they had to go for this fight. But the Zeri was on three items, but no IE. And 
you know, starts off okay, but then they just kind of got Wombo comboed. It's just impossible to kill anyone here. You can't touch anybody. The damage is too high, and Guma could just decide at any moment in time to set up a Wombo combo for this Kassadin. Plus, he's already threatening as it is with the Lethality build. You have double Lethality. You have Vision Control because you have the Umbral Glaive that Karia picked up earlier that we were talking about, which is super common for AD supports right now. And well, they're like, at first we were like, okay, it's only Sina could do this. Okay, Ash could do this. Um, Caitlyn could do this. <laughs> oh, wait. Maybe Callista also. T1 are changing the meta right now. Yeah, they definitely are. I think that Karia is trying to unlock his creative brain. He's already mechanically so gifted. He is the best support in the world. I think that goes without saying, even though the guys on the cast were like, oh, I don't know, like, he's one of the best in Korea. No, he's the best in the world. Um, and he's pulling off all these crazy picks. So it's like, well, what can't this guy do? And now how are you gonna draft against T1? Because not only will they defeat you in a best of three against one of the best teams that we have here, they're also gonna just pick weird stuff that you cannot prepare for. Um, you know, I suppose maybe the Zeri has to get shelved, perhaps. Uh, <laughs> we're going to see some it, more yeah. safe bottom lanes. But. Uh, we're going to see a lot of changes, obviously, when 13.1b comes in. But there is, uh, this is now, you know, public information. We're going to have a whole of the week of this patch. So the end of this week, we're going to have the rest of the patch. And then next week, it's still going to be on 13.1. So even though I think some of these shakeups T1 has shown us, might be less relevant when we get to 13.1b. I think a lot of teams should be experimenting with this for the rest of this week and next week too, uh, because when the draft gets a little bit haywire, the Lucian's removed and you don't have the Zeri lane you want to play, there are, as T1 has showed us, a lot more options out. As Crowley pointed out on the cast, don't try this in your solo queue games, but uh, in terms of kill lanes you can set up, there's a lot more that uh, we haven't seen. I think T1 has even more on the tank. Yeah, uh, we do have a little bit of time, Wolf. What do you think is going to change in the bottom lane from 13.1? I think Zeri getting pushed down a lot is going to open up how the lane matchups can be played. I think we are going to see a little, little bit more Aphelios, maybe some more Jinx. And I do think that the changes to Kassadin, um, Heimerdinger, it means that some we'll see some fewer bands, I think, going into a lot of these drafts. The top lane is going to be a lot more open. I think we're going to see a lot more side lane champions coming through. We're going to see more Fiora. I think we're going to see more Jax. But it's not always going to be Lucian versus Zeri every single game, thankfully. Yeah, I don't have to shake back and forth like a crazy person anymore. We do have the POG ready to go. Let's see who does get it here for game number three. It will be Faker on the Cassidin. But again, as we pointed out, as the guys on the cast pointed out, a huge team effort. Karia playing an insane support Callista owner with a couple of crucial timings on his ganks yeah, to if, make this all possible. If this, if there's a rise here, if he could teleport down, if he had Pryo, this looks different. This doesn't happen. And in fact, they get away with that all in on the bottom side. They kill the bot duo, and Faker doesn't come down here and get three kills. We live in a different reality, right? You know, Thanatos for D plus Kia's Challengers team snaps his fingers, and you know something <laughs> something different happens, right? But like the the way that this game was shaped was around that precise moment. Faker had that edge with Owner, and he took the lead he had and stomped the game. The game was all about him, even though it wasn't a hundred percent he that set it up. His carrier will get one vote for the for the memes. Good old uh, based uh, meme lord. <laughs> Very nice vote. Um, I'm not gonna complain about that one personally. It's all right. It's fine. Um, you know, Karia, very difficult to deal with in general. So, and it ended up being good. Even though, you know, they did get punished. I think the level one, the level two could have been handled a little bit more with some safety just in case, but. Other than that, it was great. You know, the timing to pull Guma in was perfect, and then Guma responding by throwing himself into the fray. Just a great game overall from the guys. Yeah, I, I think that T1 look to be a terrifying team right now, and they are so good at drafting, and they're so creative. This has been a draft weakness that T1 have now overcome, it feels like, in the first few weeks here of the LCK. Maybe Bangi has changed how this team operates. <laughs> Maybe not, it's still early days. Some weak opponents before this, but T1, not trapped in their own mentality, not trapped in comfort picks, can play anything, is the scariest T1. Absolutely. Well, guys, the interview has started. Let's go over to G-Sum for the translation. Thank you.
you very much, guys. This is Jason for the PUG interview on the side of T1, which are owner and faker. This was a complete preview of the Spring Finals. A very hyped one, and you guys are the winner of the Saturday Showdown. How do you feel? I was really nervous to be going up against T plus Kia, a team that never lost a single game, but I'm so happy that we were able to get a reverse sweep and get a POG as well. I'm not really happy with my performance individually, but I'm glad that our team did a great job and got the win. I mean, I'm pretty sure you guys prepared so hard for the series. What did you focus on? I mean, it actually doesn't really that different, you know, we never care too much about the opponent, you know, we never do a like serious, like crazy prep for every single match. We just wanted to, you know, analyze what they're going to play and come up with the best strategy to deal with them. And owner, I think uh, you were the biggest savior of, of T1 in game two. I got really lucky, you know. I think D plus Kia kind of overextended in a bit. So I think it was really important that we kind of punished it. And owner, I think Vi really matches with you very well. How do you rate this pick right now? Vi, you know, she can dash over the wall. She got a lot of kind of ability to dash forward. And also she kind of can always initiate and pressure fights, which is really good. I think in both game one and two, it was all about the jungle matchup. Kenyon got game one POG, and then game two you got POG, and Kenyon played around the D plus bottom lane a lot. How did you want to react to that? I wanted to, you know, catch up with that, match his playstyle and rotation. However, Kenyon was always like one step faster in game number one, so I want to say game number one was a jungle gap. And then, we are so curious about this. Game three, Kalissa support by Keria. Tell us about it. Did you guys kind of practice this in advance? I mean, T1 players, they have a very deep champion pool, and Kalissa was definitely one of them. But other players, you know, owner, all of our T1 players have have so many pocket picks ready. And Kera is the one that always unleashed those kind of joker picks. Was he being the vocal one or was it from the coaching staff? Well, Kera, he's a superstar. He's born to be a superstar, so he's always really vocal about his pick. You know, self-branding is really important to become a superstar and he knows what to do and he was telling all of his thoughts to the coaching staff. And speaking of picks, you know, it's always a you know, combination of the player and the coaching staff. So I want to say it's a teamwork. I'm looking forward to see more of the Joker picks on the side of T1 in the future. Let's move over to game three. Owner, the early gank on the mid lane was so critical. You were able to push Rise out of the lane and then Kasarin and you were able to make a rotation towards bottom lane. Well, we did not really plan for that early on, but looking at the lane status, top and jungle, top and mid lane were not in a good spot, so I wanted to help, wanted to help him out. And then we were able to connect that into the bot lane rotation. I'm pretty proud of myself. And with that fight, Kasarin was able to get three kills. Triple kill was secured, and that was already the game over moment for T plus Kia. Faker, what were you thinking as you headed towards the bottom lane? I was like, if there's a there's any fight breaking out on the bottom lane, it's gonna be so good for us. And then T plus Kia got really aggressive over there, so I was like, I'll be able to pick up all the kills. What about your owner? So Rise was sent back to lane, uh, sent back to base because of our gank and, you know, fights. So we were like, we were making calls like, 
bottom lane can start fight now because we can head towards spot and if this gets longer it's definitely gonna be a good one for us and we were able to make that a play after the triple kill winner were you sure that he was gonna just win it away i mean not he doesn't even need a triple kill you know kasadin getting early one or two kills it's already a game over but kasadin got three there so we were like very confident that this is gonna be t1 win once again, congratulations on winning a very important match of the season. But your next opponent will be Hana Life Esports. I watched them perform, and I think they are definitely in a rough spot. You know, I think they're going through a lot of stuff. So I'm gonna make it rougher. What about you, Faker? We'll do our best. <laughs> Before we go, Faker, we have so many fans out here at Old Park and also watching uh, watching you guys online, so any message over to all the fans. Thank you so much for supporting us and we will keep working hard in order to replicate what we did in last year's Spring Split. And this will be the end of the interview from owner Faker from T1 and I'm going to pass it back to the space. Thank you. Thank you, Jisun, as always, for that awesome translation, as now we can take a look at the standings and see that one team will be on top after uh, this best of three series that we did have, T1 and Faker and Owner and all the boys able to take it down. Yeah, it, like I said bef before the series started, I think this series determines who gets first place in regular season, or at least until these two teams meet up again, because at this moment in time, these two teams are in a tier of their own. S tier, S plus tier, SS, whatever you want to call it. The the gap between T1 and D plus Kia and Genji is actually pretty large. Then the gap between Genji and everyone else is also large. But at this moment in time, until we see much better development, I don't see any world in which either of these teams lose to anyone but each other. So enjoy the top of the standings, T1, because you've earned it. Yeah. Uh... <laughs> And guys, next, we did have our Saturday showdown before, but now we have Breon up against Live Sandbox. You won't want to miss this, but first, we'll take a 30-minute break, and we'll be right back.
오리병원 망한 줄 알았는데 어, 다시 열어서 다행이다 진짜 아, 그러니까요 아, 우리 밥그릇 뺏기는 줄 알았다니까요 어, 근데 오늘 새로운 교수님이 오신다고 들었는데 그러면은 차 교수님은 어떻게 되는 겁니까? 아 씨... 강릉이겠지! 오시는 교수님이 또 존잘이라던데 스킬도 좀 화려하고 말이야 야 그럼 쇼맨십이 뭐가 필요해? 야, 실력만 좋으면 되는 거 아니야? 쇼맨십 다 필요 없어 실력만이 최고야! 오늘부터 새로 합류하게 된 플레임 교수라고 한다 아이고 교수님 오셨어요? 아이고 교수님 블로그 캡틴직입니다 어 교수님 잘생긴 거봐 얼굴 교수님 빛이 나네 그럼 시작해볼까? 야 멋있다 우리 어종이 멋있다 아 그냥 아이고. 끼면 되지 멋있는 척하고 디롤이야 공호공 야소 같은 생각 퍼포먼스가 많아 인류 최화된 정글 남머스 개깝치네 제드 고르고 탈주한 탈주 닌자 같은 새내 집도의 세계 온걸 환영한다 첫 번째 주제는 프로게이머 쇼맨십이 필요한가 아닌가에 대해서입니다. 오... 내가 교수인데 근데 왜 형이 리드해? 그니까 아니 어... 형 이제 교수직 내려놨잖아. 야 <웃음> 제발 <웃음> 이거만 좀 이해 시켜줘. 이것만 좀 빼져가면 시청이 형한테 남는 게 없어. <웃음> 안 돼. 지금 교수직 뺏겼어. 예전에는 필요 없다였어. 하지만 지금 무조건 음... 필요하다. 왜냐면 어 왜냐면은 프로 게이머 어. 왜 프로야 게임을 잘하니까야 그치 이건 기본이야 오. 이건 기본 중에 기본 그리고 어나더도 돈을 그렇게 많이 받으면 잘해야겠지 뭐 나도 있으면은 음. 플러스 요인이 되는 좀 시너지적 요소다 나는 소맨식까지는 잘 모르겠고 음. 뭐 일단은 뭐 일단은 뭐, 얼굴이 쇼맨십이다. 내 <웃음> 네, 얼굴이 쇼맨십이다. 현역 중에서 인기 많은 사람 누구 있어? 베이커? 베이커가 쇼맨십이 좋아서 인기가 많아? 그냥 게임을 잘하니까 압도적인 퍼포먼스 아래 모든 게다 따라온단 말이야. 그냥 뭐 제일 중요한 거는 게임이고 그에 비해서 다른 것도 좀 너무 작다. 고정인 그러면 1 순위, 2 순위, 3 순위 전부 다 게임 게임 게임인 거네. 오로지 게임. 일 순위 게임만 할 거예요. 난 사회생활 몰라요. 해주관이 그런 거 몰라요. 그냥 난 게임만 할 거야. 고정인 게임만 할 거니까. 그러니까. 이게 약간. <웃음> 소맨십이라고 <웃음> 하는 단어가 사실 되게 많은 거를 포괄하고 있는 것 같은데 저희가 카테고리별로 준비를 해봤어요. 음... 첫 번째는 카테고리 과술, 음... 인터뷰. 이거는 음. 기본이지. 넌 기본. 모든 게 기본이고. <웃음> <웃음> 우리가 인터뷰 같은 걸 많이 다 해봤잖아 선수 때도 어. 근데 막 인터뷰 마이크 딱 들이댔을 때막 어, 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 이러면 음. 좀 저는 모습을 보여준다는 거 단답형의 그치 그치 그런 걸 그래서 좀 팀적으로 난 교육을 좀 해야 된다 생각을 해 나는 잘하면 좋지라고 보지 우리는 어. 뭔가를 잘하면 뭔가를 어. 투기해야 돼 인터뷰를 연습할 시간에 솔로 랭크를 한판더 하겠어다 프로게이머 같은 경우는 은퇴를 하면 한국 커리어가 코칭 스태프 쪽이나 아니 방송 쪽으로 가장 많이 한정되어 있잖아 그럴 때 이제 말을 잘하고 그런 건 요즘 이 MBT 세대에서 엄청난 <웃음> <웃음> 요즘 이 사회에서는 엄청난 무기잖아 그런 거를 조금 더 가르치면 어떨까 싶지만 말을 재밌게 하는 거는 가르쳐서 되는 건 아니다라는 생각을 해 사실 이런 게 어. 어느 정도는 있으면 좋다고 음. 느낀 게 아나운서님이나 이제 뭐 이런 쪽으로도 이제 대화를 많이 해보면 너무 대답을 단답형으로 하는 선수라면 인터뷰하기가 너무 어렵다 음. 이제 이런 얘기도 많이 하고 어. 실제로 이때 어땠나요? 이런 거 어, 그냥 잘해서 이긴 것 같아요 아, 엄청 짧고 그냥 단답을 해버리면 이제 그 뒤에 대화를 토크 이어가기가 아, 힘드니까 그치. 형 내용을 좀 말할 수 있는 정도의 딱그 아, 정도 스킬이면 좋겠다 아 근데 생각해보니까 그런 이제 화술 같은 거 드러나면 이 팀게임 커뮤니케이션 팀원들 간의 이 색소매 아, 아, 다음은 어, 외모! 외모 관리 이거 조연아 생각해 인기는 게임 98%라는 것 같아 어, 그러니까 어. 게임을 잘하는데 잘생겼으면 인기가 많지 어, 아, 그렇지 어. 잘생겼다? 어. 게임을 못하면 절대 인기 없어 그럼 못생겼는데 게임을 잘하면? 인기 많지 어느 정도로 게임을 잘해야 돼? 아니 <웃음> 어느 정도로 못생겨야 돼? <웃음> 네. <웃음> 
아무리 한번 어. 보세요 여러분들 네. 우리 팔분만 축구만 봐도 어, 맞아, 맞아. 그냥 잘하면 와 잘생겨 보인다 하잖아 어. 그냥 우리가 볼 때는 막 그렇게 잘생긴 사람까지 아니더라도 <웃음> 전문가여서 그 얼굴 외모도 더 잘생겨 보이는 그렇지. 그런 효과를 아. 받을 수 있다 아니, 나는 근데 이 형이 예전에 어. 멘트 어. 쳤던 게 생각이 나가지고 어. 앞으로 저처럼 잘생기고 게임 잘하는 사람은 안 나올 거다 어. 얘기를 한적 있어가지고 <웃음> 우리끼리 있을 <웃음> 때 어, 옛날에 옛날에 그랬어 <웃음> 나, 나 기억이 안 나는데 혹시 내치로 있어? <웃음> 없기는 한데 그럼 플레임의 인기는 외모 때문일까요? 실력 때문일까요? 어떤 실력 때문이죠 아니 근데 솔직히 얘기하면은 플레임 형 실력도 실력은 있었는데 외모 때문이 분명히 있지 않나? 물병 짤로 한번 크게 떴었잖아 근데 요즘 내돈내산 이러잖아 음, 음, 그런 것처럼 음. 내가 스스로 만들어낸 그런 기회라고 생각을 해 아, 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 월드컵 어. 결승전 보러 갔을 때 어. 뭐 작가 피디님이 우리를 딱 봐도 찍어주잖아 우리 뭐몇석 어디에 있다 카메라 감독님들이 해서 우리 한번 찍어달라 이러고 그 있으니까 어. 찍어주고 어. 어. 이거 검색어에 올라가면서 어. 아니 이게 맞네 네. 호정이도 찍히고 나랑 호사이도 찍혔어 어. 나랑 호사이도 찍혔어 진짜? 바로 도망쳤어요 아이고 카메라 진짜로 한번 볼까요? 그 느낌 어. 나오나? 아 짧아 이게 안 돼. 어 이게 오래 걸렸어 <웃음> 물을 먹고 있지도 않았는데 저 물을 일부러 준비한 거예요? 어? 물 없는데? 물은 이미 당하셨나 보네 <웃음> <웃음> 아니 근데 표정이 형이 아. 지금 얼굴을 보면은 아. 예전 같지 아, 않긴 해 지금 하면은 저폼안 나올 걸? 아. 자 한번 해볼래? 어때 어때? 해봐 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 아 거기 있네 또 어. 연출 또 됐네 <웃음> <웃음> 또 외모는 여전한 것 같기도 하고 아. 뭐 외모로 깔 그건 아닌 것 같아 근데 잘생겼어? 너 아까 같지 않다면 아까 같지 않다 너왜 이렇게 주대가 없어? 하늘 여기 있다가 이렇게 왔다는데 많이 망가졌네 어, 많이 망가졌어 <웃음> 많이 망가졌어 <웃음> 세 번째 그는 지금 세레머니인데 또 이거에 대해서 어떻게 생각해? 최근에 세레머니 가장 많이 한 선수가 이제 표식 선수 음, 아니야? 맞아 맞아 이기고 리신 흉내도 내고 헤카림도 하고 음. 근데 그런 거 보고 있으면 은 즐겁긴 해 보는 시청자 입장에서 음. 어 맞아, 맞아 관객들이 현장에 왜 오고 싶은 거겠어? 뜨거움을 느끼기 그치, 위해서 현장감. 어, 현장감을 근데 막 응, 이래 버리면 그 뜨거움을 같이 못 즐기잖아. 그리고 그런 거를 욕을 하는 거는 그 욕하는 사람이 잘못된 거야. 욕하는 사람. 어, 욕하는 사람들이 잘못지. 어. 지난번에 세레머니로 깝치더니 잘 됐네. 키키. 그렇지. 어. 많이 해봤어? 어. <웃음> 그리고 특히나 나는 인상 깊게 봤던 게 상윤 선수가 되게 재밌는 그걸 많이 해줬잖아 막 얼굴로도 막 웃겨주고 멘트로도 음 웃겨주고 락스 같은 경우에도 이제 뭐 포즈 그런 거잘 잡아주고 뭐 잭패도 그거 했었잖아 어, 그거 한번 눈을 눈을 해주고 나도 눈을 한번 해주고 나도 눈을 한번 테이크 선수 한번 해주고 어 그치 그런 거 그런 게 많아져야 짤이 생기는 거고 짤이 생기면 또 뭐겠어 상징이 되는 거잖아 그치. 스토리가 생기는 거야 어, 맞아, 그러면서 맞아. 스토리가 그래야 재밌어지는 거고 역사가 생기는 거지 그리고 상징이 어, 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 어. 없어 선수들이 난 이거는 진짜 선수들도 어느 정도 생각을 해야 된다 생각을 해 예를 들어서 플레임 다 모자랬어 딱 대표적인 거 생각해봐 어. 몰라 그러면 안돼 이러면 안돼 이러면 안돼 안 돼. 안 돼. 샤이 상징 뭐야? 나? 제스 그치 있지 캡틴 잭 상징 뭐야? 피드루 그치 이런 게 있어야 된다 이거야 캐릭터가 겹치는 사람이 있으면 어떡해? 그러면은 이제 찍어, 찍어 누르는 거지 찍혀 눌리면 어떡해? 그러면은 그러면... 더 열심히 해야지 <웃음> 그러면 그러면 <웃음> 플레임 뭐가 생각나? 물병? <웃음> 어. 그러니까. 아니, 이런 거 찍어봐 이거 아니 중요하다니까 진짜로 <웃음> 네분다 알약하는 거에 다 동의를 하신 것 같은데 그렇다면 저희가 한번 각 기단에 오늘 소개해주신 제안서를 한번 만들어 볼까 어떨지 좋지 <웃음> 좋지 어, 우리가 아, 알약기가 먼저 어, 해주고 우리 이 협박아토스가 한번 문화를 <웃음> <웃음> 우리가 포문을 여는 거지 <웃음> 만약에 우리가 지금 현재 선수라면 어떤 쇼맨십을 했을 것 같아? 입장 전 보혈이라던가 나 생각났어 나 뭐. 왼쪽에 있는 사람 이렇게 하고 음, 오른쪽에 있는 어. 사람 이렇게 하고 밑에 있는 아. 사람 이렇게 하고 위에 있는 사람 거기 올라가가지고 음. 어. 뭐 이런 거 하는 거야 기뉴특전대 음. 어, 기뉴특전대 어. 그런 느낌 이제. 근데 나는 입장 전에 그렇게 쇼를 했다가 아. 이제 경기를 지면 좀 슬프니까 아. 쇼라니 아. 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 나는 그래서 이기고 하면은 아. 좀더 좋지 않을까 아니면 어. 이길 것 같은 매치업에 아. 아. 한명 이제 나란히 쓸때 음. 그때는 좀 어떻게 해보는 게 좋을 것 같아? 나는 근데 아예 어. 한 팀의 스토리를 짰어 어. 아예 어디 팀? 모건 선수와 어. 두두 선수의 스토리를 엮는 거야 무슨 스토리가 있는데? 둘이 이제 하나 때도 맞아, 계속 맞아. 경쟁을 했었고 팀을 나가고 이제 다시 또 대회에서 만나는 거잖아 음. 이런 거막 서로 해주면서 막 평양 이렇게 내밀면서 레슬링 하듯이 이런 거 하면서 <웃음> 
굳이 꼭 혀까지 내밀어. 이게 약간 액션 그 액션감이 좋잖아. 그런 것도 좋고 음. 아니면 지금까지는 막 입장할 때 되게 무뚝뚝하게 걸어 나와서 맞아, 그냥 그래. 인사하고 흩어지잖아. 음, 음. 근데 좀 팬들이랑도 소통하는 게 하나쯤은 있었으면 좋겠다. 뭐 음. 입장하면서 팬들한테 이렇게 뭐 아, 인사를 더 적극적으로 한다던가. 가장 중요한 거지 이제 승리 후 세레머니. 음. 어. 승리 후 세레머니. 어. 나 약간 정신 어, 차리다던가. 어. 게임 끝나고 음. 나서 케이블 위에 올라가서. 와. 어. 어. 내 관계 속에 남자 팬들 늘어날 때. <웃음> 그 약간, 그 나는 어. 좀 예전에 했던 코스프레를 생각하면서 승리 후? 어, 승리 후. 그럼 게임할 때 계속 웃고? 아니, 게임할 때. <웃음> 나는 국내 선수끼리 만약 그렇게 도발했다가 어. 얼굴 불킬 수도 있으니까 해외 대회에서 음. 이제 우리가 이기고 국뽕을 주입할 만한 세레머니 태극기 어. 이런 거 어, 그렇지 그렇지 미리 준비했다가 보여주면 나쁘지 않지 않나 왜냐면 내 세레머니 제일 인상 깊게 본게 스타크래프트 때 이성훈 선수 아, 아 그, 어. 그분 그분 그, 그분, 그, 그분 너는 밥이다 그래서 음. 밥 던지는 세레머니도 하고 <웃음> 광안리에서 수영도 하고 맞아 맞아 맞아, 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 맞아. 맞아. 어, 수영복 입고 오고 그런 과감한 세레머니 나쁘지 않지 않나 그래. 그래. 수영복을 이제 안에 입고 안에서. 온 다음에 어. 어. 게임 끝나자마자 다 벗어버리면 어. 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 그냥 너랑 전개되는 거지 약간 어. 어. 그치 그치 어. 그리고 수영복 어. 아. 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 자 여러분 이제 좋은 아이디어 많이 나온 것 같으니까 배낭으로 음. 한번 영상을 찍어보시죠 알겠습니다 자 이동하시죠 알겠습니다 자. <목소리> 그렇죠. 매일매일 강조를 할 수밖에 없는 게 <웃음> 대부분 거기서 뭔가 승부가 나요. 아 그럼요. 네. 네. 네 경기에 나선 선수들 입장하고 있습니다. 먼저 네, 선수들 우리 팬분들 같이 하이파이브를 나누셔도 되고요. 아 확실히 또 네. 이렇게 좀 의미가 있네요. 서로 네. 커뮤니케이션 하면서. 네, 그렇죠. 네. 정말 기대가 많이 됩니다. 예. 자 팬들께 인사드리는 자, 강력한 우승 후보. 10개 팀 중에 5개 팀이 우승 후보를 뽑은 아 직관의 맛은 다르겠죠? 그렇죠. 참 정말 좋은 멘트 같아요. 그렇지. 아 <웃음> 오늘 그때 올해 몇번 쓸지 한번 카운터하고 봐봐요. 하면서 같이 모여서 치 아 자 이렇게 아레나에서 직접 한번 해봤는데 자 이렇게 찍은 걸 가지고 저희가 제안서를 보내보도록 하겠습니다 야 우리 거 채택돼가지고 나오면 어떡해 나는 내거 채택됐으면 좋겠어 음. 나는 근데 안 따라했으면 좋겠어 <웃음> <웃음> 아, 멋있는 거 해야지 선수들은 아무튼 선수들이 세레머니 많이 하는 그런 문화가 됐으면 좋겠습니다 축구를 하는 혓바닥 터스 시대를 만들어가는 혓바닥 터스 저희는 이만 가보도록 하겠습니다 혓바닥 터스 입구 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 다음 주에 만나요 다음 주에 만나요 
Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to LCK Spring 2023. Huge thank you to the support act for this evening, which was DK taking on T1. Now we get to the main event. Bro taking on Live Sandbox. For all the problems. No? Gonna let you stew in that one, Atlas. Yeah, no, it, it, the, 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 the game prior was definitely the, the, the Saturday showdown. This I'm sorry. is I'm still sorry. an absolutely huge one because both of these teams are on the east side of the bracket. And I think what's on a lot, and this is the elephant in the room, right? Who's going to fall first and who's going to fall the furthest is kind of the question in our minds. You mean as both of these two teams go par far beyond what DRX and Humble Life are able to do, right? Because they're both going to make playoffs. Oh, yeah, but like... Right? There's plenty of room on that side of the bracket, my friend. Plenty of room over there. And competition is extraordinarily tight at the moment. So, Bro versus Live Sandbox. As you can see, two East Side teams, both of them sitting on two and one. One of these squads will even out with DK's scoreline. Two. After two. Are, aren't, aren't, aren't they West Side teams? Sorry, West, which side? You east. said East. I was very confused. Oh, sorry. I West, thought you yeah. were already flaming them, Atlas. I'm like, what did they do to deserve? This? I thought you were a bro leader. I'm not. I, I didn't. I didn't do my never oh, eat soggy wheat fix. That's. I'm, that's. I'm sorry. Oh yeah, of course. Uh, we also costed a crazy best. I don't. I don't quite so. understand how my lefts and rights work. I don't know how you're supposed to make me achieve something I was good trying, when you introduce two trying, other sides. I was trying to get you out of the hole. Stop digging yourself in, please. As overall, both these two teams performing better than expected thus far. And for Breon, it was definitely taking on some of the weaker teams. They have been kind of a rookie killer in a way where they are very consistently able to match some of the less experienced teams. But Sandbox, actually, very surprising yeah. after they got dismantled by D+. They did. And Bro also uh, lost against a Gen G that we think is pretty solidly um, a third place team uh, at the moment. Here in the LCK, I think a lot of development will ensue, and I think Pays will uh, definitely start helping that team rocket towards the top, but not just yet. Still need a little bit of time in the oven, as uh, these two, they have managed to find themselves towards that western side, which I did manage to get correct that time around. Umpty versus uh, Willa, though, is a big one, and Willa has been dismantling people recently. Both Clid and Cuz on the receiving end of some very unfortunate smites for them. And another interesting kind of parallel I've noticed between these two teams is that Breon is Umpty and Umpty is Breon. If Umpty isn't performing, the team looks very lackluster. If he's not the one calling the shots, then things yep. aren't really happening. I wouldn't go quite as far to say the same thing for Willer, but we definitely see a really big difference in games where he gets an early lead because he is that team fighter. He <laughs> does go in hard as... <laughs> Karis looking scary, looking real yeah. scary. However, eyes, man. on the rift, Closer has been far more scary. Uh, let's just say that. Karis had a pretty me mediocre um, experience their last trip out. Both of them born in the same year, of course, debuting very similar times as well here in the LCK. Um, of course, Karis was subbing for Gen.G at the same time that Closer was subbing for T1. Uh, but confident that they won't lose. Let's see what's going to happen here as first of the stage will be Breon. Any bro leavers in chat? Come on. I think there may just you be. You know the answer to that question. You have to ask the question. You have to ask the question sometimes. You know, it's one of those things. As Morgan's going to make his way out as definitely the best LCK like uh, trading cards, cards that you could possibly get. Um, bit bias. I don't but, know what uh, you're talking about. I have a Croco card and I'm very, very happy. Uh, overall, Breon showcasing much of the same style, even though they did lose the light and lava. It is still team fight oriented, very slow pace, slow and steady, wins the race for this team as they are literally led by Umpty. Oh yeah. So it works perfectly on so many levels. Exactly right. And I want to echo your point as well about Umpty being the one they rely upon, but it's not even necessarily whether he's having a good performance on the day. It's about his emotional state on the day because sometimes Umpty's just really feeling himself when he walks into Lol Park and he will tear people apart. Other times he's feeling a bit more subdued and that is when this team right here could potentially stamp them out as Willa 
with the peace sign. I don't know whether they're going to be going for too much peace here. Is <laughs> Kyle just deciding, no, nah, he's not going to do it. Kyle he's not going to get involved. Just standing there like, oh, no, this is, this is mildly awkward, guys. I would much rather not. <laughs> Please, can we refrain? I ask of you as... Overall, we do have a, a little bit, you might see it already, the fan signs there, a little bit of a ceremony here. Yeah, it is, of course, Ryu's birthday. And uh, these players have been watching Doc Tongues. They know they need to get better at these ceremonies, and they're going to join in on Aww. the fan signs. Absolutely adorable. Uh, happy birthday to Ryu, and hopefully him and his team can pick up a victory here today in order to celebrate it. But the gentleman over the other side of the rift have something else to say about it. May not be anyone's birthday, but it is always bro day. Grey Baron over there as Sandbox in many, uh, many eyes, including I think all of ours on the global side, we had very low expectations of this team. And with what they have shown thus far, it's actually somewhat remarkable as I do- This is insane. <laughs> yeah, well, I do <laughs> want to put some, the kill participation, being this high is a double-edged sword, right? Like, th this is both, it's a testament to how good Omti is, it is also a testament to the rest of Bro being a little bit slower paced and being somewhat reliant on their jungler, whereas for Willer, as we have clearly seen, closer, brutal, these players have been playing very aggressive, and bot lane definitely had an incredibly rough opening and Envy and KL getting, again, dismantled, but ever since then, they have matched and stood up to respectively Aiming and Lahens and Viper and Life and were completely fine. They haven't been through the Henna and Effort test though, uh, so we'll have to judge them after that. After they go through the gauntlet, that is real. Because that is the true test. That is the true test. That's how you know if you're a good team or not. Oh, 100%. 100%. You might be talking about D plus Kia and T1, these teams that, uh, you know, Live Sandbox certainly struggled against. Um, but we've driven that from our memories because the last couple of matches have been victories for Live Sandbox. I remember there was a time where I was discussing Live Sandbox and I was not very happy with their performance. That was prior to their most recent upset win, perhaps. They can revisit that, but they do have to get through. Henner and effort. Let's see if they can find the Lucian Ban button. That is what I'm going to be looking for, because outside of that, the bot lane of Breon has definitely run into some issues now. Pays and the Light, not the least of opponents. The Light also taken on his former organ, succeeding exceptionally well, as would be expected of Genji, as we pointed out. Both Gen.G's reputation, I think, as a team that can definitely put the hurt to some of the weaker teams. And for Breon, we saw clearly what the identity of this team is. This team is not going to take any undue risks. They're going to look for 5v5s. They're going to look for that front to back. You know, maybe if they get crazy with a crocodile flank, they'll, they'll be able to incorporate that. But overall, this is a very by-the-books type of team that relies on cohesion and teamwork and being led by the general, whereas Lyft Sandbox have been explosive, sometimes a little bit too much for their own good. Yep. So we'll see whether the seatbelts will reign supreme. As here we are into pick and ban for game number one. Silas, the second ban after the Wukong. There's the Maokai gone. That is the Lucian ban button that you were requesting. Lyft Sandbox will hear you. Uh, if you are listening, happy birthday, Ryu. Um, and now, bro, final ban, the Karma. Not sure how to feel about that because there is an Ash, a Varus, a Caitlyn, a lot of picks there still really left available. Is. And we will see what is prioritized here. In my opinion, the Ash is the strongest, is both the most versatile. So if you ban Ash here as Sandbox, you can either pick up Caitlyn or Varus, and with both, I think you're going to be fairly happy. Would be the safest bet, but Rise is another pick, for example, that is still open. Oh, the okay, Renekton going, needs to be banned. We're going off the wall. Uh, we are respecting the Lord, certainly. That Silas Ben also signifying that Bro, in case the reaction was banned, will maybe looking towards a Nar. Is it Ooh. could be Varus? Yeah, you, you Ash here. I don't know if you, you don't even need to pick another AD carry or support with it right now. Can also just go Ash Heimer, which with Karma being banned in particular is very rough. I really like Ash Sejuani here. That would also be uh, pretty powerful. But still considering things here on the other side of the sandbox. I think the Ash is a shoe-in, but they're yeah. just waiting, biding their time 
before they have to make up their minds for the next one. Ash Sivir. That's two champions that could be in a lane together. And that's going to be locked in. And very interesting choice here. I don't think we've seen specifically Ash Shiver in recent times, at the very least. Does actually kind of excerpt the issue of trying to shove into a, an Ash lane, which by itself is very hard. Again, no Karma available. Heimerdinger, to me, seems like a somewhat of a necessity. Otherwise, you're going to get shoved in very consistently, lose a lot of the pressure that the Varus offer, uh, otherwise offers us. Rai's going to get picked up here, so we're seeing more and more diversions, at least in individual drafts, from the pick up your bot lane in jungle, as the Rai's incredibly strong, also kind of forcing Sandbox to pick up a mid here as well, if they do want to get something that matches up well into the Rise. Syndra comes to mind, um, or one of Closer's more aggressive picks. Ooh, this is interesting. Sejuani's so going to be locked in. So, Effort's pick has not been picked up yet as Closer flashing his most iconic champion in the Aurelia. Not likely to be played at this point in time, however crazy things have happened. I think, I mean, if you want to, you can just lock in Kassin in again. And there it is. Eight seconds to go, and I don't see why you wouldn't do it. Let Willa go a little bit deeper into his champion pool. There have been a couple of things banned away. But Elise is still available. Uh, quite a few other things still available as well. Could go back to, you know, something like is Lee Sin from back in the day. Certainly a few other choices that you can get around the jungle with. So Cassidy locked in. How do Bro react? Worried about Bro's options in the bot side of the map now. Sivir and Ash, especially post for his back, really strong in terms of being able to shove out. Obviously. The downside that Sivir has compared to a lot of the other things we've seen the Ash with is, okay, we're diving deep here. Um, Are they going to ban the Twitch, though? That's my question. Of all the questions, you the Twitch, that's... Twitch Varus, man. I'm a bit frightened of that, uh, that option. If Effort is playing Twitch, I don't think Sandbox are going to mind. Okay. I, I actually really like the Alistair ban. I think it's obviously one of the classic counter picks into the Sivir. And it's a pick that we know Effort has a great impact on Heimerdinger ban. Exactly what we're calling for as well. Able to maintain this shove on the bot side of the map. Uh, Elise and Vi both bend away. So looking for an R4 jungle pick up here. And Lud is gone. I wonder whether we're going to see a really deep cut. Something like a Trondo comes to mind. Very strong into the Sejuani. Ooh, that's a Nocturne. That's going to be locked away. So... Level 6 is going to be a pretty big moment uh, for this team. Of course, Gassadin gets a lot stronger, but Nocturne becomes a champion. It does step away from the bottom lane powerhouse, though, because Nocturne, not super strong until he gets that other. One upside of Nocturne is that he, of course, can farm very quickly. Hopefully, we'll be able to hit 6 soon, but might need to help out his mid laner as well. Clothes are definitely going to be struggling a little bit as Nautilus oh dear. being hovered here, and effort going back to comfort, certainly. And overall, the bro comp feels like one we've seen him play a million times, right? You have double front line, you have a lot of skirmishing, and most importantly, 5v5 power. But I'm looking at the sandbox draft, and you have a ton of prior on both side. You have a surefire win condition in the Cassidin. And the only weak point, I do think, is the very early levels, right? As soon as Wheeler is actually able to hit level 6 on the Nocturne, you can both hover towards bot. Bro do have a lot of catch and punish potential, though, and historically they have been pretty good with those type of comms, but a lot of pressure on Umti. So if Sandbox can track Umti, make sure that their bot lane is safe while shoving, and Closer can get to 6 safely, I do think Sandbox definitely a very strong draft here. Absolutely. No Caitlyn picked up this entire time. Of course, the first pick, Varus, meant that uh, it's not likely that Effort was going to go down the carrier route and uh, head towards support. Caitlyn, uh, there'd be just 480 carries in that lane. That would just be really crazy. I'm glad that we're stepping away from that as Edgar and Ryu going to bow to one another, make their way off the stage. These drafts worry me a little bit on the bro side. I'm not going to lie to you. We've seen Nautilus has picked and Lahens, no slouch um, at the League of Legends. However, struggled immensely on the Nautilus to make things happen. His Leona worked out. 
but the Nort didn't quite find it. And against this lane, I just don't see any agency for the Nautilus. I would imagine that post six, they're going to look really, really uh, heavily for all ins. You do have an opportunity to take down the Ash, you know, just go for a, Nort a Nautilus ultimate if she oversteps. Then you can just change CC and take her down, but I don't love trying to go for a post-6 kill lane when you're playing into a lane that is probably going to hit level 6 first, and it has a Nocturne. Because from that point on, if you do go in for the all-in, Nocturne ganks you, and you don't have Umti there as well, you're going to be into deep trouble. So also a lot of pressure here on Karis, who we haven't really talked about yet, on this rise to actually have an impact in this game. Exactly right. Let's hop on the rift here for game number one. But Sandbox fans, some of them, even more passionate that the rest, than the rest, as we, uh, as we could hear just there. Bit of a trail on, a bit of a competition to see who could continue uh, talking for the longest or cheering for the longest. And here we are. Bro, going to need um, a bit of help, you could imagine, towards this bottom side. The Zephyr is going to come down, spots this ward out. Ooh. We'll be able to remove it. I really like the choice from Anna to go for Lethal Tempo. I am a firm believer in going for the on-hit Varus when you do have the opportunity when you're playing with a decent frontline, which very clearly that is here. The downside is that I don't know how many autos you're actually, like how much freedom you're actually going to get in terms of autoing against Cassidy in particular. Cassidy and Nocturne is a really strong dive core. Brodo, if he can find a flank and join them very easily as well. And the lack of a cleanse into a Ash specifically always makes me a little bit worried because post six, there is no cooldown on Ash ulti. That's actually a lie uh, told to you by Ash mains that when that champion nerfed um, and that yeah. wanna maintain credit for firing off great arrows. But the secret is you just keep firing them. Yeah. As unexpectedly, Envy and Cal have priority level one. Wow. Yeah, that's extraordinary. Well, we'll see whether that's going to continue. As we can see, no minions lost here for Henna and Effort. They should be able to lock these up. I'm going to miss out on one of them. Is Henna. A little bit unfortunate. Last hit timing. But not too much to worry about. As, as long as this wave stays very close to their turret, they're going to be pretty happy. As Effort is going to have to dredge line his way out of this. Kael. Happy to walk into this brush, though, as uh, Envy and Henna are fighting, and oh. the Sandbox winning on both fronts. Yeah, so the problem is that you can't really all in, obviously, in that scenario's effort, uh, because Henna is getting shoved in and zoned by the wave. And level one Ash is so incredibly strong. You see there, you get the Halo Blades, you get the Q, and then you're able to um, proc Cheap Shot very easily, and then effort just kind of has to take damage and, and be very, very sad. Yeah, that's uh, kind of what it looked like. Yeah. Not get that much done. So this is obviously not the end of the world. This is how the matchup is expected to go. My main issue with this is that as long as the vision control is good and we do see the things going down, they, sh they should be aware that Umpty on its full clear is currently around the bottom half of the map. Uh, they are going to buy a lot of space for Closer to just free farm, right? There's no opportunity well, as all Closer. Yeah, Karis uh, doing pretty well here. Land some more Flux, but Closer able to sidestep the Q. And uh, this is not how this particular matchup went um, as the game con continued to progress in our previous series. We'll see how Karis is going to handle the Cassidy as that level six becomes ever closer. Zumpty's going to move on down. Kyle, kind of caught out of uh, position here by Ash's Frel Yordian sister. Willa looking for Karis as well. Dust bringing, working out, giving him that extra movement speed, but looks like the Rise is going to be able to safely go home. And backs coming through here in general. Do see that both junglers now making their way back. Both mid laners teleporting on effectively the exact same timer. A little bit of a CS lead here as Kael with that early move and getting tagged by Umti is going to miss out on a fair amount of experience here. So that is going to delay the Ash level six. And this might be the moments that as Hena and Effort, you're going to be looking 
to kind of exploit as we get later into the game. Because again, if you can hit level 6 first and Kael specifically doesn't respect, uh, you might be in trouble. For Envy, it's a lot easier because he has a spell shield, so your options are a little bit less obvious for yep. effort. Um, but Biash can be in a bit of trouble there, so Willer might be wanting to look out for that timing. And Closer, as expected, you know, having a bit of a rough time, but if you go a wave down on, an, on a rise, it doesn't really matter. No, in fact, uh, Closer's having a pretty good time right yeah. now. Has uh, his spellbook unsealed as well, still uh, retains his flash. Ooh, as uh, Henner and Effort do have some cavalry on their way down. Karras on the level 5, no realm warps to speak of just yet, but getting closer and closer to that point. Oh, like this. Setting up a trap here. Trying to invade Wheeler, he might know. Oh dear, Arctic Assault going to come in, the Rune Prison goes down, but he's not quite able to spell shield too much. The Dustbringer to get a bit of damage tagged back, but this is great, because if they block Willer from being able to enter the bottom side of the map, it means that Henner and Effort might stand some semblance of a chance. Yeah, as uh, the narrator said, uh, they didn't. He, he did in fact not know. Uh, forced a flash, unfortunately, there for Wheeler. And now, fortunately for Envy and Kael, Wave actually not in the worst of states, is going to be pushing back towards them. So as long as they play safe, they should be fine here. But is going to delay Wheeler a little bit. He went toward the top side of the map and is able to pick up his Krug's camp there. Picks himself a Blacidity boost as well, which is quite nice on Nocturne if you get them just before you think six. Means that you will have the ability haste on your first ultimate, and first ultimate always a very important one on these type of semi-global champions. Ready to try and get something going early as Drake is being starred up here. You can contest here, but I don't think you should, and Sandbox seems to feel the uh, same way as yep. goes over to Bro. Yep. Well, uh, not quite at level 6 yet, no. and even if he did have it, just don't think that they're in a position where they're powerful enough to make that one happen. There's Rune Prison once again on the Closer here, who does have Rift Walk, so it's not like he's going to be dying anytime soon, but the way the wave has been handled, Karis is doing a pretty good job. As we check into the Lord towards this top side, Morgan having a pretty good time into Birtle right now. Um, top lane relevance, um, we're feeling it's about the same as it has been so far this season, which is not very relevant at all at this stage of the game. No, I don't, I don't see that changing anytime soon. As long as Drakes stay as good as they are, as long as the power of plates remains in place, uh, we won't see any considerable changes, as Willer now has dinged six. Does mean that he himself will be ready. Same for Hannah, though. And Hannah. As we can see, Effort still wasn't experienced leader on KL, so not going to be able to fight for priority at any time soon is the Lift Sandbox bot lane. We're really uh, going to have to respect. Be careful not to walk into an all-in, because that is the main way, especially with Willow on the top side of the map, Whoa. that they lose as... That was a big boop of damage. That Sheen proc from Morgan. The Lord just does more damage, does he not? I don't think that's fair. No, I don't, I don't think so either. However, he does have access to the code because he is omnipotent. And he will join Umpty in uh, taking on Shelly, who does not stand a chance. Into Morgan, as we all know. The Sandbox, though, given an opportunity to get a bit of damage down to this outer turret on the bottom side. So we'll see how many plates they can actually collect for themselves. And Closer and Willa looking for their opportunity to come down as well. Effort unseen, Ooh. but there is vision everywhere. And so Bro should be able to avoid dying, although not able to save their plates right now. See some pings going down, but not really a cross map available here. Bro bot lane playing safe enough that they are still completely fine. And it's important to mention as well that we talk a lot about this, this Nocturne and him looking for a level six setup. His setup isn't that great. Once Kael at 6, it gets a little better, but you do somewhat rely on Hannah and Effort going in deep. Uh, you have a Cassidy in mid, so you're not going to rely on a lot of help there. And then Cassante, in terms of setup, is pretty good, but you're playing into Jax with Flash. So Wheeler, right now, really is just on guard. So he's just hanging out, trying to ch track Umti. I think his main goal in this game should be just making sure that his bot lane and his mid lane are fine. If top falls behind. Eh. You know? Yeah. <laughs> Who cares? We don't. The top laners don't, as we've seen in the past. And as long as Closer 
Just farm up, get more levels, and we can maybe hit that coal spike and get into a more comfortable position as the Sivir. That's what you're going to be looking for is... All right, Willa going to uh, head towards his Rift Scuttler. Should be able to take that one down. Kyle just helping him out there. Very comfortably. Realm Warp in hand here for Karis. Which is like a much bigger Rift Walk that you can only use once. Death Charge coming in. Gets the flash out from Envy. Umpty celebrates with an ultimate. <laughs> Not sure what that was about. Didn't quite find the mark though. As the Realm Warp was not taken there by Karis. Good choice. Flash now down here for Envy. And does mean that a follow-up play, perhaps around Umpty going bot side again. A hook from Effort or uh, Anna hitting an ultimate will have a lot more impact, but it's also not the end of the world. I do firmly believe that even though the Breon 1v1 in top side is going to be favorable for them, and they still have a pretty decent front line, and very solid five, uh, 5v5, like front to back type of comp, you're playing into Sivir and Cassidy, and so I just don't... You can take that risk, and it's, it's pro, so they, they will take that risk. But I don't love it, Yeah, personally. I would much rather try and see a little bit more proactiveness, but the vision control on bot side also makes this harder. There is not a lot of playmaking potential when everyone knows everything. Oh, look at that. Observers and me. Yeah. Not the same mind. Jonah Strong synergizing with Chronicle beautifully. As close, like, this is the thing that's a bit strange about this game, right? It feels like a full handshake. And on the top yeah. side of the map, Morgan, very happy about the handshake. He's like, yeah. ooh, I'm going to get into split push monster but territory. But then there's a Cassidy in the game, bro. Like, Breon, you need to... Come on, need, bro. Yeah, come on, bro. <laughs> it's Come on, bro. You've got you to, gotta, I think, um, do a little bit more stuff and things. Well, they, they have really good pick potential. So no matter what point in the game you get, if someone oversteps, you can win and very easily blow someone up if... Sandbox misposition, walk into a couple of big AoE team ultimates, then you can also get taken down very easily. But they also have great non committal CC. And I do think overall we have seen that in these type of kind of slower, still made games, Ash support is so strong because you can just fire off arrows. Well, Umpty may suffer at the hands of one of those as Morgan is counter striking a wave. Chains of Corruption comes in there as the arrow is going to be flashed. Umpty able to turn that into farming some camps, which is fun, as well as going to have to run away from that one. Depth Charge comes in. Great piercing arrow there as well. But uh, it's all just disengage on the side of Bro. Means that this Rift Scuttler is going to be taken by Liv Sandbox, and they have no interest in the Drake whatsoever. Yeah, I was kind of expecting to maybe do something as the Herald turns out <laughs> and is just thrown down in mid. And it, if you, in, case you were wa in case you were watching the first series that we had today, you might be thinking that that is peak LCK, but I'm here to tell you it's oh, not. Oh, no. This is peak LCK. Indeed. What we're witnessing right here. Yeah. This. That thing that really? you were talking about, about something happening, that happened way too much in our previous series. We need Can't to go back here. down to reality. I want to check. I think Willow got hooked out of his ultimate. Would actually might just be an auto attack. So I kind of want to check. Um, as arrow doesn't hit. Let's look here. Okay, no, I just went in on Hannah. Uh, I was about to say I'm not 100 percent sure that you actually can take the Nocturne out of it. So, um, and regardless, didn't happen there. Willow just goes in, fl flashes out. And then does nothing. As the dust settles, however, yeah. there is a slight gold advantage for Liv Sandbox. They yeah, are. I don't think the gold's going to be... i got to talk about something, Chronicle, the, okay? The, well, we have not had any shenanigans happens in Termacast all day. All day. True. We had to talk about the actual video game, and right now we're watching one team say, oh, we have Cassidy and Sivir, we scale, let's wait. And the other team saying, oh, we have Jax and Rise, we scale, let's wait. And it's not stopping anytime soon. No. It's not happening. Scaling so and waiting does seem to be continuing. <laughs> it is Breon, of course it's continuing. Indeed. So, in all their generosity, they've given us the opportunity to talk about other stuff. Maybe I could talk about that what? story that I never got to finish during the first series. It's feeling a little less relevant now, though. <laughs> you want to talk about... <laughs> about D-plus slash Dumb Monkeyas 
history. Yeah, yeah. I don't. I don't think. I just never got to finish this. Well, part. no, I know. I, I know it's a great story. I know you have a lot of strong opinions about it, but I, I feel yeah. like we need to I lost my, I find lost a my different moment. direction, Atlas. Yeah, it's a bit sad. Well, the direction is towards <laughs> a handshake. Um, surprisingly enough, we oh. have the Drake being taken by Bro. They're yeah. very happy to do so. Uh, singular Hex Drake handshakes. actually pretty powerful, <laughs> as it's going to be a Mountain Soul this game as well as Morgan. Might hit Birtle with an auto attack or two. Doesn't lose his turret. And uh, the Herald is going to be taken here by Willis. So Birtle might be able to uh, help break down this turret. First brick certainly will be a great thing for either team. I'm not gonna, I, they might want to use it on mid to actually gain a semblance of map control. Also big back here. Willow picking up his stride breaker. And the pace of the game continues. Atlas has everyone. Getting his one item spot. They perfectly synced up as well. This is beautiful. Oh, yeah. Do I note, think. by the way, that there is a mountain rift, which for both teams is great. I don't, I don't know. I, 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 I feel like I should talk about the game, but the game's not giving me a lot. No. Closer is farming the minion wave. Is As it, a is result, it, is it he na is na now. Nature documentary time, is that where we're going? Yeah, I think so. He is now almost a wave. Ahead of Rise, Effort will move relatively slowly across the mid lane oh. and then proceed towards the lower side of the map. Okay, it's nature documentary. We're not trying to make people fall asleep here, Atlas. No, that's what it's, what it's about. Because sometimes you don't necessarily need to watch for all the excitement. And honestly, the more dignified and, and elegant League this is, a is far slower. This is a very elegant form of League of No, Legends. it absolutely is. Because it that, eschews violence. No, we don't do that here. No, that's not what we're about. This is all. This is more like chess, you know? <laughs> and yes, pieces do take one another in chess, but they also <laughs> spend a lot of time just moving around. I wonder how long you can play a chess match before being forced... Like, I guess you can just indefinitely play, right? And never be forced to take any piece. No. Of your opponent. I, I think, theoretically, you could just move a bishop backwards and forwards. Yeah, okay, but say, say you can't repeat moves, right? Because obviously, otherwise, you can keep moving the same piece and doesn't really, doesn't well, really do it for me. You move one bishop forward, and then the other bishop forward, and then the next bishop backward, and then the other bishop backward, and then keep cycling the clock. It was more exciting in my head. I think this game is kind of messing with my uh, <laughs> my ability to judge whether or not a topic is interesting. If your comprehension hey, of reality has been challenged... Hey, he hit an arrow! He got him! Good job, Kyle. Look at the cooldown. <laughs> what did the arrow hit? Uh, hang on. Oh, yeah. Cool. Missed that one, did ya? Yeah, I did. I missed that one. <laughs> um... I also missed. Um, oh yeah, we got anything we that could have had resulted. First brick, but instead, we got a charge of mid. Hey, we also might have first brick as uh, Karis is going to move down and uh, deny it. So never mind. First brick. No, <laughs> that's not what we're about here. I'm gonna let's take a look. What was our latest first blood again? This is actually PVE League of Legends. The only things that have died are neutral objectives and minions and jungle camps. Only the environment has been attacked, and even the structures are not being attacked. Well, they're being attacked, but not, they're not actually down. Well, they're being told to, please, go down, turret, I, I ask of thee, and, and the turret's like, no. So they okay, that's cool, bro. Well, yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll just back off. No problem. Um, wow. Who is going to die first in this game, and how? Maybe we make it a reverse murder mystery. I'm still, um, I think in bro games we often bring up this stat, which is the lowest amount of kills in an LCK game is three. <laughs> um, we often think that uh, it's going to be challenge. Um, and so far it is. We've made it to 19 minutes without a first blood. I believe our longest first blood this year um, is not 19 minutes. I think well, we no. may have got there. For, for this year it is, but I'm talking... Because oh. I know it was last year, it was Bro versus... Dom Wan Kier at the time, yeah, right? Yeah, exactly. And that was like 21 minutes? 
24 minutes or something like that? Yeah. It's coming up. I think it was, yeah, 20, but, 24, 27 minutes. But remember, we're definitely going to break that record because it's not even about whether First Blood has happened or not. It's about an idea. As the arrow is going to connect, Closer makes his way into the background, and oh dear, we may actually get some action as Riftwalk comes in. Umpty's actually going to get dragged back from over the wall. He's trying to get out of First Blood, goes to Breon, as into the back line goes the Lord, and he is very upset about all of this killing and shenanigans that's been going on. Realm Warp to come forward as Kyle's in trouble. Karis flashing immediately. It's a double kill for Morgan. The absolute and utter warlord on the rift. As Closer goes down as well, this Jax is so online and Bro might take something else on the map. Maybe, a, are they doing Baron? I don't know about this one. Uh, they do have a decent amount of time here. Wheeler is on his way, but I think they might get it. And from nothing, we spring forth into Bro winning a fairly messy fight. They're getting wheel though. I am getting worried. Yeah, Kyle's got an arrow, and uh, he's not going to use it uh, due to the okay. gentleman's agreement from prior. Uh, they had one bout, and the bout was successfully taken by Bro, and therefore they are entitled to the Baron. That is the gentleman's agreement of the situation. And in return, as pointed out, we will now get a Mountain Drake here for Sandbox. We have, outside of Envy, pretty hard wave player. Uh, both Brodo and Clovis are required to move into melee range to actually clear anything. And Gold Lead definitely going to accelerate here for Korea. And all they needed was one fight. That's efficiency, Atlas. Oh, 100%. They've uh, taken themselves to Baron. They've now got the split push king in the Jackson. Let's check it out one more time. As a lot of damage comes down here, but it is actually really hard to kill or rise this early on. And this funnel is just very tough to deal with. The amount of damage that both Hannah and Karas are able to output in that point in time is simply too big. Closer isn't that strong just yet. And as a result, they don't really have the damage necessary Proto unfortunately goes down and without KL isn't really anything that you can oh. do. A sandbox has more turrets now are falling. The peace has been broken, Atlas. You know what's beautiful? The peace may have been broken, but that Baron was traded for a dragon. Top out a turret was traded for bottom out a turret. Oh wait. And then there was a another out of turret taken on the top side of the map, so it's a slight advantage as far as turrets are concerned. It's oh. also not nearly enough because there is still Cassidy who just hit his Seraphs, is about to hit a Rod of Ages, and at level 16 can still be an absolute manners. Well, we'll see whether he can get through Morgan, who has a Black Cleaver now put together, pickaxe on the way as well. Is that going to be Death Dance, Black Cleaver, and Divine Sundra? Whoa. Divine Sunderer is an interesting item for Morgan to pick up um, because he, of course, is the Divine and he wouldn't want to Sunder himself. I, for a second, really thought you were going to go into some analysis there. I really, I was I was caught off guard. I should have known. There is the fact also that if he gets the item upgraded by Orn, it turns into Deicide, which is also another thing that he definitely would want as there is an arrow that's going to save us from this particular point for a moment. It's going to be traded that glacial prison. Uh, it's not really going to do anything. Um, yep. We could talk more about uh, about Morgan, but is there anything else that you'd like to discuss, Chronicle? We're on 15 out of 16 on the count. Clock's ticking. True. He did manage to hit that level 10, but Quoza just needs one more. Not exactly the speediest of, uh, you know, level 16s for the Cassidy, but still. The game state is one of, what, down about 3,000 gold? Not anything to be worried about whatsoever. Collecting this wave and turret would probably be enough, as uh, Close is not going to be able to uh, get to the next wave all that comfortably with Karis making his way up. And Karis also, I mean, he is level 16 now. Not exactly as uh, monumental an occasion for the rise. And what we also saw in the previous fight that we really, really didn't talk about that much, that in a 5v5, uh, as Mandate now finished for KL, 
I really have been loving the Umbral first, but it's not going to be the case here for the Ash. Um, is that overall, the Sandbox 5v5, while strong, is definitely going to be relying on either Envy or Closer getting a ton of dam damage out, whereas for Bro, it is just about hiding back. If you can see an angle, obviously you can go for it, but with Hannah going for this on hit build and with uh, Morgan as fat as he is, it is actually quite tough as Closer is, I don't think, gonna hit Sexton ju uh, 16 just yet. Getting very, very close and they really need that damage. Arrow comes. Arrow? Oh, not gonna hit anyone. It was going very quickly. Pretty exciting. As Morgan leaps onto a rift walking Cassidy. Therefore, nothing happens whatsoever. Inner turret does fall on the bottom side though, and the bro lead only continues to increase. This was not the handshake match that I was expecting. I was expecting I the sandbox to just keep butting their heads really? into the uh, the like the immovable wall. I am a little disappointed. As oh, there we go. Level sixteen. Disappointed in sandbox. I'm not disappointed in Brion. This is who they are. No, no, no. Seatbelts are on. This is this is true. this is what they do. Mm -hmm. This is their identity. They will never stray away from this, and and we love them for it. We absolutely do. Teleport's going to come forward. Closer is going to rift walk, and then he remembers which game he's in, and he walks back one more time. Twenty seconds till the Mountain Drake. That'll be Mountain Salt Point for Bro. It'll also be a second mountain for Live Sandbox. The more they can stack, the more they can continue to do basically nothing and ignore Bro for the entirety of the game. Hey, they're about to hit. Lord Dominix on Envy. That's a big spike. True. They can also give up this dragon if they don't want to fight. They don't have a lot of control here in terms of vision. Giving and up an objective? There we go. Don't mind if I do. As instead, they are moving down. They are going to give up the objective, but is there going to be some sort of fight that happens afterwards? It's closer. Rune Prison. What are prisons uh, able to be given out here by Bro as the hook's going to connect there onto Envy. Death Charge comes through, but Paranoia is going to deny any vision. Oh, I was a little worried that we were actually going to have some action, but... I know. Fortunately... Bro, bro, like, they saw the lights go out, and they're like, oh, sorry, sorry, yes. No, of course. Um, let's continue to take things slow. But the position for Sandbox, we're, we're joking around a lot, but it's pretty bad. Uh, with how aggressive Bro have been moving around as a five-man unit, Sandbox haven't really found anyone in a sideline, for example, which is why the Nocturne can really shine. And they're straight up 5v5. I think they're a little bit worried about after what happened in the previous game. Also, Closer, even though he has it, the experience breakpoint in terms of items, isn't really accelerated, isn't really quite there yet. And really like the ultimate from, uh, from Willow here, because if he doesn't use that, I wouldn't be surprised if Bro is actually able to hard engage on top of Envy there, who did have to use both his heal and his flash. Big cooldown now going for the Saber, did pick up the Lord Dominic, so at the very least should be able to chew through the front line of Bro a little bit more, but for Sandbox, dealing with this Jax is actually very hard. The only one who really can do that reliably is Closer, and... And Jax now has a wit's end. Yeah, that's what I was... What's I would get, what I was getting into. He yeah. has my ability to speak is slowly deteriorating <laughs> as, is, uh, as, right. as time atrophies and we get closer and closer to whatever is going to be the eventual conclusion of this game. Yeah. No one knows. That's the grand mystery that is Bro versus Live Sandbox and why the on our Saturday. Sandbox have been so aggressive. I know, but this is what happens when you're faced with the daunting task of fighting against Bro. As effort, gonna find Envy once again. Oh, the shield and the combo is beautiful. The Sivir not allowed to play the game. I remember what Nautilus is supposed to do. You press all of your CC buttons on stuff. Beautifully done, Bro. Four versus five now, capable of heading towards the Baron. What can Live Sandbox do about it? Oh, do you think they're still taking a risk here? Willer is alive. Turning here is a good call. Well, Hook is going to go entirely wide for the moment, but Effort, if they wait just a little while longer, is uh, going to have it back available yet again. Bertle goes down, and he's supposed to be a tank. Willer dives into the pit. Can he steal it? The answer's no. 
as will uh, no, he's still in there, he's still alive, but he's going to die regardless. It was Closer that fell down before, and Bro have just been snowballing extremely slowly. You know, this is like you're watching a snowball, an avalanche or something, come down the mountain, but it's in about 0.6 frames per second or frames per minute. And so it is moving, but you just don't even know until your Nexus is covered in the Avalanche or Snow or Giant Snowball or whatever this is. Because Pro are gonna win this game, Chronicler. And Kyle is gonna get hooked and he's dead. Yep. Yep, 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 yep. Um, you may not like it, but No, 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 Atlas. No, don't finish that sentence. Don't you dare. No, no, it's actually, it, it wouldn't be correct anyway, because you always like it. It's bro. As, unfortunately for Envy, uh, walks way too close to a Nautilus. That type of positioning as Sivir can't afford. If Kyle goes down, you can maybe find an angle in this fight. Sivir's damage is extremely important to this composition actually functioning, so... Uh, very nicely done by Bro, as, as per usual, oh. I, yeah, it's very close. I really like their target selection, I like their 5v5 team fights. This is what they excel at, this is what they've done for the last, I want to say, two years. Uh, and the game, effectively, at this point, should be over. Uh, the only way that you lose from here on out is if Envy somehow gets to an Infinity Edge, which he shouldn't be allowed to and then is able to just auto for an entire fight. But like, look at the gold lead. Soul spawning in 20 seconds, so this should be the... Ooh, stopwatch check zero. as well, Chronicler. There are four unbroken stopwatches. Pristine ability to tell the time here on the side of Bro. As close as gonna get hooked, there's the death charge. He's in the bouncy castle as Willa dives into the back, back line and explodes! Multiple people just breaking their watches on the ground. And bro, they don't need them because they know exactly what time it is. It is time to destroy the Nexus of Live Sandbox and head towards game number two of this series. Well, I mean, it's not time right now. It's not, but it's soon going to be time. There's another hook is going to connect. And uh, Bertle is Cassante. It's almost time. The time almost. is... It's coming up. Well, uh, Will are spawning, so maybe we should back up and get Soul, right? Yeah. That, yeah, okay. Um, Hook is going to connect as Cassante is dead. Morgan diving forward. Envy. Spell Shield is going to be there, and I think with that kill, it is now time. Bro have told us it's time, and the Nexus goes down. Bro wins game number one, and I don't think anyone really doubted it. Not a shred of doubt in any second of that game. It might not be the high octane League of Legends you watch the LCK for, but it definitely is what you want if you are a bro lever. Game number one taken here. That took a lot of my sanity, I think. Um, that game, because I think it's, it's the comparison between well, it's, it's <laughs> the amount of anxiety experienced in our previous series to the amount of not a whole lot of action um, during this one, both of these teams pretty happy to sit back and scale, sit back and scale. You know how after a big workout you need to stretch and do a cooling down? Yeah, yeah, We're yeah. We're not cooling down. We went straight to the couch, we put on some <laughs> Netflix, and we're lounging. And the whiplash is uh, driving us a little insane here for Sandbox. I was envisioning their draft to at least be able to either apply more pressure in side lane. I think they kind of defaulted to trying to 5v5 against a team that does so very, very well. That combined with the positioning mistakes of Envy made the fights really, really tough. And that's really all there was to it. Uh, yeah. A couple of really nice hooks from Effort and Umpty. And maybe just we just keep... Everyone else can play their fun things. Just keep putting Effort on engage reports. That's... That's I mean, what it's, he always it's, did. It's efforts Nautilus, right? Like, this is uh, it's a tried and true strategy. Uh, a tale as old as time. Who cares what the meta is, really? Let's just uh, continue to put him on those because it's working out. We are going to go to a short break when we get back. The space in game number two.
이거 불 얼려줄게 얼려줄게 카라디 한번 때려봐 아메 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 아직 안 끝났다 얘들아 집중해라 아 드랩할게 나궁 20초고 이번에 빠졌고. 얘들아 탑타워 치자 탑타워 아 위에 웨이브 웨이브가 넣어도 끝나 얘들아 얘들아 아래 오긴 했어 우리 웨이브가 넣어도 끝나 아 대충 애매하다 이거 용하는 거 같아 기다려 아니야 바텀 웨이브 바텀 웨이브 있어 바론 15초 남았고 우리 이거 아 용으로 가자 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 용으로 나이스 
Hello and welcome back to The Space. It's me, Valdez, with Wolf, and the bros did it in the end. It took a little while, uh, but they did eventually get there. We had a bit of a slower game. We had a late first blood, but bro was able to take it uh, eventually. Wolf. Yeah, it was really a very slow-paced game, but let's take a look at the draft because this is really important in this game. The cast and pick in its own right, left to its own devices, should be able to help carry this late game. You have the Nocturne, so the Jax, even if ahead, can be shut down fairly easily by this draft here for Live Sandbox. And you have a Super Ash. You have non-stop engage conditions from long range to shut down side laning. You have a great team fighting 5v5 comp. But every fight they took was wrong at the wrong times, at the wrong places, the setup was bad. And this is a, an example of sometimes at this level, the draft doesn't matter as much as the skill on the day, the positioning and how those fights go. Because if you can't use your win conditions, doesn't matter how fed Cassidy is, doesn't matter he's level 16 with his Rod of Ages Seraph's build, doesn't matter because there's so much CC in uh, the composition here of Breon, and they utilized it very well in a lot of those mid-game fights and just shut the Kassadin down over and over and over again. We definitely liked, on paper, their draft way more for Live Sandbox. Didn't like the Nautilus pick very much, but the way that they used it is was the problem more than the draft itself. Yeah, absolutely. I think there were a lot of fights in the mid-game that Bro actually navigated really well. They took it very slowly. It's very Bro-esque, and they used the power of friendship to get there. Let's take a look at replay number one, and this is really where it all got started. By the way, this is the first kill in the game. This happens at about 19 and a half minutes. And you can see Breon are super disjointed at the start of this fight, like a flash in during a retreat. Everything is confused here until Morgan shows up. And Morgan comes in here and does a ton of damage, picks up multiple kills here, and basically 1v4s this fight while the Sandbox target selection is everywhere. Trying to chase Umpty, not sure if we're gonna kill the Jax. What's his Counter-Strike cooldown? Nobody's really communicating, and Jax picks up tons of money here for the Rise as well. And at this moment in time, uh-oh, now we got a fed Jax. Now we got a big problem here. We got a Rise that's online. As this is the latest first blood of this season so far. And uh, the critical fight here that I think Liv Sandbox, oddly enough, tried to force tried to force a pick. They were all over the place in how they fought. And actually, this was we, you and I were watching this game, we're like, shouldn't bro fight soon? You yeah, know, and the Kassadin's getting online. It's a silver comp. They should probably do something. And the Liv Sandbox brought the fight to them, messed it up, and then lost control of the game. I don't think there was any big reason for them to really force that fight. I think you get a couple of summoners out, you take the objective, which is what they were looking for, instead of diving that deep into the enemy jungle. And still, there was like an opportunity for them to maybe take. But as you mentioned, the execution in the fight was off, and they didn't have to do it in the first place. So definitely a bit of a question mark there. And we can take a look at highlight number two as well, which was towards the end of the game, where, you know, if you've got enough CC, the Sivir can't get away from all of it. Yeah, I mean, Spell Shield, you only have one, right? Same, of course, with the Nocturne, but he's not your target. And you have, it's crazy that they have two Spell Shields in this comp, plus the uh, Kassadin. That's so difficult to lock down, so difficult to kill. But as you'll watch in this fight, Closer's trying to empower his ultimate. He's not committing in, he just wants to stack those up here so that he can actually hopefully carry the later parts of this. But by the time he actually gets that R stacked up, they don't have any positional advantage here. They don't have an AD carry. And it's just a complete zoning here. And when the commitment from Willer comes in for the steal, sorry, it ain't K2 Rollster this time. <laughs> <laughs> Oof. Uh, yeah, true. Very true. And uh, yeah, it was pretty much the game from there because they were able to push on in. And you may have wondered, you know, you're watching that game. Maybe you're a Lift Sandbox fan. Maybe you're a Kassan and Sivir fan. And you're like, well, it's 31 minutes into the game. Why is this comp not working? Like they hit level 16. We did the whole, you know, Twitch chat meme, I'm sure, where there's like, oh my God, it's about to hit level 16. But then they got all of those kind of win conditions and yet they still weren't able to win those fights. Why do you think that was? I mean, I think the main reason was like they, Breon set up so many picks, right? And they were constantly threatening the Sivir, constantly threatening the Nocturne. They couldn't side lane because they had a Cassante in their draft. So they couldn't force Breon into positions where they had to take an uncomfortable fight or they weren't set up. I think part of this is also forgetting that Nautilus exists as a champion and actually has a lot of CC because it's been so enchanter focused. It's been, let me protect the AD carry. This time it's, let me kill the enemy AD carry and let yeah. me find those opportunities. Also, the second Kassadin jumps in, it's Nautilus with seven CCs and you've 
got Sejuani there and also Rise, who's gonna root you, you know, like, you can only do so much. The cast has never got the split push. And if he was ever jumping into a fight, like, I don't know, maybe I, I guess their top laner should have just gone all in with the Cassante or something like that because uh, didn't see too much of that. It was just a lot of fights from behind for Liv Sandbox. And I think Liv Sandbox need to maybe take a step down back towards something a little bit simpler going into game two for the draft because this draft definitely possible to work, but based on the execution we saw here, I want to see maybe a little bit more of a tempo-based game for them. Play to your strengths, play to your early game. Don't just sit back and scale against a team that's so good on objective team fights like Bro. Absolutely. Don't play Bro's game if you want to win against them. Umpty is going to get the POG here. 0-0-9 and... 90% kill this what, what can you say? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> I mean it, this fight, is this even an umpty highlight? <laughs> he baited him. <laughs> Give it to him, you know? <laughs> I mean, the knockup here he is survived really good. real well. Um, but yeah, this is this is actually a Morgan highlight after they all come in on umpty, so I guess we can give it to him. I think this is going to be a split vote. <laughs> I, that, was I, the end. that was the end of the highlight. Yeah, he did because he, but I mean, run. he killed the 80 carry, which won them the game. So I think this is going to be a split vote. Like I said, this might fight. Uh, he did. He did win that as well. There was a little bit early. Um, <laughs> Look, this nice. was a this was a game that Liv Sandbox lost more than Brian won. <laughs> I think in a lot of ways. Four out of eleven, and media votes for three on Umpty. I don't know what else to say. He I blocked think. the Willer steal. I think that's <laughs> all I have to say, guys. Um, either way, let's jump to game two and the casters for the next one. Well, Twitch chat, you know exactly uh, what to do about that one. I think. Uh, the Lord was robbed, and effort was also robbed. Uh, yeah, either of both those of them would have been fine with. Would have been a little bit of, uh, you know, a, a slightly uh, improved option. That being said, as we saw in that highlight, Umpty survived real good um, in well, the first fight of the game. Hey. He then smote a spell shield so that he could ult the Sivir. When in doubt, vote Umpty. That's true. And that's just how it works. Th th those are the strategies as... Sometimes the general just needs some votes for shot calling, you know? <laughs> He's given the votes for the shot calling. I think that's what media were thinking. So, going into game number two, Atlas, I have been giving it some serious thought, and I have a ton... Run it back, I ...silly reckon. subjects that we... Oh, oh okay, good, good, good. ...completely good. different page. Uh, some silly subjects that we collectively can discuss while nothing is happening. So, I will get back to you with those. Fantastic. As soon as we are out of the draft to make sure that we can maintain the high level of entertainment that you at home are expecting from the LCK. I hope you crowdsourced them from the Chronicle Discord. I did not. Oh. No, no. I, I actually put in a lot of work on these myself. Oh, wow. And I, I know you're going to love a lot of them. I'm very excited about this. Yeah. Well, so, Rise is going to be banned. So we pick Varus. Uh huh. And then we're going to pick Ash, but we're not going to pick Saver because that didn't quite work out. Is and it Ash Caitlyn time? Ashheimer, I would love. Ashheimer sounds fine. Ash Caitlyn is tougher to me because, as much as Caitlyn to me is a ban that needs to be thrown if the enemy plays Caitlyn or if the enemy support plays Caitlyn because you're playing against Caria, you do not necessarily need to ban Caitlyn if you're not sure the team is good enough. Because we have actually seen the Caitlyn kind of fall apart much more so than a lot of other AD carries because there is actually a certain skill involved with executing the pick both on an individual and on a team level. So Caitlyn, to me, makes it through the drafts, makes a little bit more sense to me as that would be Ooh, the completely The Lord's alive. Crocodile. With Bro. Bro is just going to pick what Bro wants. And in this case, it is a... Oh, just do it, Umpty. No. Don't be scared. Y yes. Yes, be scared. Don't be scared. You can leave your friends behind. Okay, much better. On board with this. All right. No, it's basically the same thing, but better. Definitely better, yeah. And is not on a, in a happy space at the moment. Watch, and watch Liv Sandbox feel like they have to ban Nautilus. Ooh, I am also unsure as to what Liv Sandbox is going to pick here, because this is very clearly signaling top dive. I like this a lot, actually. Just picking up the Heimerdinger, to me, that is a very good lane no matter what you end up with. It also means that the short range composition that Bro is clearly opting into is going to have a pretty unfun time. 
Does mean that Birdle's job on top might become not nearly as fun, but Umti playing heavily towards topside isn't something that Bro is known for. And I wonder whether it's going to allow them to still play their usual playstyle, because Elise, much more so than the Sejuani, requires you to get early action going, as we're just going to ban Leona and Nautilus, aren't we? I think that is. Um, I don't think you need to ban happen. Nautilus because you have Heimerdinger, but yeah, we'll see what ends up happening. Well, Kali and Cassidy are probably going to be banned. Um, there's the Nort that we were talking about. Effort is 100% playing Soraka this game. Don't you mean Alistair? Sorry, yes, Alistair, that's what I meant. Or he brings back the Kench. Oh my goodness. Barris Kench? Wow, that is, that is a lane. That's Abhorn into Heimerding. Don't do that. That's that sounds not, I, really, kidding. really. I have, fun. I have lost it a little bit, so I apologize for all the. I'm, uh, air I'm trying to work out show. whether I had it at all in the first place. That's uh, that's. Well, we I'm we added in the first series. I know that as the Azir is very much in line with what Sandbox or Closure particularly likes to play. Gives you a lot of team fighting power. And additionally, you have already seen Yone. that Azir, or sorry, uh, Cassidy, Akali, and Silas are all banned. Those are very often answers into the... Oh god, it's going to be Victor, isn't it? No, I, need, I, I want it to be Yone. I want Karis to Yone it. I mean, I knew that was going to happen. Effort. How? Just do it. Don't be Why? scared. <laughs> Don't be scared. Can, I, can we can we get back to that? What? The Soraka? Yeah. Oh, it's the most obvious pick. If you've been uh if you've been dialed in to the way of the bro, like, like I have, okay. then you would definitely know. This makes me less excited than Yone. Um, also is something quite easily divided via the Emperor. But I believe Twitch chat has also dubbed Hannah the Emperor, Emperor, and so maybe it is his divide that they have to worry about in this game. As this is a pick composition, Chronicle, this uh, this comp certainly it's does pick and champions pretty well. Ooh, love the Fiora here. And for Sandbox, you are staring down some scary, scary pressure in that Elise and Renekton, but overall the bro comp to me, don't think it works that well together, right? The value of Merc Frets is going to be extremely high here. Once Wheeler picks those up, gonna be able to fight pretty reliably. Even wouldn't mind it if Birdle picks them up as well, right? I, I, I do really think that a lot of the impact of the topside 3v3, which is what, in my expectation, Bro is gonna play towards, uh, should be manageable for Sandbox once they get post six, once they can get a back in. And then on the bot side of the map, that's a big problem because Omti is going to have to cover while also wanting to play towards a Renekton lane. But if you don't cover your bot side, I think Varus and Soraka is going to have a pretty bad time into arguably the most oppressive lane that we have. I say arguably because Caria has truly unleashed a Pandora's box that I don't really want to get into in this game, but it means that that might not be the most oppressive lane anymore, but it was before, and it works. Yes. I'm uh, also very interested. I have a feeling that Umpty's just not going to go top lane. I think he's just going to live bottom lane. I just, I, I could see Morgan staying on an island as a crocodile for the entirety of this game. I could see that. I don't think that that's something that uh, that we necessarily uh, shouldn't expect from this one. Don't know how to feel about it. Don't know if it's good. But I just think that uh, Bro do things their own way. And we'll see whether that's going to lead them to a 2-0 victory. Would you say they, go, they always go their own way? Yeah. Mm. Yeah, yeah. I like that song a lot. Now it's stuck in my head. Great now, album. That's yeah. what, that, that was the goal. Yeah. We can, uh, we can think about that as we hop into the game. Um, so was Fleetwood Mac on your list of things to discuss? No, but I'm definitely open to it. 
They um they definitely performed for an extraordinary amount of years. Oh, oh, Envy. Oh, that's that's Comet Ash. Oh. <laughs> oh. Good luck, Hannah and Effort. I personally would much prefer, because I'm worried that this is going to be a straight up like mandate ash, which I really hope it isn't. There is a couple of different iterations you can go with Comet. We've seen some other variations. You just do Lethality awesome Ash, right? You can, yeah. And that's what I hope it is. But I have also seen ash, Ashes with Comet go Mandate in this scenario, which would make your bot side extremely AP heavy. And the poke also not nearly as good into a Soraka and also going for the Comet. But just a lot of Comets being thrown yeah. around here on Summoner's Rift. Entire bot half of Sandbox is rocking one. Yeah, there's a fair bit of electrocution going on oh, in uh, some scorching. the scorching mid lane. Yeah. Ooh, you were scorching hard. Yeah, I think um, when you're in a game like this, the bro exists in. I mean, I don't know whether Scorch is the greatest, even though it did get a, a buff and things like that. Like, you just know that you're going to be scaling. So topics. Yeah, silly topics. All right. To start off with, Ooh, if six losses in a row for Zindra, not great. Every team in the LCK uh -huh. was an animal. Ooh, okay. Which animal would they be? Well, Genji would be a tiger. Easy. All right. I uh, have one. T1 would be a dragon. T1 would S be a dragon? Selfish. Yeah, well, that's their... Yeah, yeah, okay. I feel like those two are kind of set in stone. What would grow be? A turtle. We have already discussed this. Have we? Have we not? Did we not do the whole... What's up with Veldas? I don't know. Everything blends together. I think it was with Veldas, actually. We talked about what Turling is, yesterday. Is, what is the most majestic animal possible? As Morgan is in a bit of trouble here, and he's dead. That's Willa picking up first blood. And we mentioned whether or not uh, Umpty would be heading top lane. We didn't talk about Willa. And Willa is definitely going top lane. He's killed the crocodile, man. Yeah. Just took him down. Morgan at the very least going to be able to teleport himself back to the lane, so we'll be able to pick up the wave here. Very nicely done. Just straight up clearing the top side into an early gank. Morgan still level one here. Not sure what happened in terms of uh, him being zoned out by Brutal. Obviously, Fiora level one is really strong with the grasp, so well done there. Yeah, Gro Ghost and Grasp Fiora level one is kind of a menace. And the cold pickup as well from Brutal. Much better Looking start. Looking pretty here. good. So. Back to animals. Yeah, so I think um, I think we can we can go with turtle. What about live sandbox though? Well, previous to this game, I was thinking like a cheetah. Ah, yeah. But maybe they're not a cheetah because the the last game was not fast. Yeah. So maybe they're a house cat. House cat. You know, they can show their they can show their claws. They can really surprise you with their ferocity, but... And they never tell you what... They never do what you tell them to do. Yeah. When you want one thing, they do another. Yeah. Uh, actually, I really like that. I really respect that. I think that's a good one. Okay. As Brutal is on the receiving end of Renekton and Elise. Well, let's see how the uh, Repost minigame is going to go. And pretty well for Brutal, as it turns out. Morgan doing his yeah, best to zone Ooh. where he can. Say, can just loop back. Humpty still has Cocoon, but Wheeler is on his way. Yeah, let's see how the 2v2 is going to go as Willa moves over. They know exactly what's going on. Can they actually make this work? They don't need to. Yeah, or they just uh, yeah. <laughs> allow it to happen. Okay, fair enough. So uh, we currently have Morgan with a slight CS advantage. The wave in a pretty good spot for Bertle. And Willop making his way back towards his Rod Cam. Interesting. Well, still, the first blood going over to Willa will allow Liv Sandbox to have a bit of control in this game as Closer taking a bit of damage. Karis here, but not too much to be worried about right now. So back to animals? Yeah, so who else do we have to deal with? Um, we've got Derex. And D plus gear. Let's do um, both of those. Now, there are a lot of animals on D plus gear, you know, yes. that uh, the team is represented by. I like an owl. Ooh. Because, you know, they're. They're a wise team. They've been around for a while. Okay. Umpty is. 
Doctor's going to skitter away as best he can. Closer goes on a bit of a ride, but otherwise isn't going to find too much. As Kyle, back down towards his bottom side, is empty. Never mind. He can uh, just repel to the Blast Cone, and he'll be absolutely A-OK. -okay. Smiting the Krogs as well. He'll be all right. So, as the dust settles, too much to worry about. Willer is going to find Henna just walking towards him, though. Heal to come down from effort. So therefore, all is fine. As that is a flash forward from Morgan. Slice, where's the dice? There it is. He doesn't even need it. He just culls the meek. And that's Morgan getting one back. That's a solo kill. Solo bolo for the Lord. Even despite the attention paid towards the top side of the map, Renekton still a menace when he gets to play his own game. Only a call there for Brodel. Not the combat power that you're looking for. It wasn't six just yet, so no chance of fighting back as he was used by effort. Yeah. And now Umpty's going to move on in. That's a nice little cocoon. Gets a cleanse out of Envy. Voltar Spidling just to do a bit of damage, send a message. Henna going to have his CS ruined by effort there just momentarily, but... Looks like they're getting corralled as oh dear, Kyle on the wrong side of this one. He's just going to back away towards the turret. And by the turret, I mean Kyle's turret. And everything is going to be fine. I was afraid we were going to have some action. Yeah, Fortunately, I know. Fortunately, oh, not the case. There are the Merc Frets here for Willer. Early pickup, very strong. But despite the top lane shenanigans and Willer getting an early kill, Looks like we will be seeing the first Drake go over to Grion here. Yep, all things must remain up. Oh, there we go. It is Ravenous Hydra first here for Envy. Okay, it's pretty cool. So a little bit of a different idea. Not going to go for that mandate, which we're pretty happy about. Oh, yeah. Well, that'll do it. Final minion, Morgan hit six. And there is no way that you ever get out of there, unfortunately, for Birdle. Ghost also not going to do anything in that specific scenario. And overall, very important kill, I do think, because if Birdle can just take control over of this game, it becomes really hard to play for Bro. And they need the pressure point from this top side, as might be having a fight here is four versus four. Yeah, Birdle moves down as well. Kyle already set up. Cocoon connects. Too much going to come from it. There's Karras and Effort off to the side. Glacial Prison going to go wide here. And there's the Emperor's Divide. Sweeps in the Crocodile. The Dominus almost gets something done, but not enough as Umpty. He's going to steal away the Rift Herald, and he makes it out. They have to trade it for their Crocodile, and they don't get to pick up the eye. That was pretty cool. Overall, making the best out of a kind of awkward situation there. But I do have to say, with this type of composition, I do think as bro, you're looking to win that, right? You have your Renekton and Elise. If you can pick someone off, you can blow them up in a single rotation. That doesn't happen denying the Herald is big, but giving over a kill to Kyle is going to make the Heimerdinger even more obnoxious, going to accelerate that early Rylize. Because fortunately there is a giant belt built, so I don't have to yep. look at another rocket okay, belt Heimerdinger. It's not life. We're uh, safe. Life, big fan of the rock belt. As I actually agree. I think with Bro that you want to try and go for a player, but it almost goes all right. I really want to highlight that if Morgan lives there for another second and gets an empowered Q of amid multiple people, Sandbox are in pretty deep trouble. Oh uh, yeah. And the healing from effort might be enough. The burst that Karas and Umti have available could kind of push him over the top, but he just gets 100 to zero. Very nice scoop there from Closer. And as a result, Gold gonna stay pretty much even nonetheless, and without a possible Herald for Sandbox, they're not really gonna find a way right now to accelerate. It's Willow. Lying in wait, Let's see whether Morgan bites no off ultimate. more than he can chew, despite the massive size of his jaws. I believe that is still possible. His arrow just narrowly <laughs> going to miss Karis there. Love the crowd reaction there. Yeah, that was really good. It makes it so much better. Willer is being very, very patient as the Winter's Wrath doesn't find the target. And his patience is going to remain unrewarded. Um, to meanwhile, going to be clearing his bot side camps. Might be looking for an invade here. They do have priority towards the bot side of the map, and 
Kyle also going to go for a back, so now Rion can move in. Also, do note that in any fertile all ins, effort now is a wish available. Meaning that you need to be a lot more careful. Oh, Anna getting the ultimate going. Yeah, this is a, a lot of damage. Just a serrated Dirk, and already this Varus is very frightening. And remember, this is one of the picks that Henna has always been pretty good at, to be perfectly honest. Even when we weren't saying all that many good things about Henna's play uh, in previous years, his Varus is always something that Bro has been able to stand behind. As, all right, Karis decides that it is now time for him to take this, and Umpty is going to be able to give it to him. Very nicely done. Overall, nice invade there. Played for Henna as well. We'll pick that up. And Bro, really spiking in the mid game here. Now for Sandbox, that's not the end of the world. Their composition this time around has two very, very strong characters in the Fiora and the Azea, but I gotta say, Brutal's play thus far has not really inspired me to believe in a Lift Sandbox, uh, Lift Sandbox split push win condition. So, in that case, it's gonna go down uh, to team fights, and that is actually where I do think that this time around there is an edge for Lift Sandbox, based on what we've seen already. Yep. Um, as Envy is probably dead. Does have flash does. and cleanse. Yeah, he does at least have cleanse available. Cocoon would have hit him if there wasn't a minion there, and he's just gonna take a trillion damage and die. That's a solo bolo. That is indeed a solo bolo. That is also zero summoner spells invested. I think Envy was pretty well aware that he was super dead. As, all right, stun is going to be mitigated. Very nicely done with the repost. Uh, not too much to worry about as far as top lanes are concerned. 17 CS lead for Morgan. And that uh, may continue to be a fun time for a little bit longer here for the Renekton. Getting towards that Gore Drinker ever so slowly. Is this Cloud Drake still a bit sleepy in the pit? Starting to wake up a few times. I don't think he's got too much to worry about for the next little while. When we're taking objectives as either of these teams, what I have learned is that you must have five people there. Uh, <laughs> so back to animals. Yeah, so... Um, Al for D+. Plus. I feel Al like they... Plus, yep. Oh. All right, Glacial Prison. Okay. Going to miss Karis. We're good. Much We're good. like the arrow was, um, Freljordian skill shots are difficult to hit onto uh, the Syndra. I think there's a lore reason um, for that to occur. What is DRX? Yeah, I'm trying to work out what DRX would be. They're not a crocodile. Um, what is the most anime animal? As the flash does come through, don't know whether that would have hit, but uh, still not going to take the risk. There is Karis. There's Kyle. Not going to find the grenade either. So, we have Chemtech Rift. Someone tell Valdez. He's going to be very excited about these blast cones um, operating at double power. He really likes them. In fact, if you ever have a chance to have a chat to Valdez, just um, just ask him about how much he loves um, empowered blast cones. Huge fan. The biggest. Mm. Yeah. Believe Atlas here. Yeah. Definitely trust him. Yeah. Yeah. Valdez will let you know on the space after this. Um, he really advocates for uh, having every they, rift. They have a bad a, uh, rift. Yeah. I don't know why. Doran uh, is going to get stunned up there by the Ruthless Predator, but Morgan will let him go for now. He's a benevolent lord. All right. Um, so, yeah, what is the most anime animal? Don't have an answer to that one. I'd say a cat, but we already have a house cat, so we can't have two. No. Cats? Not too worried as Willer is thinking about coming in. There is the, uh, okay, they're wondering who's going to do it. Who's going to do it? It's actually going to reset the impatience of this lady. Not another Blast Cone available. Willer can get over the wall, but Umpty, I love it. You know, just stands his ground. All right, Arrow soaring towards the Syndra once again. This time he nails it. And Closer has got the ult. Um, Karis is just going to walk towards his turret, however. And... Seems as though. Yeah, I uh, will be. Okay. Might still be Wish is available, though, as Orc. Yeah. Scale, but nice sidesteps and reinforcements are there. 
Oh, there we so, go. I mean, the reinforcement is a lone Soraka for the moment. Yeah, but maybe yeah, it's right. fine. Yeah, mid laner in support. I guess we're all things equal. It's fine. So we're just going to chill underneath the turret. Um, flash unavailable here for Karis. Closer has his, but he's just going to let him live for now. Still haven't figured out what the most anime animal is. No. No, it's tough. Don't really know it. Maybe, um... Maybe a raccoon. A raccoon? That's Nongshim. That has to be Nongshim, doesn't it? Yeah. Well, like... Uh, is it though? No, because that's actually... Oh, wait. No, that is a Nongshim brand, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, the Nogari they, they, they have uh, They have the, the raccoons on, on many of their things. No, Nongshim yeah. is easy. Yeah. Saving that one up. Dang. A fox! A fox? There we go. Oh. A nine-tailed fox. There we go. That's that's pretty handy. So that's DRX. All right, that's DRX. A nine-tailed fox. Yeah, purely okay. because of Feral. What's KT? Oh, God. Um, they uh, Like a, a bird of prey. Like a hawk. Because they go up very fast. And then they go down even faster. Yeah, or like a... Um, yeah, like a cormorant. You know, one of those birds that really does nose like dive eagle. real hard. Yeah. Yeah, I think that, that sounds about right. One of those ocean birds. As, all right, Vaporeon hanging out outside of the grass. Morgan can't see that one, of course. As, all right, there we go. He's going to flash. I don't know whether he activated his dice he did. And that means that he's A-OK. -okay. He's going to take that damage for fun. He's Morgan. He likes to test himself. He doesn't care. No, he doesn't. Now, bro, one minute until Soul Point. The extraordinarily valuable Chemtech Soul. And actually, I think denying it, you get a bit of tenacity, don't you? From um, grabbing Chemtech Drakes and you stuff. You do, yeah. Get tenacity so, and you get heal and shield power. And I think that uh, getting that as a Soraka composition, you're pretty happy. Denying that from your opposition when you have so many of these forms of single target pick CC. I think you're pretty psyched about um, I trying to collect both of these dragons. Keep waiting for Sandbox to go and do stuff. And it just, it's so weird because, oh, there we go. Yeah, Emperor's Divide, that is going to throw away the spider. The flash comes in, Will is going to follow him immediately. Wish comes down, but it's not enough to save him. And now Bertle is running for effort here. Can he find the Soraka is the question. The answer is yes, but not enough as Morgan He's not phased. Hannah, not phased. Just gonna take down the top outer turret. Hannah now getting to work in this mid lane as well. As the Drake is spawning in five seconds time. Umpty spawning in seven seconds time. Yeah, if they don't TP closer to the top, they're just gonna give up. And out of turret and first turret blood for... Uh oh. Oh. Uh... <laughs> An outer turret and first turret blood for a Drake, which individual Drake, even as you point out, I do think the denial is quite nice. Not necessarily going to be the most worth it. As if I think Morgan if paused fought. the game because he didn't have an opponent. He's like, where's where's Bertle? Is he coming back? Not uh, entirely sure, but we can see that uh, Morgan is out of the game yeah. uh, for now. So something has happened. We'll let you know exactly what that is as soon as we have any word on it. Uh, he's having a giggle, though. Still fine. His uh, client got DC'd. <laughs> of course it's in this series. <laughs> <laughs> couldn't take all the action that was thrown. Yeah, in. I think so. As hopefully we'll just be able to reconnect and get back into game shortly. And then Morgan can continue taking himself a nice top turret. Yeah, the client will be... Uh, Resuming relatively soon. This one, thankfully, is uh, pretty easy to get back into as we are missing a lot of action. It's been high-octane League of Legends thus far. In fact, in our last series, um, we wouldn't have Aww. had First Blood. But uh, these are, yeah, the Live Sandbox uh, Challenger players. Welcome, welcome. Making sure they check out what's going on. Supporting, of course, former teammates and things like that. Pretty cool to see. We'll also, um, if you do want to check out Live Sandbox and how they do in Challenger, Monday and Tuesday are your days to do that. LCK CL Global 2023 is the Twitch if channel. You're, if you're loving the high quality commentary that you're getting right now, well, let me tell you, we are 
So obviously tomorrow there's OCK, but then on Monday Atlas and I are casting free best of three in a we row. Are. We're hoping yeah. for, we haven't had the nine game dream yet. No. We had seven on our first Monday, and then uh, I believe there were seven on the next Monday. We So we could really go the distance. We're going to be working seven days in a row. Seven days That's in a row. That's my and first then time ever. Potentially nine games in a row on one day. Yeah. That would well, I've be, done that one before. That's the climax. That's the way you can... And I used I used to do it as well. We uh, we, we casted a lot of games back in, uh, you know, 2015 LPL and stuff like that. It's just a lot of video games. Um, don't recommend it. Um, but we uh, we do what, what we must, you know. Back in the game. Yeah, here we go. As Arrow will connect. Glacial Prison will connect. The follow-up will not. And uh, the tower will go down. Bertle getting to work here towards this bottom side. And I feel like in game number one, I was expecting things to happen after abilities landed. But thankfully, I think I've um, <laughs> I've done well You've reset transitioning your away from that. Yeah. Actually, really nice flash down from Miller. Sucks up that kill very nicely. That arrow, if it hits effort, uh, they kill him. Which would have been great. Now they don't. Um, if you're wondering why we're losing, I swear it's not just because of the fact that we're working this much, but we also just came off. And if you if you are a true believer, you might not even have watched that game. If you're a Live Sandbox fan, I I, I, I get it. I know. Um, you might not even have seen that series. It was very high octane. All our energy went into that, and we oh, had I've, to. I've seen had heaps of energy, but I think that actually the way that you have to position yourself uh, is unique for each series that you commentate. <laughs> we and had to save up all our jokes wow. and all our corny yeah. conversations. Absolutely. Because um, we couldn't, couldn't get rid of them in that match. <laughs> we need to hit our quota. Yeah, absolutely. Arrow will sail by, looking beautiful. Emperor's Divide will do the same thing here as Umpty is going to skitter out of this one. Very nicely done there. Um, yeah. some, uh, some R buttons were pressed. Um. <laughs> yeah, I can I can feel myself sinking deeper into the <laughs> abyss, Atlas. Yeah, <laughs> it's not good. Uh. Well, they're, there they're, they're testing the waters. Is there such a thing as too much League of Legends? Absolutely not. No, can't be know. done. Especially not League of Legends esports, and especially there is no such thing as too much bro. And uh, thankfully, there is also no such thing as too much Live Sandbox. Now Willa is going to clear out this control ward. Of course, Karis knows, and he also has his mates coming in. Kyle has a, a full gameplay button that he had to hit there. I believe Henna would have had to flash if he was going to actually kill the Heimerdinger. Kyle did have to flash to get himself out of there. So, slight advantage for Bro, which has kind of been the way of this series so far. And they really are hitting that like two 3k gold comfort zone. Oh, yeah. But, but often that comfort I, zone was them being that amount of gold behind. But now they're yeah. ahead by that amount of gold. Same, same. This must feel so comfortable. <laughs> I don't know. It's still unknown, Atlas. You know, it is true. You, you, you're Untested. For other it. people, it might be comfortable, but bro's still getting out of their comfort zone. It's true. Can be tough. I say as, as Morgan is playing Renekton, so they, they really are not. They really are very, very comfortable. Just yeah, this is uh, also Friday. Karis on his Syndra at the same time, and Henna on his Varus. So as far as like the carries of Bro, Umpty really this is, is the absolute only one. Well, Excuse me, the biggest carry on Bro is Umpty, clearly. I mean that's true, but also I mean effort isn't necessarily on. No, comfort one could say. No, but he is on Soraka. So if you can throw bananas, I think you're just going to be happy. So, so we so have an incredible amount of pick from Bro. Right, we have Cocoon, we have Scatter, we have Varus with his ultimate. We have a possible flank from Morgan. And then on Sandbox, we have the hard engage from both Ash, a stray Heimerdinger stun, a closer, obviously, and Willow. Mm -hmm. Yet, yeah. we are still sitting at five kills. Yeah. 23 minutes in, and I remember how the last one went. So the only thing that makes sense to me is this time around, Lift Sandbox do win. And then we get, we get a third game. I think that that's all we really deserve. <laughs> uh, okay, so uh, what if... Atlas, it's time. Uh -huh, Confession uh -huh. time. What have you done? 
What have I done to deserve this? Like, what did you did you I rescue? Have, I think I just did must you have been really rescue good. Strace? Yeah, I think uh, something did like that. Um, I didn't donate a lot of money to charity. Old Arrow is nah, once again going to look glorious. Is. Ignore it. It's, okay. it's a distraction from your philanthropy. Yeah, no, that's it's true. And yeah, no, I, I have um, you know I I help I help um, you know old old ladies out of cars while I'm walking nice. down the street and stuff Very like friendly. that. Basically, I do everything to deserve the good stuff, and that's why we get games like this. This closer. Gonna find an Emperor's Divide onto Karis here, who's just gonna walk it off. Does still have Flash available. Closer now trying to fight Umpty. It's not necessarily working, but Bertle making his way up. This oh, could be nice. a 5v5. Exactly right. Wish is still at the ready, guys. Things could get even better for Bro in this team fight as far as recovery is concerned. And there is the Dark Sphere. Ooh, that is gorgeous. Another arrow. This time it's going to land onto Effort, who heals. Still holding on to the ulti as Bro will slowly and methodically move towards Soul Point. It's all calculated, Atlas. Oh, yeah. But they, their health bars are low, and Dominus is timing out. So... Now Close can get prey on the wave. Ultimate's coming back up soon. Ooh, Bertle, this is a juicy flank that he's down know. here. Willa going down relatively low as Henna. A little bit split from the team. Effort you know. is going to find Bertle. Going to start healing up the rest of the team now as well. Remember, he is in a little bit of trouble, but he oh. just keeps healing and healing Closer. after hitting Bertle with his Q Closer over and over again. Wasn't able to. Teleport available. Drake resetting. Ultimate also there. We've been fighting over this Drake for about a minute now, Atlas. We have indeed. Effort. Still, game state absolutely the same. Arrow once again going to be avoided, as is Willa's ultimate as well. Umpty diving on top of MV. He's going to flash his way up. Ertl desperately trying to get in there, but he's just unable to. The single target CC is too strong. It's closer. Oh, no. The Empress Divide is good, but everyone's dead. And Bro just keeps everyone alive. Look at these health bars. They're absurdly oh! low, finally. Closer is going to do it as Umpty. He wants to be the hero. He'll find one. And the Soraka lives. Of all targets, the Soraka lives. Closer making sure that everyone at home stays awake. As that was about two minutes of fighting. That, I mean, all of Bro went to about 100 health and I thought they were going to be fine. Because it looks like it were like both hard engage miss, right? And, and then Closer goes in by himself. Uh, Berto is caught amidst five people. And it all looks like a bit of a disaster. Willow also dies at the back of the play. But then Closer recognizes the weakness. <laughs> and his soldiers march on and get themselves a big win here in the end. <laughs> <laughs> Guys, trust me. Guys, trust me. Well, 2 0 and 4. And Closer, of course, no stranger to So now, idea. in my head, Closer has been trying to get stuff to happen the entire game. And it seems like, no, Closer, Closer, don't do it. You're a, you're a daredevil. <laughs> Come on, man. You're too reckless. Calm down. You can't go in like that and Closer. No, guys. Trust me. Well, uh, the arrow is going to hit. As in goes Closer, Emperor's Divide doesn't actually hit onto Karis for the damage. As Morgan, he doesn't want to be on that side of the wall and he's going to flash to get himself back out again. The Phalanx of Bro has been put back together once again, much like Humpty Dumpty from the Nursery Rhyme. And there is the snare onto Closer as well. Willa, the Winter does not have very much wrath. You're going to miss it like that. As Bro will back away. It's also Mandate Ash. Yeah. So the damage from Birdo in particular is actually very important. MR is insanely strong. So glad to see Morgan already pick up a Megatron Cloak. We'd love to see more MR itemization here from Breon. Because even though Envy is obviously still going to do large majority uh, AD damage, it's just not going to be nearly as much as Second Drake now picked up. Ooh, bit of tenacity. Which is actually really good. Yeah. Strong. Uh, I want to reiterate that. Extra tenacity and heal and shield power. Yeah, and uh, Bro didn't look all that interested hey. in taking that Drake whatsoever. Atlas, guess what? Radiant Virtue. Oh, yeah. That's 10% buff on the heal oh, right there. Oh, my goodness. And let's check out this fight one more time. As 
Initially, it looks like the arrow will get followed up on, but Closer not opting into the initial sweep back. And then, unfortunately for everyone involved, no one dies because it is just Pope. Even the arrows, just Pope. As you do actually have a really good Baron here as Sandbox. Heimerdinger does it very well. You should be aware of this right now. Hard to walk up. For yeah. Breon, teleport forced, and you should just disengage here. Oh, Cocoon gonna connect. Willa is able to walk away. That's his strategy, as an arrow is going to connect once again. Glacial Prison comes forward. Some damage. As now Bertle once again looking for that flank angle. Epic caught on the back end. He throws through the wish. He heals himself closer. Finds a massive divide. And now, Umpty, can he stay Wait. alive? Can Morgan stay alive? The answer is yes. And they wipe the floor with them. Oh, closer! It looked so good. It was good. But Cal and Envy are full uh, health. Okay, repel. Umpty will think about you know his decisions in the sky and then come down and say my they decisions were great. They could have been. They could have. They could have been fine. They just didn't have to go into the choke point. They already had won the fight. Karis is addicted to arrows. He loves. He loves getting hit by arrows. Wait, close rest TP. They can stall. I don't know if they have the time though. The poke uh, is not 10 enough. Seconds. Uh, it's just not enough damage. Not gonna work out as Envy and Kyle have to get out of there and Umpty secures the Baron. I don't know whether there was all that much doubt, but now there is even less. As let's check out this fight one more time. And again, closer. Really, re he's just oh, playing so well. Morgan is actually my MVP. Like, tanking the ultimate for Umpty there is really big. And then, this this should be the fight win. But the problem is that I think that Sandbox already feel like they win. Right? And, and you see Envy and KL, I was like, oh, 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 oh. And with this, like, mandate and uh, the, the mandate Rabbit yeah. Hydra Ash, the follow-up damage when they're all CC'd like that, what? It doesn't feel like it could it, it was as high as what we're used Umpty, to seeing. Umpty right? should have died then, right? Even if you end up losing that fight, Umpty, no way should he ever get out alive. And he is the reason that they can even do Baron. If Umpty dies there, you're fine. Now you lost Baron yet again. Rose gonna open up the map. And... Oh, yeah. And we are, we are also looking at, this is Bro moving to third place in the LCK. They are going to equalize the amount of wins that they got in the summer season of 2022 after this win, if they do manage to win here today. This is actually monumental for Bro. This is a team that hasn't had a large amount of success as Henna soaks everything. He's still got cleanse, by the way, guys. Kyle goes down extremely low and yeah, the war machine of Bro continues to march forward and they look unafraid. They're not very aggressive. <laughs> However, they're also not very scared. Like a gelatinous cube, they just slowly, <laughs> yeah, yeah. They like, slowly inch like, towards you, and yeah. you punch them, and they're like, jiggle. Mm -hmm. And then, and then, you know, yeah, it's you, like you try to punch them again, and they just they just sit there menacingly. It's like a piece of Tupperware tumbling down a hill. It has no fear whatsoever. But it isn't going to do that much damage. <laughs> uh, although, they have done a fair bit of damage this game, as we could see. Of course, Morgan being able to find some revenge after the early first blood against him. And Karras has pressed some R buttons, and they've locked down priority targets. This is Bro just playing the Bro game, and I think that is the biggest problem here for Live Sandbox, is because they've just agreed to it. This yeah, isn't Live can't. Sandbox League of Legends. This is both of these teams playing Bro League of Legends. And there is one team that does that the best. And that we call it Bro League, League of Legends because they're the ones that do it the best, you know? Yeah, great great point, Atlas. Yeah, I thought it was really, uh... I, I needed to drag it out because the longer I can uh, take um, explaining points... Um, the less points you need, now I get it. Yeah. I understand. And I don't have that many more points. It's been a, it's been a weird and wonderful game. So that's going to be sword points. Yeah. Which is nice. Taking them a little bit of a time. I understand some of the restraint from Sandbox to really hard commit to these fights because, as we saw there, even if you do edge or engage, Karis is very strong at making sure that with a scatter, 
any attempt that you go for for a shuffle, for example from closer, easily gets taken down. We also have effort going for a McKills now. So even if you do actually hit an arrow or Sejuani, it's not going to matter that much. Yeah. And Cerildas is the, now the done one, for um, yeah. Anna as well. It's four items. He's what? doing a lot of damage. And at this point, Envy just doesn't do that much. Right? With this build, was just never going to be the case. And I would have much preferred going for either Halo Blades or... Obviously, Lethal Tempo immediately puts you into the on-hit variation, but with Halo Blades, I think you have a little bit of choice. But yeah. with Comet, you are fiercely slotted into this specific type of build. And we are seeing, especially with the Serac, like no one on Bro is dying. Well, Arrow is going to connect. Karras, of course, loves it. He will choose to take those at any time. Envy is almost level 16 as well, and he does actually have a ton of CDR. The one upside is Birdo is on free items, and he should actually be good because Morgan has also been itemizing specifically to deal with the extreme amount of magic damage that's available. Oh, that's a McHale's. Gonna actually be used this time around as Morgan struggling in this matchup now. As you were talking about, Hole Breaker done. Yeah. Side lanes belong to Birdle as Chains of Corruption sail wide. The arrow is gonna do the same thing. Willer actually interrupted as the gameplay button comes out from Karras. It's not quite enough as Henna picks it up. Doesn't even need the flash. He just lands that one. He lures them into a false sense of security by missing two skill shots in a row and then nails the two that matter. Oh, brutal. Well, let's see whether Morgan can keep himself alive here. He does manage to break all the weaknesses. The flash goes forward and Morgan, he may have done it. He did it. Oh, the Lord himself picks up the solo kill under the turret. He baits him in. What an expert. Still at stopwatch as well. Yeah, it wasn't at even no, scared. At no point in time was Morgan in, every, uh, in any actual threat there. And you see that the rest of Sandbox starting to get flustered as Bruce just not going to be impressed with what you're doing. Hannah, beautiful shot there. No one able to keep him safe because this actually is really nicely done initially by Birdle, right? Oh, yeah. Identifies that Morgan is going to go for the... Stun and is able to counter it. And if this Q hits, oh man, you get the kill. Uh, and instead, oh. Morgan with the slice, dice, sustain, more than enough turret helping him out there. And it's, it's the Renekton mechanics, you know. Sometimes we're not gifted this level of gameplay. If the you Lord hit Q there and you get inner, then game becomes so much harder to play for Bro. But now you're six and gold up and Sandbox. I think they well and truly have gotten Breon here. They have been oh, lulled yeah. into an almost hypnotic state of sleep. And now they're about Why? to get taken down <laughs> by the bros. Arrow, this time will connect as Karras blocks that one. They are actually bros, by the way, because in the meantime, Morgan and Umpty are taking down the Baron. It's 50%. Vertel moving on in here. Don't flip it. As Envy is getting taken down so low, this poke is working out so well. But bro, they don't want to push it. No need to rush. <laughs> they don't want to rush anything, Atlas. Have you, have you been paying know. attention? As Closer is going to get interrupted. Oh, no. He does, does sail away. Sail away. Sail away. <laughs> I don't even remember who sung that song. It's a good one. It's a really good song, Atlas. Yeah. Maybe you can sing it for us. I could. Now. No. So we, we can... Wait. I, I mean, it, it's it's old, but it's not that old. Uh, yeah, it's Come Sail Away. Yeah. 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 I don't know. I don't know who sang that. I can't remember. I feel like we should. I'm sure someone... I'm sure someone knows. Anyway, uh, he did manage to uh, shift some sands and escape, which we refer to as Sailing Away. And now has made it back towards his mid lane with his teleport. No flash on the Azir now. So those flash shuffles, not going to be possible as... All right, Arrow once again going to hit Karras. Karras addicted to arrows. He got missed by the first one. Afterwards, he's like, never again. And he has caught them at all times. All right, Glacial Prison, that one. Not one that Karras really likes catching quite so much. Not sure um, what the goal was there as Bertle now inside this dragon pit 
And Liv Sandbox. Wait. They're going to try and use that as an opportunity. Never mind. All up. They're going to try and... No. Liv Sandbox. This is it. Envy. It's going to take a lot of damage. Morgan is soloing the Drake. Myrtle is standing in a bush. Well, if there is a if there is a Drake you can give up, it's this one. Don't care about this soul. True, but... I'm just going to get it. The Baron Surely not. Is it 50%? Oh, no, no. We can... And it's not off fine us. again. I... I'm going to lose my mind. Do you know what my counter to that is? You've to already no, lost have it. no mind to lose. <laughs> and now we're running back to Dragon. Yeah. Oh, and oh, now back to the Baron. Baron. Oh, never mind. Back to the... Yep. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, Bertle just going to okay. scope out what's going on. There is a jungler here. As now they're going to fight the Fiora. She does get stunned up. As now empty. Goes golden. He's also got a few other buttons he can press, but he goes up into the sky. Dives down now. Grand challenge was already issued. The Baron, they're still fighting it. It's down extraordinarily low. Effort trying to get into that pit to stop it. As the Azir does go down. Baron secured in trade for the Pigeon. And the Drake just forgot. Can't they just end? You're Maybe. No Azir. Yeah. But yeah. at the very least, you're going to give up an inhib. The, the upside, obviously, is that you do have Baron Waves here and you have a Heimerdinger, but I don't... That's not enough. Yeah. Well, you probably give up inhib and trade Soul for Baron, which is not the end of the world, and it means that... What if a completion just... Another yet. arrow? Connects on to Morgan. Morgan cares about as much as that Tupperware tumbling down the hill, Chronicler. Not very much at all. Karis not going to find Envy there. Just give it. It's it's not that big a deal. This soul isn't that good. No. Just run it down mid. What this does open up, though, is a chance. <laughs> for the Elder Flip? For the Elder Flip. A <laughs> zone that Willa has thrived in in the past. Let's check this out one more time. Well, they, they get it. I don't know what to tell you. Like, they've been running back and forth. Birdo actually doing a legitimately good job by himself, keeping two people busy. Uh, Renekton and Elise unable to chew through him. Obviously, Birdo in that scenario really benefiting from the whole breaker, fully stacked on his Ravenous as well. But the Baron power play is... I don't even know if it qualifies as a Baron play. Well, they are making money. <laughs> uh. Well, they, technically, yes. Yeah? Because it says plus 1,500. The number is going up and down at this point in time. As Envy, not with all that much uh, damage this particular game. I think Magic Resist is certainly exactly what Bro want to be putting together. As Hannah's going to move on over, should be able to get himself. Okay. That, uh, no, never mind. Zumpty, Spiderlings being a little bit frustrating there. Still a Baron buff. As the arrow that is addicted to hitting Karras this time is not going to quite find the mark. Another minute. The only no. one who doesn't is closer, so he needs some help. Can't. No, no, no. Okay. Not Just right. Brutal. Brutal is still very strong. Don't know if he should dive more again. We know how that went last time. Yeah. Morgan just uh, placing his weak spot against the wall. And uh, yeah, Brutal is 100% just uh, having a great time here. Let's see whether he can keep himself alive as the Repost comes in. In goes Umpty. Let's see what they can get done here as the turret is going to fall on that bottom side. Nice little split play here around this Baron so far. Four live sandbox. It's going to be an elder flip out. And none of, none of the game that has happened thus far is going to matter. And you know what the best part is? I, I feel I have a deep, deep feeling that we're going we're gonna to go to game three. Karras has been mega Flame Horizon, by the way, this year. Uh, it's yeah, 431 CS for Closer. He has six items. Um, he is extraordinarily large. Karras still has two items yet to build. Does have room to uh, purchase vision for his team, <coughs> which is great news. Um, but that is being made up for by the fact that Bro has a marksman that shoots the enemies. Albeit it is a Varus. Relatively cheap build, but a full build nonetheless. I don't I don't even know if it matters that much because at this point, like closer does so much damage. Yeah. That as long as he doesn't die, you're you're still pretty good. I don't think you really care. Uh, obviously, like I said, I would have much preferred if Envy has gone uh, or went for a more aggressive build on the Ash. 
Because in this scenario, if you, you know, have a Sejuani that can frontline for you, and you have a Hamming and creating space, and you actually have a damage build, you will shred everyone on Bro in a couple of autos. But that's not the game we're playing, at this. Right. This is... This is Pogwars. This is vying, jostling, one might even say, for positioning. Yeah, I think there's definitely been some jostling. Um, it's been somewhat aggressive jostling. Have we done all the animals yet? <laughs> Can we go back to that? Who's Hanwha? <laughs> ah, no, it's not a good animal. They're in a bit. You remember, there was a time where I used to comment platypus? on arrows. <laughs> That's, that wasn't uh, this game, right? Oh, that's not it. That was, that was another game. Yeah. Okay, keep it together. What's Hanwha? Hanwha. Hmm. Something. An animal that is. Maybe a penguin. <laughs> I can see it. As Kyle is going to flash. So Hanwha's a penguin. Yeah. Are they a specific type of penguin? An emperor penguin. Okay. I like it. The I ones that uh, Morgan Freeman would talk about in uh, March of the Penguins. Yeah. Nice. Um, because I think, you know, they're they're fiercely loyal and they take care of each other and stuff Brodo, like you're, you're, you're spotted and you're moving up. My guy. Well, Umpty is going to oh, repel. Very well done, Umpty. Missing the cocoon so the repose won't get yeah, you. Yeah, that's how you do it. Very nice. Um, have we had all of them? So KT is a hawk, yeah. Longshim's a raccoon. Oh, we have one left. What's Kwangdong? Ooh! What animal is Free. Kwangdong freaks? A rhino. Maybe a porcupine. Porcupine? Yeah. Maybe a hedgehog, because they're kind of crazy. It's true. They're, they're the freaks. As I think this Baron is not going to be finished. I'm calling it now. They're not going to finish this Baron. Well, they're going to look for the turn. Arrow, not going to connect. Envy, down to 50% health. I'm not entirely sure what was hurting him, but something was. Tower is going to go down. Bro has to do something. We'll see whether they actually do. As Umpty still fighting this Baron. We've got the Wish. It's now being used. As Scatter comes down, the Azir is dead! I repeat, the Azir is dead as Willa not going to be able to get the steal. It is somehow Karras who had been Flame Horizon. He's 150 CS down, but it does not matter. If I had a vote, I'd give him POG. As Bertle, he took an inhibitor. It's really good, but the Baron now belongs to Bro. And I think they might just move to war. Well, I don't want to assume what they're going to do. They're going to flip. But they'll probably go towards the Elder. Well, they're not going to flip because they're going to be up a member. It's 30 seconds, and and the dragon is live right now. There isn't. You can teleport to bot wave here as Brodon try to friend, but I don't think you have the time. No, nope, they're going to try and contest. 20 seconds of the closer is here, but Willow is alive. Doesn't have flash available. It does have a smite and a dream atlas and an arctic assault that he could potentially use. As this dragon is down extraordinarily low, it all comes down to this as Umpty. Can you secure it is the question. 37 health and it's secured by Willa. Bertle now trying to dash his way out. Karras is dead and the rest of Bro have to scatter. That was the most ridiculous decision I have seen since the last time Willa found someone willing to make that decision. It's happening. Six games. Oh. Six games, Atlas! Well, remember, bros still have the Baron buff. It doesn't matter, they're down an Elder. Yeah. Surely the bros can't hold on here. Let's see what they can do. The game doesn't end until the Nexus falls. But Morgan is in so much trouble. The GA is popped. Hannah is soon to be popped. He takes a gear from a Heimerdinger. He's gonna survive for the moment, but he eventually falls. And Liv Sandbox will make us go the distance. Liv Sandbox, take us to six games on the day and stay alive in the series. Seeing some sheepish grins, and I don't know why. This was peak entertainment, Atlas. This is... <laughs> This is League of Legends, right here.
Today, I don't know what type of League of Legends. We get the whole spectrum here in the LCK. We get everything. And not only do we get it here in the LCK, but we get it yep. on the one day. We get to see everything. And this was a game that Bro had won until they decided to walk towards an Elder Dragon that Willa has already made a reputation for himself for stealing. And, uh, and then the game was over. Um, to say that we were surprised, I think, would be an error. It would be wrong. Um, it would be factually incorrect. Remember when I said about 25 minutes in, this is going to six games? Yeah. Well, I mean, uh, we said that as we walked into uh, the building today as well. We knew. We knew from was, the beginning. It was one of those things. As Live Sandbox Challenger team still here, still cheering the main squad as Hannah did a heck of a lot of damage, but honestly, all of these numbers are irrelevant. Uh, it all came down to how much uh, damage Willis Smite did. I don't even know if he smited it. It might have been a W take. It's true. I don't actually remember. Um, I mean, Umpty, uh, it was Karis that took the Baron, so Umpty, I'm sure, had Smite available. Yeah, had a... Uh, I don't even know, Atlas. It They're... went down to 84 health, that's all I know. These players are digging deep, and we are digging deep. I'm going to think of some new material for the 40 minutes of downtime that we'll have in game number three. Let's go to a short break when we get back to space, game number three. ゴニャ、エルスコ。パフェだ、パフェだ。パフェだ、パフェだ。パフェだ、パフェだ。パフェだ、パフェだ。パフェだ、パフェだ。パフェだ、パフェだ。パフェだ、パフェだ。パフェ
Jump song, she check it out. Say, 다시 돌아가도 돼. 태도 똑같아, where the dog. Say. 하지마. 패배. Yeah, we're just like Harry. Don't be any rising world. 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 Don't be any Hello and welcome to the space. I'm just gonna go ahead and say what we're all thinking right now. Uh, well, Wolf's kind of acting out what we're all thinking right now. I guess you can't really, oh, there it is. Yeah, it's just, ah, uh, that game was just. I hold on, Valdez, hold on, hold on. I'm starting a surrender vote. I've got it, all right. <laughs> Do you vote yes? Yeah, put me in. For okay, all okay, right, hold on. Yeah. Got two votes, okay. We got two votes, two surrender votes. Um, okay, hold on. I'm getting word. Uh, Jason voted no. Hold on. Oh. Jason said we have to finish the show. <laughs> hold on. I'm getting word one more. Ah, uh, Willer voted no. Oh, Willer voted no. Well, I oh, guess it failed. Two two. Yeah. We don't even have to have a fifth vote. I guess we have to finish Render the show. Render vote at two and two. Um, All right. Why don't you go ahead and break down that game number two for us, Wolf? So none of this really matters. Um, the one thing I will say about the Live Sandbox draft that I thought could have been utilized a lot better is this Fiora that had Hole Breaker was level 18. I know the, the moniker is Cool Kids Never Panic, but I think actually Birdall panicked quite a bit this game, had a lot of mistakes in terms of side laning, was really indecisive around a lot of objectives. And that one tragic moment where he actually didn't kill the Renekton that he absolutely could have and, and really like quite literally panicked there and died was, was really rough. But he 1v2 to help get the Baron that allowed Live Sandbox to defend Bro's push so that then they could actually flip on Elder to win the game. So if Willard doesn't get POG, it might be him. I don't know. Um, but also, 
bro decided, <laughs> okay, we are going to 2v1 the Fiora in Bot River, just, I guess, to stop her from soloing the Drake as the her team was taking Drake. the Baron. Yeah. And the jungle was not at the Baron looking for the steal. So they gave the Baron a live sandbox. The game went on for longer. Let's take a look at highlight number one because, you know, it took us a while, this? but we did get some highlights. Yeah, here. when was this? This was halfway through the game at 25 minutes. Um, this was a, oh, th oh, this fight. Yeah, this was really cool back then. Um, it was. <laughs> Wasn't this game one? I this was the really cool uh, engage here with Closer, where he just chases them down and kills them. Um, because they have no damage without him, because Envy is playing Imperial Mandate Ash. So he's just, um, he's happy to come in there and do some damage. That was that was one of those moments where we're like, okay, things are looking good for Bro, um, but saved, a little bit saved here for Liv's yeah. sandbox. And then, you know, 25 minutes later, we'll, we'll get to highlight two. Not exactly 25 minutes later, but like 20 minutes later, we get to highlight two because a lot of stuff happened yeah. in between that. There was some side laning errors like I talked about, but this game came down to one slow it down smite on an elder break. By the way, like nobody is really team fighting here. There's not a lot of zoning. It's just Willer comes in, picks up that smite low health freebie. He smites second. Um, we gotta start calling this guy like Han Solo man, um, except he smites second. He's like the opposite of Han shot first in the Greedo matchup, man. He always wins these smite this battles. This guy is just Swiper from Dora the Explorer. <laughs> <laughs> you just gotta say Swiper, no Swipey, but it still doesn't work. He 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 won this game for them off of that smite that was missed, and he didn't miss his, um, and that's the end of it. Like. There was not a whole lot to say about the team fight before that. Everyone's full build. Everyone's slowly poking around. It's Imperial Mandate Ash versus slow damage coming through from Karis. And uh, eventually, the Elder goes over and Liv Sandbox can kill them and win Let, the game. Let's just say that Bro had several, extremely large amounts of chances to win this game um, where they were ahead and they just did not do the correct thing. They kind of went back to, we're going to play it super slow. We are going to flip an Elder that we don't necessarily have to. We're gonna let them have the Baron. We're not gonna fight correctly. Like the macro was all over the place. You were talking about like cool kids never panic. I'm like, bro was just a panic nightmare. Like everybody was all over the place. I don't know what it was. Like if Umpty wasn't able to calm everybody down and get them all on the same page or something because they were just, it seemingly in my mind, there were so many chances for them to either push farther with the Baron or to not flip an Elder or to have a better team fight at certain places, and none of that really happened. A lot of what uh, Breon's win conditions have been this season is putting Hannah on Lucian, playing for early game, Lucian Nami lane, get ahead, play for tempo, play for early drakes. That's kind of been the MO, and those those are some of the cleanest wins we've seen from Breon. And it's a game like this where it's super long, super slow. They clearly need to work on their late game win conditions, how to set up for those objectives, how to push those advantages better than outside of like first 10 minutes, first 20 minutes, what happens after that? Still some improvement needs to be made. Yeah, and on the side of Live Sandbox, I mean, decent overall. I think they did put themselves in a kind of sorry position where it's like, oh, well, we gotta try to steal, you know, an Elder, or we gotta, you know, take these Barons in a weird, wonky situation where Fred and Brianna, or Brianna rather, aren't in the right position. And I mean, at least they were able to do it, right? You know, they were given a couple of chances and they did pretty well with it. So that was good for them. They do force a game three, they give themselves a chance. Let's see who did pick up POG here for Live Sandbox as it will be closer will and rob is here <laughs> will rob. willer did rob bro so um i suppose it's only fair i mean closer had the most consistent performance i would say out of these players uh his positioning was mostly really good in these fights and this is one of those moments where he's allowed to close the fight out actually because he's got this choke point to work with. He can come over here and do all that extra damage, shoves them into a choke. They're on the wrong side of the map. And it's really just easy to use those extra ash flows, a little bit of extra poke, and then go, all right, it's time. Biggest cue of your life. Uh, see what the votes are like. <laughs> you had a three way yeah. here in the on the analyst desk, but it does eventually go. Yeah, it did come down to a tie. Uh, funnily enough, Bertle also got three votes, so I suppose his distracting powers were enough to uh, garner some votes there as well. Um, yeah, four Let's votes. Let's hope for a better game. Well, Let's hope for a better game three, Valdez. Let's yeah. just 
please. Jokes aside, game two was not great. And we're hoping that game three can be much better. And I hope for you guys, the casters and the fans, that it will be so. So let's jump into game number three, back to the casters. Thanks, Valdez. Thanks, Wolf, for breaking down hey, that game. I have really good news. What's that? I have compiled a list of questions I can ask you so we won't run out of conversation topics during the next 45 minutes. I mean, I think you and I could probably talk for 45 minutes, um, you know, regardless, but I really appreciate no, you I'm, helping No, I'm putting in the work, Atlas, because I felt myself slipping and I need something to grasp on. Uh, okay. This list will give me the structure that I need. Absolutely. As well, bro, the structure they need resides on the side of blue, and they will move over there right now for this draft, which we are heading into at this moment in time. But this okay. is indeed a moment so, in time that we are experiencing all together as a I, I will keep my energy very high, and you pace yourself, and then later on we can switch. So when I'm tired, you can go crazy, even though I don't know how much you'll get in this game. As overall, getting in the draft now, as the desk already kind of highlighted, the current form or the current flow of draft not usually important. Both these teams have clearly shown that they are kind of playing the same way. So I actually would love to see the coaches say, guys, if this is how we're playing the game, slam that board. Get it in here. Uh, bring up the, the team finding any carries. Get Zeri in here. It doesn't matter. She's going to get the free items anyway. Because with how the game has been, or the games rather, have been going so far, Scaling is the way. As Ash gets picked up again, I truly hope that we will see a bit of a swap up. As this time around, the Mauka actually available here for Willer. Yeah. Of course, on 13.1, still incredibly strong, even on live, after the nerves. Still seeing a ton of Maokai as we are still diverging from the beaten path. Jack's being picked up, so now Sandbox have two options. Either they can pick themselves up a counter for the Jacks. Or you're going to run the risk that Bro is going to pinch the pool. And they say there are plenty of champions that Bro can play. We're going to take the risk and instead are going to lock in the Heimerdinger, which unfortunately to me means that Envy's probably playing the same build. If they don't have a Zero, though, and it's still that Ash build, I do think that you are really going to run into trouble. So I'm really hoping that they take into account the fact that if they go R4 or Zero again, then it doesn't matter at all. But otherwise, you're going to run into serious trouble because there are not a lot of mages that can kind of keep track and, and keep up the level of damage you need in those late-game team fights if yeah. you're 80 carry calm. That's exactly right. The Akali banned away from closer here, of course, one of his most successful champions. The Kassadin already taken away. You can tell that uh, Lip Sandbox is pretty happy to go back towards the Nazir, which I expect Bro to ban the second time of asking. I think uh, Karis left a little to be desired in the previous game. Uh, as Syndra is still going to be banned. I do want to highlight that the Syndra, even though it didn't end up winning, was pivotal in a couple of almost win moments, and it made engaging for Sandbox a lot harder. Do you think that with the Maokai here now as well, they will have a lot more insurance as to actually being able to start fights? Sejuani, a bit more non-committal, and unsurprisingly, as you were pointing out, there it is, the ban towards that Azir coming through here, and Pick up for a top laner here would be ideal. Obviously, Cassante is open, but we have seen that matchup kind of go both ways. And with the pace of these games, I am wondering whether Birdo is willing to go for the Camille. That is a matchup that I do think can go either way based on execution. It's something that he historically has been exceptional Ooh. at, but just going to be the Cassante instead. I do think this is a much safer pick, and you do give yourself a lot of options in terms of early pressure. So now. If you want ultra late game, what is it? Vyga and Nasus support. So, interestingly enough, a lot of champions like the uh, Vega and the, oh my god, and the Nasus. Uh, the Nasus. I know you're kidding about the support, but actually spike really strongly around you know, the mid parts of the game, as it will be the victor here to come through for effort. And I don't know why we're hovering Fun Champ. Actually, it is closer. He would. He, he would could. Be, he would he, be that guy. He could definitely Aurelia this game, especially with the severe amount of magic damage that they already have, right? Because this is Imperial Mandate Ash. You're going to be empowering things like Maokai and Heimerdinger to do a lot more, and that is the Aurelia locked in. 
Karras going to have to deal with that on his victor now. And remember, this is Closer. This is the champion that he's known for. That's why he has that huge grin on his face. We'll see whether that grin will be there at the end of this game as well. So, I think this is a huge risk that some of us taking. Because if this Aurelia doesn't pop off, if you don't fight a couple of great early fights, if you don't snowball the way at uh, the game in a way that you were categorically unable to in the last two previous series or previous games that you played against Bro, I don't think you win the late game. Uh, late game, unless you find some truly amazing flanks, especially if Envy goes for the same build, you are going to be lacking damage. And your hard engage, sure, is great. You're playing into Victor, Soraka, Varus, like the kite back will be devastating to deal with. So pressure on lift sandbox, but oh boy, if they snowball, the game becomes very unplayable for Bro real quick because champions like the Victor need time. They need space. And if you're not given that, champion looks extremely unimpressive. Certainly does. We'll see whether Karras can channel some Bulldog on his uh, Victor here today because I think he's going to need to do so in order to stand up to the closer test on the champion that he really made a name for himself on. This was how he managed to sort of stand apart from Faker when he was sitting behind him on T1. It was because he was so good at these hyper-aggressive uh, physical melee carries in the mid lane. And uh, not to say the Faker isn't also good at those, but he was also not playing as many of them um, while Closer was. Certainly a bit of a risk to be taken here for Live Sandbox, but they're going to leave it all on the Rift as we head to game number three. Remember, this is for third place in the LCK. It's not even a joke. This is. We're playing for third place. Yeah, because this Lift Sandbox beats Hanwha Life yeah, and KT. Yeah. <laughs> it's uh, it it's both. pretty nutty. A lot of people actually very confused as to why Hanwha have not looked very good at all. Um, because apparently in scrims, they destroy everyone. They're extremely good. Yeah, I, I, I you know, I'm, I'm a big believer in scrim box. The other day, I tried to pay my rent with them and... They were like, no, you can't do that. Cause Live Sandbox not, sprayed cause Scrimbox cause all over Lopak when they made their way out. Because they're not worth anything. Ah, yeah. Aww. Are we going to look at the sad cat disappear? Aww. Who wants to give him a hug? Aww. Mean, Karis. Mean. Well, Piggy comes in. And Umpty says, no more funny business. As Willa over here. He is, uh, he's taking Growlithe or Flareon. I think we've d we uh, landed on Flareon uh, as his Pokemon of choice. And uh, that does mean that uh, he's going for that more, you know, damage graph at the end of the game based Maokai. There's a fair bit of extra damage. Hasn't gone first strike or anything too crazy like that, so it's still going to be phase rush. So likely Demonic Embrace to come through first. Uh, as Counter Strike gets a little bit of a stun there. Nice work from Morgan. We'll see whether Morgan's Jax can once again be a pivotal part of Bro's I, attempted grab at some momentum. I forgot, and I was actually shocked nice working with that in by the Thanks. That Morgan lost on his Renekton. Even if the game state is bad, they generally don't lose on that champion. Well, and oh, they, they, they basically won until they gave their opposition of an Elder Drake. Yeah, but that's part of the Bro normal. That's, that's just a normal... So I wouldn't say, I, I'm not going to put that on his stat sheet as a loss, though. Yes. No, it, it is. Nah. As, oh, Envy did go for the poke build again. And with this setup, I do think you're a little bit more forced to play more proactive anyway. And if Closer doesn't go in on the rally, the champion doesn't actually do anything. So hopefully the team trusts him and will follow him on what hopefully will be many engages. And uh, will leave us with a different... Type of game. Although, if you want, I can give you a couple of sneak peeks toward topics that you and I can discuss if this game takes a similar game uh, pace to game number one and two. Well, I was having a, a chat in between games about the important topics that we were discussing in the previous uh, uh -huh. game that we saw. Yes. And that was um, the animals for each team. Yes. I think some people are a bit confused as to the owl um, for D plus Kia. And I think. 
I, I sort of understood where you were, where you went with it, but I didn't really understand the thought process so much. So you want me to further explain? Yeah. So I think Domon Kia is a team that is very wise. They have uh -huh. Kalin. He kind of looks like he has like it does owlish, owlish, owlish features. Uh huh. Um, and for a large period of time, they were soaring over the LCK. Ooh. But then they woke up the dragon again, and now the dragon is uh, clearly very. So bad. why is the dragon not DRX, who were formerly Longju, which was actually a which dragon. was also Dragon X? Yeah, no, I'm aware. Um, well, you wanted to make DRX an anime animal, and well, I, that was and because T1 that, was already a dragon. Can you please, can you please let me finish. Sorry, yes. I'm, I'm very. Uh, I, we're trying to have a conversation here. Yeah. Although we are getting interrupted. No, no, never mind. Not interrupted. <laughs> <laughs> I got me there. Yeah. Uh, so. T1 themselves use a lot of dragon imagery. So I just uh -huh. followed their own example. We can have two dragons. That's fine as well. That's a grenade. Um, heal has to be used there from effort towards the bottom side. There's actually a ton of different dragons, so I'd be fine with having two dragons. Uh, Ooh, I was just happy true. about an anime animal, especially coming from you. Because it sounds like the type of thing where if I'd suggest it, you wouldn't want to do it. Well, that leads to my second point, which is apparently the most anime animal is a honey badger. I don't know anything about anime, so I, I just I have to smile and nod. I'm personally not on board. I like the Nine Tilt Fox a lot more. Okay. Like, Ari is actually just. Yeah. There. I, I, I can see it. I can see it. So I think uh, the animals have been secured, and therefore, I think we can go into your first topic that you had prepared. So, well, I, I will give you some ideas, some suggestions, and then we can go and touch upon them whenever you feel like it. Okay. As. This game, hopefully, as soon as Closer hit 6, he's going to be looking for all-ins across the map. Uh, possibly towards the bot side of the map, if they can get themselves a nice dive set up. But, you know, there we go. Ooh. It's yeah. the damage. Closer hitting some buttons. So, yeah, I want to ask you about your favorite movies and when you saw them first. Then secondly, I want to ask, what is your take on a perfect album? Every single song, start to finish, Ooh. complete banger. And then last, your favorite game is Breath of the Wild, correct? It, I, I would tough, say that, well, I don't know whether it's my favorite game, but I think it's the greatest game ever made. Okay, so which LCK player would be the best Breath of the Wild speaker? Ooh. So you can, you can, you can, we can do that one last week. Can you? Time as Birdle. Can you? Canyon would. He's got the. He, he did that really cool thing on Lee Sin where he pressed lots of buttons all the time. His Birdle could be in trouble. No, he couldn't. <laughs> it's so silly. Uh, imagine. Um, Willer is going to start off this Drake. Uh, Umpty just went for a back. And it looks like this dragon should fall. The hands of the tree. And I believe knowledge is there. This is going down. And therefore, Morgan is just killing minions in between turrets in the top lane. But yeah, no, I would say that uh, it's probably Canyon that would be the best uh, Breath of the Wild, the Wild speedrunner. Because I feel like he has the ability to nail complex series of um, inputs, for inputs the most consistently. Which okay. is what you need in order to be a Breath of the Wild speedrunner, I would say. Okay. But that's a fun question. Thank you. Um, he'd probably get my vote, though. Who, uh, would that be your... What would yours be? Carrier? Yeah, I think Carrie is also a good one, as uh, Karis is going to put down a gravity field. Does make it very difficult for the Aurelia, who's just going to dash as much as she possibly can. Morgan not going to quite find the leap strike to get that uh, Counter-Strike sorted. So therefore, Closer will be all right for now. That flash on cooldown. Karis held on to his. So very while Closer did a lot of things, not a lot of good happened. Yeah, result. looks cool. Unfortunately... For closer, not having the flash available, where, uh, whereas Car still has his, means that any potential all in is going to lose a little bit of its teeth. And really nice roam there by Morgan, actually utilizing his priority very correctly and setting up his mid laner for a little bit of an easier time. And I want to again reiterate that as far as the game goes, Lift Sandbox should be extremely strong now that they've reached level six. There is still opportunities for them even later in the game, especially if they can start uh, or, or stack a couple of drakes because their drake control is actually amazing, right? If they're first to objective, they set up with high turrets, they have Ash, and even though the poke build is really going to lack damage in the late game, like in the mid game, Ash Heimer's objective taking should be exceptional. And 
if Lift Sandbox don't do anything, then they will be purified by the Breon way of life. Where they yes. Oh, no, wait and would love see. this. Would love this from Closer. But Effort seems to know that something is going on. Doesn't trust it. And just the presence of Closer hiding in fog and tapping towards Bog already forces Hanna to get very far off that turret. So if Sandbox can keep applying pressure like that and they can actually get a couple of early drakes and uh, roll a mountain or a hex stack, then I do think that they have a shot even in the later stage of the game. All right. If they don't, well, uh, we're going to need a lot more topics because Brion is not going to make this fast. That is not their way of life as Chains of Corruption do go wide. Great grenade there from Kyle. As Morgan taking a bit of damage here towards this top side. The top laners are hitting one another quite often. As Wallace Duet comes in, we're just going to head towards this top side because Cassante things are happening and Morgan does not like it. That's First Blood solo kill for Bertle. We've seen this one before. The Jax matchup is a treacherous one. Really got to respect. And the long lane like that can easily get run down. Not sure what happened that Morgan's wave state was such that he needed to walk up. But Bertle, nicely done. Able to pick themselves up a number of plates. No TP for Morgan either. So he is going to lose a lot. Oh, yeah. And Birdle going to be feeling a lot better. And these are exactly the type of moments that Sandbox need. And also that we know that they're capable of. Oh, 100%. And this is fantastic from Birdle. We really do need to see that killer instinct come out again in this, guys. Let's check it out one more time. We've seen this a few times now. Yeah. Just Cassante things happening. Pretty straightforward. Um, attacks Morgan initially. Pops the ghost. Just runs him down. No wave to jump to. And early gauntlet now done for Birdle. Means that if they want to contest, say, a second objective, they definitely will be able to. He did TP back to lane, though. And while this is nice in terms of him actually being able to apply a lot of pressure, as we might have a gank here. Yeah, but Morgan not going to leave strike. Yeah, that's he does get pulled back. Exactly right. Will is turning up, though. Umpty's going to get in here. Glacial Prison zoning. Get rid of Willa. And Morgan just going to tidy up the rest of the wave. Because with Birdle using his teleport there, actually contesting a Drake can be advantageous for Bro if they are willing to teleport Morgan down. Now, we don't know which Drake is going to be. Also, do note uh, Closer keeping the wave very far up here, which our observers are nice enough of showing, which Horus is a victor, so he can farm decently safe, as <laughs> Kyle is just, just being Heimer on the ward. Yeah. Uh, but this is still not great, right? You can't really do a lot about this. We immediately see Umpty make his way towards the mid lane. Really nicely done by Closer, right? Like, this setup is... It kind of looked like the Sims there for a second, you know? Like, you've got the Heimerdinger yeah. walking on up, you know? And then the Villa, same. like, walks his dog through mid lane. I now Umpty's riding his pig over towards this dragon. What co I know the Sims have a lot of expansions, but like, what, <laughs> what have you been playing at? Well, I know it's just you know just looked a little bit like their characters walking down the street. Yeah, it was fairly largely. I can see it as Blade the Rune King now done. Yeah, Arrow being used. Ellie's going to turn up. See how many plates she can gather here. As uh, Umpty's going to pick up the plate that uh, she did manage to get out there. Of course, no previous damage being done. Makes things difficult as Bertle's going to move this entire mini wave towards the turret. And Bertle gets that uh, ward over as well. We'll find the ult to take Morgan all the way out of this one. He is going to have to flash to get back towards his turret, but he may not be out of danger just yet. This is getting real scary, and Bertle's pushing this advantage so, so well. Really nicely done by Bertle there. Use the ward to. Oh, that would have been get hilarious. It, it would have been, but I still don't think that. Brian is really in a position to fight this. Oh, oh Birdle. No. Well, Morgan going to get the wish from Effort. That's also the end of a contest, right? As the arrow is going to sail towards the top lane. And Morgan had about <laughs> five people telling him that it was happening. Oh, <laughs> disaster for Sandbox. Oh, dear. It's going to be another Chemtech if goal. You... Disaster also for Valdez. 
I mean, well, no, it's his are, favorite, isn't it? There are more pressing things in this game for Valdus to be yeah, that's true. relatively unhappy about, as Birdle now single-handedly being a really big pressure point. And this is very good. Again, it's it's a bummer that your soul is not as good as the one you could have had. But regardless, you're actually playing according to your pressure. You're getting a couple of early leads, and if you can get a soul online at like like an elder fight in about nine minutes, that's still great. I still think that at that point of sandbox, you should still be firmly in control and can ride that elder into a win. Right? You can apply either uh, use it to then pressure a baron. You can turn it into a definitive team fight win. You can then snowball. So. It provides opportunities, but that does require Sandbox to play a little bit faster and looser and also actually get all those dragons. And yeah, we've seen some mild oopsies in terms of individual positioning. Yep, and uh, so I guess we'll go back to that question that you asked previously, and I'll, I'll, I'd like to ask it to you. So outside of League of Legends, what is your favorite video game? That is a very tough question. I don't actually have an answer. I have like a few because it, it depends on on genre and like what do you want? It's nice still by Umti. Well done. Yep, nicely done. Uh, keeps but no, no, no. But it's just your favorite. The, the genre is video game. Well, yeah, but that that. What's your favorite genre? Because I, I would then know. choose a game out of that genre. So if it's <laughs> if it's competitive games, it's League of Legends, obviously. I mean, I so said outside of League of Legends. Yeah. So if you're talking RPGs. It's probably Persona 3. Okay. Maybe Persona 4, I'm not quite sure. It's a bit of a back and forth. Oh, Arrow gonna be cleansed here. Zumpty's going to dive towards the Heimerdinger, but Nature's Grasp is coming forward. Let's see what the effort can keep the Piggy alive. And he can. Um, Very nice. Buttons are being pressed. Should be Harold, though. A lot of results as yes, could be Shirley. And Sandbox actually playing this one out a lot more by the book compared to the previous games, right? No, you're ahead. So, force a fight on mid, use your initiation, force Bro to respond. Bro right now not really in a great position to fight, so as a result, you can take the turn it into a Herald. We can then crash the Herald on mid. Also have our side lane shoving, so... Looking quite nicely. If you're talking about, you know, more artsy games, kind uh -huh. of the more esoteric, uh, Gris is amazing. Oh, I really enjoyed that game. Yeah. Also, if you are looking for... Simply exceptional. This is actually like, so if you, if you enjoy these far less action-packed games, yeah. you would, uh, you'd really, really like Dear Esther. Did you play Dear Esther? I have not. It's a game where all you do is walk. That sounds great. Yeah. And a narrator tells you a story. Yeah, no, I, I love Walking Sims. It's absolutely they're, they're brilliant. It was one of the, one of the earlier Walking Sims. So the game was phenomenal. If you're talking visual novels, uh -huh. it used to be Steins Gate, which also great anime. Uh, slow burn, very much, but uh, definitely great. But Last year, I read the House of Father or the House in Father Morgana. Uh huh. It's one of the greatest stories that I've ever seen. Is oh, Ooh, boy. that is a pretty nice flash, but the ulti is still going to come through. Karis puts down a gravity field, but it does not do anything. That is a beautiful pick off on the Victor. Closer needs these. Takes three turret shots because he can. He'll take down this turret as well, most likely. Really happy with what we're seeing here from Sandbox, and I know that we joke a lot about the pace of the previous games, but to me, one of the more jarring things was seeing Sandbox go from a team that was very proactive, as I don't know about this one. Birdle it might did be in some trouble here. Did Umpty actually get spotted at all? Because I feel like Birdle just walked past him as he goes Umpty, see whether he can find it. Winter's Wrath comes in. He and doesn't. There it is. Well, he's Birdle taking just, zero yeah. damage. I think he's being healed. As now he's just going to ult Umpty away, look to start off this battle first. He's down to 50% health, but there's the arrow to come in. Now Bertle's continuing the fight. Morgan, oh. please help him! Please help him, Morgan! And Morgan will! The Lord has said that you shall live, Umpty! And Bertle shall as well. Oh, the amount of time that that by Sandbox full control of the bot side of the map. Drake spawning in 15 seconds. Harold charging down mid. Wheeler is making oh, a play. Yeah, Nature's Grass to come in. Henna does immediately get healed. He does have the cleanse as well, but Aurelia is just going to pick up the easiest double kill of her life. And Karis, I think he regrets that particular teleport is in between the turrets. He becomes Heimer food. And Liv Sandbox will take the turret, they'll take the Drake, they'll take the lives of three people, and they'll walk away. 
And that is the lift sandbox as <laughs> oh, oh, no. that we've been waiting for. A team that surely, not without fault, we saw how much they struggled in their deep pass game. But the reason, as much as we, I think, at this point can question Hama life and their overall form, their consistency, their identity as a team, KT took a game of T1. KT 2-0 in Hanwha Life. And Liv Sandbox still beat this team. And that by itself should be enough of evidence for us that them winning might not have been a fluke. We might have just been all underrating this team as this I mean, is just they did, right? They did almost lose 0-2 to Bro. But then they didn't. Well, no, Bro then decided to give them the game. Yeah, but <laughs> come on, let me be excited at this. <laughs> give me this one. Well, you know, we just need to temper expectations just a little bit, as this has not necessarily been the cleanest series that we've witnessed but so far. But this game is. This game is definitely so much better, and it's great to see Closer on his on his Akali, on his Aurelia, a champion that he was so well known for, and uh, just popping off on it as well. As Umpty's going to look for him here, might have been a slight cast of curse as he throws out the ultimate blue buff. Might be there, but Willa is going to steal that one away. Great little grenade. Just to slow him down, send him a message. Yeah, you message can't is that. received. Uh, although Brutal wasn't here, but even five versus four, I don't think you're feeling too hot. There's also, I say contest, there is no dragon. They were just looking for a pick. Uh, <laughs> I just kind of assumed, with the amount of people being thrown towards the bot side of the map, that there wasn't objective to fight over, but was merely an attempt to take down closer. And Brutal says, oh, Oh, I get to be alone in the sideline. Well, I was having fun with the 2 but I guess I'll take it. So back to House in Fata Morgana. Oh, yeah. One of the best stories I've ever read. Uh, incredible, incredible visual novel. Great music, great art style. Uh, kind of a mix between, like, uh, a mystery and a little bit of gothic horror. Mm -hmm. Very long. Would highly recommend. So uh, we, cool. we already talked about you loving. Breath of the Wild. Got any other deep cuts for us that you want well, to share with the room? So, I mean, if you're going to break it down by genre, I, I probably you're, you're would do that. I'd probably like break it down by like old time and then like more recent, and then sure. it'd be more genre based. That, that's your. Because I think my favorite game of all time is Donkey Kong Country 2 uh, Diddy Kong's Quest. Great choice. It's probably my favorite. Is it because of the David Wise soundtrack? Well, I mean, that definitely plays a part, but he was there for all of them, and all of the soundtracks for all of those games were well, absolutely they are. incredible, yeah. including Donkey Kong Country Returns and Tropical Freeze. Oh, Tropical Freeze. Tropical man. Freeze soundtrack. Oh, oh my oh, goodness. So good. Just extraordinary. Um, otherwise, I'm, I'm similar to you. We have uh, similar I've, ideas when it comes to, to games I've, that we like, but my favorite RPG was Golden Sun. I've actually heard that if you play Aquatic, uh, aquatic Ambience, yeah. Underneath our casting, it syncs up perfectly. Oh, yeah. that actually that makes some sense, right? And when the action starts to really break out, then you can bring out the Sticker Bros Symphony. Oh yeah, Ooh. that's when you really get crazy. That's when you really get crazy. That's when you up the up the BPM uh, to something really nutty. As Umpty is um, standing there, and he will discontinue standing there. <laughs> Harris does a bit of damage, but not really anything that Closer is too worried about. This game is completely out of Bro's control right now. They're going to yeah. need a miracle as there's a flash from Closer. The arrow's going to connect as well as the wish comes down, but Closer does not care about your wishes or your hopes and dreams. He just wants to push you back towards your base, and he'll pick up the kill under effort as well. Envy just splitting in that mid lane. Morgan. Desperately trying to save the remnants of this game. And truly textbook, right? Sandbox continuously forcing fights, playing very aggressive, looking for opportunities to take down the opposing members. And while that is happening, Brutal, again, on butter, in his own lane, just casually pushing on. As yeah. A, well, <laughs> Where did the scoreboard go? <laughs> well, you don't really. Let me just back. say that the scoreboard looks a little bit like uh, Live Live Sandbox are doing okay. Um, as the scoreboard is, it'll come back. I'm sure it will. Um, it might. The scoreboard might only have until a certain amount of time, um, and then it turns into a pumpkin. So it may have turned into a pumpkin. <laughs> Uh, because hey! if, this, if this match was Cinderella, then we would definitely be um, 
it'd be about time to go home. Um, anyway, we have been here for quite some time, is what I'm saying. As the scoreboard disappears once again, we still have all the information that we need, so no one's too worried. Yeah, the neat thing is that we start two hours uh, earlier, but we haven't actually... <laughs> feels like we haven't actually gone home two hours earlier yet, as it's a deep teleport here, and... This is a soul point, obviously, coming through here for... or a soul rather for Sandbox. And I don't think you can test. Just let them have it. Wow. These arrows are like... They're hitting all the time, but they're really just not doing anything, you know? Like, there's a lot of arrows that MVs landed. They're very low impact. Yeah. yeah. It's interesting. As Karis wasn't teleporting or anything like that, so... Um, I could have looked Oh, silly. hold up. Morgan going in. Yeah, let's see. Speaking of teleports, Umpty finds himself in amongst a lot of people. And now the flawless duet doesn't quite connect there as Morgan flashes for the counter strike. There's the glacial prison closer. He's now just going to try and blade surge his way around this one. And eventually he will fall. Karis eventually manages to flash as well as Bro. They may have done it. They may have found a fight. As Bertle will survive, the rockets sail by as well as Kyle marks the end of that scuffle. Could you call it a team fight? One person died. I guess you can. As now the nature will be grasping the tit straws at this point in time. There's not a whole lot they can do without their super fed Aurelia. Those are the moments that can constitute a comeback. Need a couple more of those. Sandbox taking themselves a. Dragon here, and with that deep teleport, the entirety of Bro ready to collapse onto Closer. Uh, as we can see, Closer unfortunately unable to find himself. The E as a result, very nice combo from Morgan and Humpty there to salvage this. And this was three versus five, and he was still close. Yeah. Which is not a, a great sign of things to come for Brian, but. They haven't lost Baron just yet. They will soon, though, because Closer is alive again. And that's very bad news. But they didn't lose it there. And no. They also killed and got a shutdown on Closer, which is nice. They're only 8,000 gold behind. Yeah, it's not It's not good, but it's... it's Could be worse. Could be 9,000 gold behind. I like your relentless optimism, mm -hmm. but I appreciate that. You got to keep believing. That's what Journey told me. As, all right, Karis is getting hit by an arrow again. And doesn't really mind about it again. It's okay. In goes Closer. Effort just going to get obliterated. There's the stopwatch as well. Nature's Grasp comes in, keeps them all tied down so Closer can get these autos through. Umpty tanks for a really long time, but it's not enough. And Karis just doesn't have the damage. Morgan having to get out of there as well as Kyle's the one to get that flash and take him down. Willop chasing after Karis here, who uh, blast cones himself to Narnia, but Willop twisted advances, so he's going to follow him. There's a gravity field. He's trying to at least buy some space and get the yakety sacks ready. This game is ridiculous. Bertle is going to come through and finish off the kill. Where were you when Heimer traveled to space? <laughs> he has plenty of rockets. He just had to figure out how to use the Atlas as overall the game. It's like fortunately. <laughs> Dissolving <laughs> in front of Brian's eyes. Baron's gonna get started up here, and uh, it was already in a bad state, but that might very well be the killing blow. Oh, oh no, Envy. Uh, Effort! You can do it! You can do it, buddy! No! Oh my goodness. Oh god. Oh, yeah, no, I agree. I agree, Envy. Absolutely robbed. Uh, it's alright, the Baron is gonna be taken. Where to Brian? Don't exist anymore. Brian are still in this game. Still have the ability to fight back, maybe. We'll see. As we'll check out this fight one more time. Truly, it's closer time. I, I, I don't know what to tell you. Like they're, they're extremely far behind in scenarios like this is where uh, bruisers that Hyper Snow will like Aurelia can just completely take over fights, right? You don't have the damage to actually focus her down. Her sustain is insane because she's so far accelerated. Yeah. Especially with the Gore Drinker, as we saw previously as well, how long she stayed alive even when she was focused. Well, Arrow is going to pierce the heavens as Morgan looking for Bertle once again. Umpty on a mega flank. Gets the knockback though, and Effort is in so much trouble, he will be evaporated. And Bertle, he's able to run it out. He gets the ult. Karras is do dove upon. 
as Closer is going to find one as well. Live Sandbox. This is the end. They have marked it. The time is up. Bro, they had a decent effort in games one and two. Able to win game one, able to mainly win game two, but in game three, they were barely allowed to play the game. Live Sandbox will take this decider and they will move to third place in the LCK. And Sandbox going to showcase here that we thought that the game against the Plus Kia was indicative of what this team was going to go through for the rest of the split. And then the loss against, or the win rather against Hanwan KT initially looked like, well, just caught them off guard. But the more we see of this team in games like this, I'm not going to count the first two games as you very, very accurately pointed out, those were not a great... Uh, the, Live Sandbox lost 0-2 uh, and then won a third game that we, for some reason, played. You don't <laughs> don't put that in the, in the sales field. <laughs> you know, you're like, leave that out conveniently as waiting here. Oh, unfortunately, seeing Fred Abrian lose, always oh, tough. Humpty, 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 they're behind you. They're behind you, dude. Oh, he, he got him. He got him in the end. He got there in the end. He's not being a Rudy Patootie. He was just a little bit dazed. Um, after a difficult series. Oh, Wheeler and Morgan hugging. Very cute. Of course, they went to Worlds together, forged in the fire of a uh, Hummer Life Esports that barely made it, but then made it to the quarterfinals of the World Championship. Good to see that they are still good friends. Of course, you can't not be friends with Morgan. He's a wonderful guy, but didn't have the greatest of experiences on the Rift in that game number three. Cassante got absolutely massive, and then Closer existed. And Willer is obviously there to be praised for his game number two save, right? It was a lot of uh, Closer's effort done, but Willer's the one that managed to secure that Elder Drake. And that's a very happy Closer. And it's good to see Live Sandbox. I mean, You've taken a lot of the players <laughs> out of it as <laughs> Envy. He did spam a lot of volleys in that game. He did, and, and a lot, lot of arrows. arrows. Just oh, a lot yeah. of enchanted crystal arrows that are now sailing around Runeterra. <laughs> you know, we've got... We've that got L gets me every time, man. It's like everyone's <laughs> doing ceremonies like... Yeah. Yay, we won. Yeah. <sighs> we, uh, we have that thing of, uh, you know, in, in planet Earth, it's carbon dioxide that we're worried about. I think in Runeterra, it's arrows and super mega death rockets that they're worried about that are starting to pollute the skies. And uh, today was a day where there were a lot of arrows that started circling. Some of them were relevant, some of them were not. And after a two games out of the series that were, I don't think, a great sales pitch for either team, right? Not the best representation, because as much as we joke about Breon, I do think that when this team looks on point, they're playing show, uh, slow, surely, but they do actually contest a little bit more. They actually look for more team fight angles, and I think that in game one and two, you could kind of see that weren't maybe up to par as Envy. I think back to what was mentioned at the beginning of the splits, where he was saying, I want to change the opinion of people that they have of me, because his his LCK spring split last year was not good. No. It was very rough. He was replaced by Prince in summer, and that's when Lift Sandbox really became the Lift Sandbox that got one game away from making it to Worlds. And, and, and you, look, it was against the world champions. Um, yeah, we didn't know that at the time. No. Right? And, and, and obviously, if they had gone to Worlds, the top meta would have been a huge problem because they had Dove, uh, lest we forget that. Yep. But who was actually having a decent time over in the LPL. Nice. Good for Played him. a Cassidy game, I he's believe, over the last uh, week or so. Hilarious. It's pretty good. So I'm glad he's doing well as really just reads like uh, closer highlight reel. Um, oh, it is. And and there were individually, Brutal really impressed me with this game as well. But I would be shocked because with champions like Morelia, there is just a very clear, you are going to carry or you're going to do nothing type of deal. And closer carry. He did. It looked really good. And honestly, this game felt like Bro had kind of ran out of energy. There wasn't a lot left in the tank um, from what we saw, and Live Sandbox just rolled over the top of them. And it just shows that they are 
very tenacious as a team, and not a lot gets to them, right? Like, the first two games were really difficult for Liv Sandbox. They didn't win until the next ex exploded in game number two, and in game number three, completely unfazed by the, uh, the entire game states leading up to it. They just did their jobs and they won. And it's a very happy Birdle, who definitely deserves to be so after such a good early game. And Sandbox is such an interesting team, because they're kind of a team of rejected players in a way. Like, both Birdle and Closer were slated to be these big yeah. future talents, and then neither of them really ever lived up to the and hype Envy that they had around them. Like, Envy Prince was replaced by like, Wheeler was considered just a, you know, a passenger on the Chovy death train, which yep. I think at the time, obviously, in hindsight, you can't really judge adequately the impact that he had, but seeing all those players then come together, and again, this is Brion for Sandbox. We still don't really know where they slot in. We have yet to see them against one of the... Well, actually, we did. It was against the plus, but I uh, repressed that memory because it was so bad. Um, but still, so far beyond what I think expect, uh, what we collectively I think expected from this team. No, absolutely. I think uh, this wasn't necessarily a, uh, a great example of uh, the best League of Legends possible. However, Live Sandbox picked up a two-one victory, and they will be now third place here in the LCK uh, for week two. Who would have thought? That's not, the world we me. live in, everyone! Not me! Nope, absolutely not. But now we've got two other gentlemen that probably also weren't quite expecting that that we can throw over to at the space. Take it away. Thank you, casters. And sometimes when you get a series like the first one we had today, sometimes it needs to be balanced out by the series we had the second time. And you know what? Closer was just like, I'm just going to play Aurelia and Smurf all over these kids. And that's exactly what happened in this game. There was a lot of stuff. There was a bunch of downtime, and then Closer kind of snapped his fingers and killed them. Another game where we saw the Jack struggle into the early game of the Cassante as well. We did see Morgan really have a hard time up there on the top side of the map. And there was so much extra agency because of it with the top push that we did see from the Cassante there. So Closer had a lot of power on the map early to make big plays. And for those who don't know, when Closer was on T1 playing behind Faker, and we did occasionally, very rarely, but occasionally see Faker subbed out, it was to play Assassin Champions like the Akali he's still known for. But the Arella mid that was popular back then that we don't see very much these days. And it felt like with how Birdall kind of panicked and messed up some of the side laning calls in game two, he was like, I'm the side laner now. I'm playing the side lane champion in mid, and I'm going to take over this game. And as you said, Nothing else about this game really mattered. It was just Ash arrows coming through. There's so much CC and so much follow-up damage in this comp. And Ash arrow hits, you go in, you kill. Uh, and it was like, Closer was the shark. You could see the fin sticking out of the water. <laughs> yeah, it was quite terrifying, actually. We can take a look at highlight number one, which was a uh, pretty uh, good display of this already. It helped get the fed Closer already a little bit more fed. And both these teams, you know, uh, Especially because of the kind of downtime we have in both of the, well, all three of the early games, kind of struggle with making things happen. But I think when you have a guy like Closer on Aurelia, it's like, well, we have to. We have to make things happen. And I think that really helped Live Sandbox just kind of pull the trigger. This comp has, like I said, so much CC. The arrow, the arrow is there. You have the nature's grasp. So you basically say, Closer, I, here's your meal. Like, please take it. Yeah. And you have the grenade from Heimerdinger. It's just chain CC and Closer just flies across the map at light speed and yeah. gobbles somebody up and then gets massively ahead can side lane. He was threatening inner turrets so early in the game. It's really absurd. Yeah, and I think if game two hadn't happened, like we could have seen game three where bro were a little bit more put together and like we're playing as a team a little bit better and didn't kind of get caught off the way they were in the early to mid game. And maybe this game turns out differently, but I think that closer kind of, he was really happy. They were feeling very motivated after clutching game two and bro were a little bit distraught. So we kind of got to this point where it was like, well, one guy kind of smurfed all over everybody and the team played well around him, like we're saying. So uh, we can take a look at, Highlight, uh, no, POG. <laughs> POG right now. Never mind. It's been a long day. Uh, highlight, no, actually highlight, yeah, okay. we had two highlights. Yeah, yeah we do we have two, one. okay, there it is. This is basically the backbreaking <laughs> moment here. This is a really mechanical play here from Closer where he's able to zip through with these minions and actually get into the backside here. Nice ultimate that comes out from him, isolating two of the players here of Freon. 
And the team is now split where they have to move either left side here where all the damage is or to the right where they're still caught by nature's grasp. The team is all on the same page here. It was mentioned by the casters briefly, but I feel like the inconsistency of Live Sandbox is so massive. Like the range at which this team can play at a very high level and be super coordinated and be completely all over the place and have no real idea what they're doing in terms of the macro or objective setup is it's just wild to me. Like, how can we see this team that lost yeah. game two, but then Willer again just saved them and they we got to play game three, like yeah. Atlas said? How does that team play that game and then play this game three? It's crazy. I, it, it, the range is wide, and I think if we move more towards the high level side, the peaks, if we're hitting the peaks more often, this team will look closer in reality to that third place. Um, that they sit in the standings right now. Absolutely. And uh, by the way, that Varus Soraka worked in game two, uh, game three against Federalia. No, like, Hanna was just running away the entire game. So, kind of sad for them. Obviously, he was very fed. But let's take a look at POG here for game number three. I think we all know who it's going to be. There shouldn't be another choice in this one, yeah. right, Wolf? Uh, I did get some secret information that, in fact, we did have some other choices. Really? Yes. I don't think there were other choices. Yes. Uh, when I looked at the it just had five mids on it. It got a little I, spoiled. I put mine in the mid slot of the five mids, but yeah. I mean, look, there was. That's what you would think. The Heimerdinger option or the Maokai option are very bold. <laughs> That's um, what you would think, Wolf. <laughs> the Ash arrows were not always there, but they were there sometimes. But this game was literally defined by closers, so media. We're gonna have to have. Wait, a how did you know? We're gonna have to have what? a little. Chat. Wolf, how did you know? What are we it was doing? media. Who was the? Oh, whoa. Well, how did you know? Did they think the Aurelia <laughs> was top? No, closer played Aurelia mid. It was a I don't know. Aurelia. They got. I don't know. What they thought say. they saw Aurelia. They thought it was a top chat. And there's yeah. I it, and it wasn't just media. We did have a couple of other. Uh, guys voting for uh, top, so I, I suppose like that, you know that's the least. That's the least good vote of the other votes you could have. He was he was very tanky wolf. Okay, uh, guys, we do have the interview ready. Let's hand it over to Jisum for the translation. Thank you very much, guys. This is Jisun for the POG interview, joined by the solo POG and the side of Live Sandbox closer. The crowd is so happy to invite you to the stage. How do you feel? You got your third straight win of the LCK Spring Split, and you are now the POG leader. Currently, how do you feel? This is like my first time being the PUG leader. I mean, my teammates are doing a great job. I want to say thank you to all of them. It's their credit, you know, no doubt. And I'm just so happy. And you say you never want to lose to Karis, your best friend. How does that feel? Karis is also so talented. So I was a little bit nervous going up against him. But, you know, I think we had a great game together. It was a lot of fun. We had a very long three games between you and Bro. We had, you know, the latest um, first blood of the season, the longest game of the season. Is that because of the comp or is that because of the fact that Bro was being really solid? I mean, yeah, it's partly because of the comp, but recently we have been just having a lot of three game series, so maybe just like our problem, you know? So I hope we can get rid of those kind of issue and become a lot cleaner when it turns when it comes to getting a match win. Let's rewind all the way back to game number one. Ash support, Kasada, Nocturne. We had a lot of new picks, especially Nocturne in the jungle. However, you guys not you guys were not able to connect that into a game win. Yeah, that was the strategy we kind of prepared, but it didn't work. So we were like, yeah, let's get, just go back to what we normally do. So we kind of worked on our draft and got ready for game two. And you actually let Hena play Varus for three games in a row, and also the Lord Morgan's Renekton was also let through three games in a row. Does that reflect Lip Sandbox's kind of confidence? We kind of figured, like, we can actually deal with that. 
And we were also pretty confident too. And then, in game two, after we saw the Renekton, we had Fiora as an answer. Well, Fiora cannot really do a great job early on in lane. Could you tell us about the Fiora pick? Yeah, I mean, for sure, Fiora does struggle early on in lane, but, you know, Bertle was like, I can just, like, play aggro on the side lane all day long in the late game, so we trusted him, and, yeah, we relied on his late game potential on the side lane. I also have a question about a champion in game 3, Irelia. You know, there was Jax, Sejuani, Soraka can silence you, but... Why is Irelia in mid? Yeah, I mean, we were talking about, you know, going for a mage champion on the mid lane, but that's no fun, you know? So I was like, I'm just gonna go for Irelia, just trust me, guys. And then they believed in me. And we have another question about your Irelia. What does Irelia mean to you? You know, it's my spirit animal, something like that. My forever friend. And I heard Ryu is having a birthday today. And, you know, we saw these little bit of a ceremony on your entrance. And you guys having a sign saying your birthday present will be a victory. Any birthday wish over to him? I'm pretty sure he was pretty nervous watching us lose game number one. But I'm so glad that we were able to get a comeback. And I want to keep winning with you, Ryu. Let's go. And your next opponent is Nongshim Red Force. If you take them down one more time, it's going to be four match winning streak. I saw one of the Fiesta's interview, and then he was like, Closer, I can kind of lock him in on the mid lane, but I will be the one locking you in the mid lane, and I'll be just controlling the map. So be ready for that. And lastly, before we go, any message for all the fans supporting you guys. Thank you so much for showing up and we will continue this streak. Thank you. And this will be the end of the interview from Closer and back to the space. Thank you. Thank you, G-Sun, as always, for that awesome translation. Let's take a look at the POG standings real quick. As was mentioned, we do have Closer on top in third place sandbox he has gotten quite a lot of the pogs willer willer was robbed in game two though, let's be honest <laughs> should be tied with them yeah um live sandbox moves up to third this is one of the big narratives of tonight that's for now this is their place in the standings they're absolutely not the third strongest team in the lck but they could become that remember their strength of schedule has been relatively easy right they did lose to d plus kia early on but they haven't faced t1 or genji yet they beat KT, they beat Hanwha Life, um, and it's, uh, it's, it, it's, it's kind of lucky for them that they get these easier opponents early on in the season, and it, maybe they'll peak at the end, like they have Nongshim yeah. next, and then by the time they face T1 and Genji, maybe they'll actually have gotten rid of some of those jitters. Who knows, but this Mbox is on the trajectory for playoffs right now if they keep this up. Yeah, I think it's important as well that one specific player gets them like a decent amount of draft bucks as well, where it's like, oh, well, he's really good on Azir, he's really good on Aurelia, and he can also play Silas Akali, like, this guy's really scary. That might give them some edges in drafts and stuff like that in the future, not to mention the play. Uh, tomorrow, guys, Humble Life Esports up against Genji, and then Kwangdom Freaks up against DRX. Should be a couple of interesting matchups, you know, based on Humble Life Esports' play from uh, yesterday. They're really going to have to step it up against Gen.G, who are looking great, and that second match should be fun as well. Yeah, I, I hope that DRX can also find their footing. You know, I, that match, that second matchup, probably a messy one like the second one we saw tonight, but I'm hoping otherwise, and I'm hoping CV Max has got the drafts ready. Please, CV Max. See if he's got the drafts prepared this time around. But that's going to do it this time on The Space. Thank you so much for watching the LCK tonight, and we'll see you tomorrow for more.
dancing on the edge of this big love I'm not looking down, baby, I'm ready to jump Baby, I'm ready to jump I never believed love could set me free You break down the wall 